And they're off. And we're, yeah, we're live streaming. Good morning, everyone. This is the Joint Standing Committee on the Judiciary. And this morning we have four public hearings, and then we actually have about a dozen work sessions this afternoon. So um, we will jump right into our work. There are uh, members of the public who have signed up to testify on our bills this morning, and they are in the attendee space. I think that they can hear um, what we're saying, but to those who are in the attendee space, because we received a question, you will be brought onto the panel and be able to activate your audio and video when it's your turn to provide your testimony. And we will be calling you um, at the appropriate time. And until then, you'll be in what we refer to as the attendee space and you can hear and see the work of the panel. But again, you, you will only uh, join the panel at your um, proper time for testifying. And I did put in the chat the order of this morning's bills so that people can, can look at that and see where we are. And our committee clerk typically indicates on her screen the bill that we're currently hearing so that people can know the status of where we are this morning. Um, we usually begin our day with committee introductions and we will do that today. And I'll start with uh, Senator Sanborn. Good morning. Thank you, Senator Kearney. I'm Heather Sanborn. I represent Senate District 28, which is half of Portland and half of Westbrook. Uh, Representative Harnett. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. My name is Tom Harnett. I represent House District 83, which is the city of Gardner where I live and the town of Farmingdale. And welcome to everyone. Representative Babbage. Yes, how do you do? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome all. And uh, my name is Christopher Babbage. I represent House District 8, which is part of Kennebunk. Representative Reckett. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lois Reckett, and I represent District 31, which is the ocean end of South Portland. Representative Moriarty. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, all. I'm Steve Moriarty, representing my hometown of Cumberland and also part of Gray. A representative, representative Sheehan. Thank you, Senator Carney, and welcome, everyone. My name is Erin Sheehan, and I represent Biddeford's House District 12. And let's see who's next. Uh, representative Libby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, all. Uh, Laura Libby coming to you from the State House. I represent District 64, and that is part of Auburn and all of my head. Representative Poirier. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Jennifer Poirier. I represent House District 107, which is all of Skowhegan and part of Madison. Representative Thorne. Thorne, and thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and welcome, everybody. My name is Jim Thorne. I represent District 103, which is Carmel, Herman, and a portion of Etna up in beautiful Penobscot County. And Representative Evangelos. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, everyone. I'm Jeffrey Evangelos, Post District 91. And I reside in Friendship. Thank you. And we have a couple of committee members who may be joining later. We'll have them introduce themselves. This is a really busy time of year and we are pulled in multiple directions for uh, introducing and testifying on um, other bills in the legislature. I'd also like to introduce our legislative analysis, Peggy Reinch, and our committee clerk, Susan Panette. Good morning. And um, with that, I will... Um, Let's see, start with just a couple of reminders. We'll be doing uh, hearings on four bills. We have a lot of members of the public signed up to testify on those bills. And uh, for the information of the public and as a reminder to committee members, the public hearing part of the committee process is really for us to hear from um, members of the public on our legislation, the time for expressing our own opinions and debating on bills comes in the work session um, and in the context of casting votes on bills. We do have a three minute time limit on members of the public who are testifying on bills. 
the bill sponsor, of course, gets unlimited time to present the bill. But after that, everybody will be subject to a three minute time limit. And because our day is so full, we're gonna be really um, strictly enforcing that this morning. So we appreciate your cooperation. And um, with that, I'll open the hearing on our first bill, which is LD 793, an act to include as a factor in sentencing the selection of a victim based on the victim's employment as a law enforcement officer. And this is being presented by our colleague, Senator Davis. And let me see if we can bring him onto the panel. I think I'm there now. You're here. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Senator Davis. We're we're pleased that you're here and you can begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Well, thank you very much, Senator Kenny and Representative Arnett and members of the Judiciary Committee. I, I got to say it was all very nice yesterday to see everybody and uh, I really miss after being here for quite a few years, not being together. I, I think we're missing out on a lot. I am Paul Davis, and I have the honor of serving the people of Senate District 4, which includes all of Piscataquis County and parts of Somerset and Penobscot. I am here today to present you LD testimony on LD 793, an act to include a, as a factor in sentencing the, the selection of a victim based on the victim's employment as a law enforcement officer. And I would tell you up front that I have done quite a lot of research on this, and I'm going to ask you to go to work session after I get done. But prior to that, I just want to tell you, give you my reasoning for putting this in. In 1971, I applied to the Maine State Police. <clears throat> I wanted to be a state trooper. There were over 2,000 people that applied during that time. And 25 of us, as I recall, it might have been 24, were hired. From 1997 to 2013, we saw a rise in the number of people joining, applying to join the law enforcement ranks. However, according to a 2019 survey conducted by the Police Executive Research Forum, 63% of police departments said they had seen fewer applicants in just five years prior. Now, I also learned yesterday of, of a poll that's being done where there's a lot of concern amongst the public of the fact that fewer people are applying uh, for police jobs. And they said in this poll, I haven't read it in depth yet, I just got it yesterday, but said that 88% of the people in Maine feel that it's the lawmaker's job to, to correct this in some way. The reality is fewer men and women are stepping into law enforcement, a role that is to serve and protect the community. I believe that a lot of this has to do with what is happening in our country I know a lot of police officers, and I can tell you that 99% of them are great people. Now, I'm not going to say that there aren't uh, a few that are bad apples. There certainly are, and there isn't any profession. But I believe that these few members have misused their authority, resulting in terrible situations. In doing so, I believe it has painted a poor image of those in law enforcement, what we what really all about, serving and protecting. I submitted this bill because I believe a negative bias has developed in many people towards members of law enforcement. And I wanted to be sure that the men and women that are in uniform are protected. However, as I said in the beginning, after further research, I do not feel this bill is needed as it is already a crime to assault a member of law enforcement. And again, with that being said, I would ask that the committee go into work session and vote ought not to pass on this bill. And that's what I have for you this morning, Senator. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Senator Davis, for providing that, that background and also for your good work on this bill. We really appreciate you being here today and to raising those important issues. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, with that and at the bill sponsor's request, we will um, close the public hearing on 793. And is there a motion to go into work session on this bill? 
uh, moved by Representative Thorne and seconded by Representative Reckitt. And uh, does, is there a member of the committee who would like to put forth a motion at the request of the bill sponsor? Uh, go ahead, Representative Moriarty. Uh, at the request of the sponsor, I move what not to pass. Thank you, is there a second? Seconded by Representative Poirier. And um, Ms. Panette, I think we are ready for the vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Carney. Yes. Senator Carney votes yes. Senator Sanborn. Yes. Senator Sanborn votes yes. Senator Kime. Representative Harnett. Yes. Representative Harnett votes yes. Representative Babbage. Yes. Representative Babbage votes yes. Representative Galgay Reckett. Yes. Representative Galgay Reckett votes yes. Representative Moriarty. Yes. Representative Moriarty votes yes. Representative Sheehan. Yes. Representative Sheehan votes yes. Representative Hagan. Representative Libby. Yes. Representative Libby votes yes. Representative Poirier. Yes. Representative Poirier votes yes. Representative Thorne. Yay. Representative Thorne votes yes. Representative Evangelos. Yes. Representative Evangelos votes yes. Representative Newell. I'll call the absentees. Senator Keim. Senator Keim is absent. Representative Hagan. Representative Hagan is absent. Representative Newell. Representative Newell is absent. Madam Chair, I have 11 members voting in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and three members are absent. Thank you very much, Ms. Panette. And with that, the motion carries, um, ought not to pass. We'll close the work session on 793. And once again, um, Senator Davis, it's wonderful to see you today and thank you for your service. It's great to see you and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care. And with that, we'll move forward and open the public hearing on LD 908. This is an act to protect Maine residents and organizations from unreasonable and illegal surveillance, monitoring and tracking. It's being presented by Representative Warren of Scarborough. And I am just um, going to invite her to join the panel. And Representative Warren, whenever you're ready, you can activate your audio and video. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you. Um, you can proceed with your bill presentation whenever you're ready. Great, thank you so much. Good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett and the colleagues, my colleagues of the Judiciary Committee. I uh, want to just state up front that I am uh, asking uh, or um, saying that I'm looking to have this bill uh, moved to the Committee on Transportation. I don't believe it's within the jurisdiction of your committee, but uh, I'm going to move forward uh, giving more detail as this is a concept draft and I appreciate your time and consideration this morning. So um, after 9-11, there was a national effort to move in this direction of uh, facing a quote unquote war on terror in a well-intentioned effort. Uh, there was a creation of immense amount of civil liberties, violations, breaches from, I would argue the Patriots Act to ramping up of the security state to the work of the Department of Homeland Security in some instances, unfortunately. Now it's my strong belief that at this time, we need to return to the decisions made in this period, spanning over 20 years as we uh, remove ourselves from Afghanistan. 
And with this privilege of hindsight, I think that we could take an opportunity to view certain issues of civil liberties in a new light. With this bill, I hope we can advance a common sense reform which moves us in the direction of undoing immense harm, wasted state resources, overworked law enforcement and public safety officials to speak nothing of the separation of families as well as the disruption, harm and terror experienced in the lives of many human beings across Maine. Now at various instances in the past 20 years in this effort of uh, war on terror, there have been moments of resistance where the Maine legislature governors, citizens, organizations have spoken up and attempted to resist this overreach by the federal government on our state and way of life. One such instance is requiring proof of legal citizenship in the issuance of a driver's license or state ID for Maine residents. Until 2008, Maine had been one of few states that had no rules on the books limiting licenses to legal US residents residents, uh, yeah, residents, including undocumented immigrants who, have other, who would otherwise be eligible for driver's licenses and state IDs in the state of Maine. This simply means that we had not collected unnecessary information from private Maine residents. At that time, the Department of Homeland Security was pressuring Maine and other states in New England to tighten laws in this broader effort of a war on terror which sought to track and monitor human beings in our country as if we here were a site of a kind of war upon our own residence, where our neighbors were set up to be assumed criminals and their rights undermined in the subversion of justice, guilty until proven innocent. Then Governor Baldacci introduced a bill to the main legislature, which did pass and was signed into law to create a rule that effectively prevented undocumented immigrants and other individuals without a social security number from obtaining licenses. To their credit, the Maine legislature had passed a law one year earlier in 2007, which barred the Secretary of State, who oversees the motor vehicle regulations, from complying with the real ID standard, requiring, requiring that high, higher surveillance uh, standard. When passed, Governor Baldacci said the law, quote, increases security and fulfills my commitment to the Department of Homeland Security. Well, as an independent, I might be especially and biasly sympathetic to the separation of state and federal governments, but with that bias, I do believe we have the right to act on our independence here. We have the right to determine for ourselves the laws that will best keep our community safe in the state of Maine. That is our duty to determine as a legislature and it's not the power of an unelected federal agency like Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Secretary of State Shana Bellows, then Executive Director of the Maine Civil Liberties Union, affirmed this very view at the time, saying that there were legitimate questions raised concerning a federal agency requiring a state legislature to pass this legislation, as well as about the constitutionality of the Real ID Act, saying, quote, the legal status requirements pushed on us by the feds violate our civil rights while doing nothing to make us any safer. For the Department of Homeland Security to have singled out Maine in this way was an extraordinary abuse of power. Well, today, more than a dozen US states have already accepted to allow driver's licenses and state identifications without requiring a proof of citizenship to the state. In addition, so does the uh, District of Columbia. Some measures intended to keep Mainers safe do just the opposite, and that is a shame. The job of public safety officials, our local county and state law enforcement, is made immensely more difficult when made to work on behalf of a completely separate federal agency, ICE, instead of focusing on keeping our community safe here. I appreciate your consideration of this piece of legislation, and I ask that it be moved to the Transportation Committee to be considered uh, under their jurisdiction. Thank you for your consideration. And I am, of course, uh, happy to take questions at this time. Thank you very much, Representative Warren. I do actually have a couple of questions for you. Um, do you have the, do you have proposed amendment language that you plan to offer in the Transportation Committee? Yes. And have you reviewed it with the chairs of the transportation 
committee and are they willing to accept transfer of this bill to their committee? No, I have not reviewed it with them. And so I, I, I don't know whether they would be willing to take it. Okay. Um, thank you. I think that from our perspective procedurally, we can't vote to send it to transportation without knowing how that committee feels about it. Um, we also are in a situation this late in the session where um, concept drafts are, are um, not, are raising concerns because we're, we're just running out of time to um, work on bills. So that's kind of where we are as a committee. So if you could, um, prior to the work session, actually, as soon as you can check in with the chairs of transportation and then send um, co-chair Harnett and I an email letting us know if the transportation committee um, is willing to accept the bill. That would be really helpful. And uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm not gonna open it up to questions from committee members because either way, this is a bill that we're not gonna do any um, work on, but let me just check and see if there, well, actually I'll ask, I'm looking at those who are in the attendee space. If you are here and wish to be um, heard on LD908, I, I'm not sure that we're gonna take uh, people off the attendee list, but I just wanna know for my own um, information. Is there anybody here who uh, is in the attendee space who wanted to speak on uh, 908? Okay, and so um, because we are not going to hear, um, to conduct a hearing on 908, I'm gonna ask um, the bill, I'll tell the bill sponsor that Maria Woodbury and Michael Kebeda are here and are um, wish to, to support your legislation. So if you could please check in with them as you move forward. All right, okay. Thank you very much. Um, and go ahead, Ms. Warren, Representative Warren. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to also flag that a uh, Kelly Merrill is also uh, here and uh, as well, Grace C. Murning. Oh, good. They didn't raise their electronic hands. I'm glad that you pointed that. I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of the, um, the interested um, members of the public who wanted to support you um, should the bill move to the Transportation Committee. Great. All right. Thank you. Representative Moriarty, did you have um, wish to raise an issue? Uh, just procedurally, I would move to table. I don't think we need actually need to do anything at this point because the we're just going to end the public hearing. We'll just close the public hearing. Thank you. Um, all right. And so uh, again, Representative Warren, thank you very much for coming before the Judiciary Committee again. And thank you for raising these important issues about the real ID system. And with that, we'll close the public hearing on LD908. And um, at this point, we're going to move on to our next bill, which is LD um, 214, an act to eliminate qualified immunity. And I'm gonna turn the virtual gavel over to uh, co-chair Tom Harnett. And um, thank you very much, Representative Harnett, it's all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Carney and welcome to all in attendance today. I am going to open the public hearing on LD 214, an act to eliminate qualified immunity for police officers. And before turning it over to the bill's sponsor, I wanna make a few remarks uh, about procedure. Um, we have over 40 people signed up to testify on this bill, including the bill sponsor. Um, I will be enforcing the three minute clock for everyone other than the sponsor. Uh, what I will do with when you have about 15 seconds left, I will show you my phone, which has the timer. And I am going to have to do a hard stop at three minutes because otherwise uh, just with three minutes, we're gonna have two, over two hours of testimony. 
I would also uh, just ask committee members to keep in mind that this is a public hearing. Uh, we are here to listen to testimony. Uh, while there may be uh, questions that need to be posed, if you have a, a clarifying question, um, I will let some of those go, but I don't want this to turn into a debate. Uh, we'll debate the issue at a public, at our work session. Um, this is really just to get the information in front of us um, so that we can um, uh, bring the hearing to a conclusion in a reasonable time. Um, and I hope that um, we can work together towards that end. Uh, uh, Senator Carney. Would it be helpful to you, um, Representative Harnett, if I run the timer? It would be extremely helpful. Um, I will do that. Carney. Thank you. Thank you very much. So look for uh, Senator Carney holding up the phone um, and then she will let me know when the three minutes is up. So I'm going to begin by calling uh, the bill's sponsor, uh, Representative Jeffrey Evangelos, a member of our committee. Welcome, Representative Evangelos. Thank you, uh, Representative Harnett. Um, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and other distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. I am Representative Jeffrey Evangelos from Friendship, and I represent House Dis District 91, and I am speaking today in support of LD 214, an act to eliminate qualified immunity for police officers. As the bill summary indicates, LD 214 eliminates the ability to assert a defense of qualified immunity for civil actions concerning the actions of state police officers, sheriffs, deputies, constables, municipal police officers, Marine Patrol officers, game wardens, and Capitol Police officers brought under the Maine Civil Rights Act. In plain English, this bill will allow people who have had their civil rights violated by the unlawful or unethical actions of law enforcement to pursue a civil rights claim in Superior Court. This bill represents a long overdue reform that will align the rights of all people, including the police. One nation, one people, all subject to the same laws no exceptions. Let us never forget that we are a civilian nation ruled by civilians and that the police and military are subservient to civilian rule, just as President Eisenhower asserted when he assumed the presidency in 1953. When asked if he was going to wear his uniform after he was elected in November 1952, Eisenhower said no, that he is now a civilian leader of a civilian nation and put his uniform away forever. That valuable lesson seems lost on law enforcement today. The current double standard police benefit from reminds me of the lessons we learned in high school when we read George Orwell's Animal Farm. It's an allegory about what happens when one class of people, namely the police, adopt standards that benefit just them at the expense of their peers. Some people are more weak, equal than others. As you may recall, that story didn't end well. Recent news reports from across the nation and right here in Maine make it imperative that Maine adopt standards that allow its people to legally confront law enforcement in court when the police abuse their authority and violate our civil rights, up to and including the unjustified unlawful use of deadly force against unarmed individuals. How could anyone, including the police officers, be so obtuse to be devoid of the tragic development sweeping the nation? in reference to police abuse of power. Maine's abysmal record of justifying every single police shooting since records have been kept with a score of approximately 170 to zero ruled justified by Maine's Attorney General's office highlights the need for this critical reform. Maine's criminal justice system and the Attorney General's office suffers from serious systemic biases, conflicts of interest, lack of accountability and lack of transparency. Cover-ups have become the norm and our free press has been shut down by law enforcement's refusal to release public records and information. Under current law, malicious police officers are held harmless under the qualified immunity standard, a standard that was developed out of court doctrines, not legislative law. Perhaps we finally have the answer as, as to why the Attorney General's office has ruled every law enforcement use of force justified, including incidents when the victims who were killed were unarmed. In a letter I received on April 7, 2021 from a retired Waldoboro police officer, a sergeant, who said he attended a training session that was conducted at a local high school. And I quote, the instructor was Brian McMaster, 
Chief of Investigations of the Attorney General's Office. Officers from Knox and Lincoln agencies took this training if they could make it. State police officers were frequently there as well. The class was about officer-involved shootings. I remember hearing Brian McMaster tell this class that as long as he was in charge of police officer-involved shootings, we had nothing to worry about as all shootings would be ruled justified. This always bothered me and I reflect on it. I reflect on it, this from time to time, close quote. This gentleman is in his eighties now. After receiving the letter, I called the retired officer and asked him if he was in the Waldorf Police Department in 2007 when an unarmed 18 year old boy, Gregory Jackson was shot in the back four times, September 23rd, 2007 with another execution style shot to the back of his head, killed by Waldorf police while he ran into the woods. He said, no, he had already retired, but if he was still employed there, and I quote, I would have quit in protest. Everyone knows that case was unjustified. The Jackson family was prevented from receiving any justice because of a cover up and because qualified immunity prevented them from prevailing in the courts. In 2019, I presented this case to Attorney General Fry and asked for a review. He agreed. Two years later, we are still waiting for his ruling. I plan on entering this letter into evidence on this case to the Attorney General today. As the recent six part Bangor Daily News series exposed, systemic problems and abuses within Maine County Sheriff's Departments have gone unpunished and uncontested. On April 18th, the Press Herald and Bangor Daily News collaborated on investigating scores of serious documented cases of misconduct at the Maine State Police. These cases involved, involving both ages, agencies included officers beating up their wives. These officers are still serving on active duty status and in good standing. Cover-ups and the abuse of non-disclosure agreements, along with the refusal to release critical information to the press have become the norm and have all contributed to our loss of faith in law enforcement. I consider this to be an abuse of power this legislation will level the playing field. So when our good people are victimized by the unlawful actions of the police, they will now be able to seek redress in the courts. Conversely, good police officers who do the right thing, abide by our laws and constitutional protections have nothing to worry about. Criticism of LD 214 by law enforcement accuses the bill's sponsor of contributing to the law enforcement's recruitment and retention problems before it is even enacted Let's be clear about something. The recruitment and retention issues experienced by police in Maine is a problem of their own doing. Why would a good officer want to work with systemic abuses tolerated and encouraged? Last month, we learned from the Bangor Daily News that the town of Goolsboro gave its police chief a verbal warning and ordered him to undergo, sex undergo sexual harassment training for harassing a female employee. A town patrol officer was fired and then given his job back. And last month, a third police officer quit calling Goldsboro Police Department, and I quote, an embarrassment to law enforcement in his resignation letter, Bangor Daily News, March 19th. And on April 3rd, 2021, the Bangor Daily reported that low morale and a few, appl and few applicants were the causes of the recruitment and retention crisis. So let's be clear about this. I don't believe in defunding the police. I'm not a defunder. This bill is about promoting good practices and the good work of the good men and women who serve our state. In May, 2020, a heroic state trooper blew the whistle on the fusion center's illegal activities, exposing that agency's multiple constitutional violations against law abiding citizens, documenting serious violations against our right to privacy guaranteed under the fourth amendment and the right to peaceably assemble guaranteed under the first amendment. The trooper, who brought these issues to light was retaliated against. When confronted with these unlawful actions by the state police at a joint hearing of criminal justice and judiciary last summer, Commissioner Soschuk refused to truthfully answer questions from his civilian overseers, the Maine legislature, highlighting the abuse of power law enforcement believes it is entitled to. I've given you two references to that. On a personal note, on a personal note I've been a legislator since 2012. Not once have I ever come under the <clears throat> ruthless attacks that member of law enforcement community have subjected me to in retaliation to this bill. Once again, demonstrating the serious crisis that plagues law enforcement, including anonymous threatening phone calls, libel on social media, 
threatening emails, threats against me to never call the police, demands that Capitol Police remove any security for me personally, and the lowest of them all, attacking my dead father, a former state trooper who fought in World War II, for bringing me into the world. This harassment just magnifies the systemic abuse that plagues law enforcement profession in Maine. And here are some documented examples. Just two days ago, a retired Gorham police officer, Mike Mercer, posted this on Facebook under the picture of my grandchildren. Where are you now? Show your face. LD214 is insanity. All you idiots who voted for this puts doesn't deserve to have a police officer respond to your house or to save you and your kids. You will suffer by voting for this idiot. You can redeem yourselves by calling and telling the whacked out legislature we need our local police. And his second post, again under the, the picture of my grandchildren. This is a picture of a person who wants to end American law enforcement. Are you happy you voted for this idiot, Jeffrey Evangelos, communist representative? And this, you sir are disgusting. Your regard for our local law enforcement is appalling. I can't believe you consider yourself a representative of the state of Maine. You should be reminded that you work for us and that law enforcement officers are taxpayers that perform such more essential service than any of you blowhards in the Capitol. I hope you and all your like-minded colleagues have their police details pulled. And finally, maybe someone needs to remind you that you'd also work for us. Typical hypocrite. One other thing, your father would be ashamed of you. Law enforcement should remember that the uniform they wear is paid for by us, the civilians who you work for. 100% of the taxpayers pay for your uniform, your gear, your guns, your vehicles, and the police professional liability insurance that covers office in the event of civil rights violations. And I want the committee to keep in mind when they hear testimony today, the police departments are required to carry this liability insurance. And this protects police officers and their families from personal liabilities. Police departments carry professional liability insurance. I believe from the polls I've seen that a majority of taxpayers want qualified immunity reform with 63% supporting the elimination of qualified immunity for police officers, according to the Cato Institute. The Cato Institute is a conservative organization. This week, the United States Justice Department Civil Rights Division initiated an action against the Louisville, Kentucky Police Departments, alleging civil rights violations, racial profiling, illegal searches, surveillance against constitutional protected activities, and unjustified use of force. Sound familiar? Just read the, just read the recent groundbreaking journalism of the Maine Press Corps that documents these systemic abuses right here in Maine. And what did the Maine State Police do to confront racial profiling in its ranks? They awarded John Darcy, the serial racial profiler, the Trooper of the Year Award, November of 2020. In Louisville, Mayor Greg Fisher said Monday that he will strongly welcome the Justice Department's review, saying that it will help the city become safer and more equitable. Good officers will welcome this announcement and see it as an exciting time to be part of reform and transformation, he said. And Louisville Police Chief Erica Shields called the federal probe an opportunity, in quotes, to, spend up, to speed up policing changes and build trust with the broader community. And I quote, I think it's necessary because police reform, quite honestly, is needed near every agency across the country, she said. In closing, on April 25th, the Nas National Council of State Legislatures reported that four states, Colorado, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Mexico, have already enacted a limiter office officer immunity from civil suit for misconduct. And on March 25th of this year, the New York City Council abolished qualified immunity for police officers in that city, a city with the strongest police union in the country. Criminal justice reform is sweeping the nation. The public's confidence in law enforcement is at a record low and for good reason. Police misconduct must be addressed in an open and transparent process, ensuring accountability and protecting the civil rights of our people. LD214 represents a crit critical step in the, in the reform movement. Governor Mills, Attorney General Fry, and my colleagues in the legislature, the criminal justice reform train has left the station and Maine hasn't even caught the caboose. Let's get on board by adopting this critically needed reform. Thank you for your consideration. I'm happy to answer your questions. Documented proof and information is attached below my testimony. 
included are abstracts from Yale Law School, Georgetown University, and the New York State Bar Association, which explains the history of qualified immunity and the need to abolish it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Representative Angelos, for bringing this bill forward. And I, I do have a question before I open up to the committee. Did, is, has your testimony been submitted electronically? Because I've not seen it in the- um... Yes, uh, it was submitted and Peggy, Peggy wrote me about 20 minutes ago and said it's been put in. Okay, I, I didn't see it in the, in the list that I'm looking yep. at, but that, that's fine. It'll probably be uh, elsewhere uh, online. If it's thank not, you. it's coming. So, yeah, but, uh, she confirmed it's in the system. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and well, before opening for questions, I did want to welcome uh, Senator Keim, uh, joined, I believe, after introduction. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay in joining. I was on other committee business. Uh, my name is Lisa Keim, and I'm proud to represent uh, Senate District 18, which is Northern Oxford County. Thank you and welcome, Senator Keim. Uh, and now turning to questions from the committee, Representative Thorne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, mine is more, not a question, just a statement. And out of respect to my colleague, uh, Representative Evangelos, and a promise that I made to him and other committee members, I won't be asking any questions of him this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Thorne. Are there um, other questions from committee members? Representative Harnett, um, we were just horsing around the other day. Um, I'm not holding to Representative Thorne to, um, that, to that promise. He's free to ask me some questions. Thank, thank you, Representative Evangelos. Um, I, I appreciate that gesture. Are, are there questions from committee members? Seeing none, what I'm going to do now is we have a um, the three members of the legislature who have signed up to testify, one in support and two in opposition. As a courtesy to our colleagues, knowing how busy their schedules are, I'm going to call them out of order. Uh, and then I will go to those in favor, those opposed, and those neither for nor against. And again, and you'll hear this hopefully not too often, other than the sponsor, everybody including co-sponsors and legislators will be limited to three minutes of testimony. Uh, and Senator Carney will be holding up uh, the timer when there's a, to give you a warning, and then we will need to stop at three minutes. Um, Represent uh, Senator Miramont, welcome to the Judiciary Committee and begin your testimony when you're comfortable. Thank you, Representative Barnett, uh, Senator Carney. Great to see you, distinguished members of the J Judiciary Committee. I am Dave Miramont and I represent Senate District 12, which is Knox County, except the town of Washington and the county seats Rockland. And I am here, you know, I didn't change that one, but I'm here to support this bill. Um, before I get into what I wrote, I just wanted to point out that in, I just was in criminal justice talking about the change from 2000 when I was first elected to the select board and we were working on community policing because of issues that were going on. And we also had a lot of uh, our community police our, in Camden and Rockport particularly who had been over serving in the Middle East and they brought back military policing techniques and the departments were, had been moving to military policing, which in, introduces a lot of confusion and stress into a situation where they should be arriving and disarming. And this, they were trying to use that sort of model on our teenagers and uh, it was really causing problems. And the persons that suffered most were those who were just uh, there, but then being confronted. And the police didn't because there was this culture of keeping information within a department uh, and not letting it get out. And then I see that that continues today with the information about the state police and what they've been doing. And that comes from the top down. When you have a, a training academy that all officers of every type of law enforcement are required to go to, then you started at the top and go down. So some of my bills is 
session have been about addressing that top-down mentality uh, that has infected our police. So I don't have time because I'm not used to uh, co-sponsor legislators not having more time, but I see what you're trying to do. So I'm going to go into my testimony and everything else will come out with the number of people. Uh, when this subject came up, it was in relation to the acts of certain police officers who had abused the public trust and yet were still working as police. It seemed reasonable that having given our police the authority and autonomy to enforce laws, they would also be held to a higher level of responsibility and integrity in using them. Yet it's proven not to be the case because of a concept called qualified immunity. In practice, this has turned out to have the effect of actually allowing police to have a standard of error and emission lower than any civilian would ever enjoy. It allows the police to claim that no matter what action they took, they did so from a belief that their thought about the action justified the action. Not that the suspect had actually done something, just that the officer believed that they had. This argument has been used even when there was the opportunity to verify their suspicions or when there was doubt as to the accuracy of information used to form the belief. We all know that there are many police who do their job within the law. I, I apologize for interrupting. Um, yes, sir. But I do need to ask you to wrap it up. The, the committee will review your written testimony as submitted, but if, if you could wrap it up and then, then I will open it for questions. Okay. Um, I, want, I always throw in, we have great police, most of them, and they shake their heads when I point out some of the issues like uh, the Gregory Jackson shooting or the, the uh, Jackman Select woman who was shot in her house. Or, you know some of these. Uh, you have my testimony and it's posted online. I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Miramont. And again, the clock is just so we can manage our, our work. Absolutely. Uh, are there questions from committee members for Senator Miramont? Seeing none, thank you very much for your time today and for your testimony. And I assure you that your testimony that it has been submitted in written form will be reviewed by the committee. I, thank you. I trust that it will. I respect your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I am now going to call on representatives uh, who registered to testify in opposition and would ask that Representative Pickett be moved over as a panelist. Uh, welcome, Representative Pickett, to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, as you may have heard, you probably heard that we are running a three minute clock today, but I uh, welcome your testimony, um, welcome you to the Judiciary Committee, and please begin testifying when you're comfortable. Thank you, Representative Harnett. Good morning. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and esteemed members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. I'm Richard A. Pickett, State Representative for House District 116, which includes the towns of Canton, Dixfield, Hartford, Mexico, and Peru. And I'm here today to speak in opposition of LD 214, an act to eliminate qualified immunity for police officers. I'd like to begin my testimony with a few facts about doctrine, about the doctrine of qualified immunity that have been brought to my attention. The doctrine of qualified immunity is based in United States Supreme Court precedent and does not protect law enforcement officers who knowingly violate the law from criminal charges, internal investigation, discipline, or termination. Qualified immunity is not automatic and is weighed on a case-by-case -case basis relative to the facts of a singular case. It applies or is granted only in cases where an official, such as a law enforcement officer, is found to have acted within the law, departmental policies, and in good faith during the performance of their duties. Qualified immunity does apply to the to and protects a broad range of government officials and entities, lawmakers, firefighters, teachers, school administrators, and more, from civil liability for following the rules, <coughs> policies, and regulations set forth by the laws they are sworn to uphold. It does not provide automatic or blanket immunity for cr criminal conduct. The proposed law LD-214 in the Maine legislature will eliminate qualified immunity for those in Maine law enforcement only and no other group of public servants who are covered under the qualified immunity doctrine. This critical, this critical qualified immunity doctrine has been in place for many years and has served this purpose effectively. 
Do we really believe that any society can long endure without a healthy respect for, for the rule of law? I believe this proposed legislation is extremely detrimental to the law enforcement profession. If LD 214 becomes law, it will be the first step toward totally eliminating policing in Maine. If a citizen has the ability to sue an officer personally, if that officer has to pay any judgment out of his or her personal pocket, the profession will be put at risk, at serious risk of early retirements as well as experience devastation to recruitment of future police officers. We hire these law enforcement professionals with the expectation that they will take risks and do the type of things that often puts them in harm's way while protecting and serving us. If they have to second guess their training and wonder if what they are doing can lead to a personal lawsuit, it immediately becomes a serious public safety issue. We have to ask ourselves what man or woman would consider a career in law enforcement here in Maine and risk the financial stability of their spouse or children to serve others as a law enforcement officer. I urge you to vote ought not to pass on the bill. We cannot have officers be held personally responsible for the outcome of each and every situation they encounter. This is a dangerous path to embark on in the name of public safety. Thank you for your time and consideration of my testimony. Thank you very much, Representative Pickett, for uh, presenting your testimony to the committee today. We greatly appreciate it. Are there questions from committee members for Representative Pickett? Seeing none again, we thank you very much for your testimony and your time. And uh, we'll, you'll be moved back to the attendee room. You're welcome to stay, but I imagine like most of us, you may have other obligations you have to attend to as well. But thank you. Thank sir. you very much, sir. Uh, I will now turn to Representative Harrington. Uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee, Representative. Uh, good morning. And begin testifying as soon as you feel comfortable. Sure. Uh, good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. I am Representative Matt Harrington. I represent part of the city of Sanford and House District 19. I'm testifying in strong opposition to LD 214, an act to eliminate qualified immunity for police officers. When not performing my duties as a legislator, I am the only full-time active police officer in the legislature. I have been a police officer here in Maine for almost 14 years. Since this bill was submitted, I have had law enforcement officers from nearly every corner of the state reach out to me expressing their disappointment. I believe this bill is a solution in search of a problem. Maine simply does not have a problem. Our Criminal Justice Academy is top notch and our officers are very well trained. Rather than get into the legal details of qualified immunity, I simply offer you a boots on the ground perspective. When I began my law enforcement career, it was incredibly competitive. At the age of 20, I applied to multiple agencies to be a summer reserve officer, and thankfully was given an opportunity by the town of Kennebun, but was turned down by several others. It was just that competitive then. When I began seeking full-time employment after college, I again applied to many departments. I recall going to physical fitness tests with 20 or more other candidates, all seeking a single opening. I again was turned down by many agencies, but was finally granted an opportunity. Over the last few years, we're lucky to receive one or two applicants for a job opening. My department has been advertising an opening since early January, if not received any applicants. The more unnecessary scrutiny this career faces, the harder recruitment and retention will be. This has been proven to be quite counterproductive to the apparent goals of the sponsor. Many quality candidates simply no longer are applying. It recently took over a year to fill an opening. That position was filled by an officer from another department, thus just creating an opening in another part of the state. With these desperate recruiting times, sign-on bonuses have become commonplace. We've essentially created a shell game of officers jumping from department to department. Take one look at the Maine Criminal Justice Academy website and you'll see the sheer number of police openings. I've never seen this many before. Simply put, Maine's law enforcement officers are exhausted. We go out there each day and do the right thing and are tired of constant scrutiny. We undergo, we understand we must be held to a high standard. We undergo medical and uh, psychological evaluations. We have to take a polygraph exam, physical fitness exam. There's virtually no other job in Maine that undergoes that level of scrutiny just to get through the door. Officers then attend the Criminal Justice Academy for 18 weeks, which is a high stress, high expectations environment. 
Qualified immunity does not allow police officers to go rogue. It simply provides protection against frivolous lawsuits when we've done the right thing during the course of our duties. Why stop at police? Why do we as legislators have qualified immunity? Many pieces of legislation put forth and passed here that have been damaging to main businesses. Shouldn't legal action be able to be taken against these sponsors for submitting that legislation? I think this is just food for thought and I would strongly urge this committee to vote ought not to pass. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Harrington, for your time today and for presenting testimony to the Judiciary Committee. We greatly appreciate it. Are there questions from committee members for Representative Harrington? And seeing none, again, we appreciate your time. Uh, you'll be moved back to the attendee room. You're certainly welcome to stay, but uh, Thank you. as I said to Representative Pickett, I imagine you might have other things on your plate today as well. Thank, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I, I now want to explain how we're going to move forward. Uh, Zoom presents some challenges. A few minutes before the hearing, I was presented with a list of people who registered to testify online. I will be operating from that list, going in those in favor, then to those opposed, then to those neither for nor against. I know that some people signed up after the hearing began. Uh, I rest assured you will have your opportunity to speak, but because we have so many um, people to testify, we'll get to you after we go through our first round of people testifying. So I will call on people as the clerk moves them over based on that list. And the first person testifying in support of this measure is Dale Boyce. Um, as soon as I see uh, Dale on the um, screen, please uh, uh, unmute your mic, activate your um, video, and begin your testimony. And welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Good morning, all. Um, you don't know me, or maybe you do. Um, I think I'm known by Augusta as Aunt Dale. I'm Jason Laura's aunt. He was killed on February 2nd, 2020. It was a tragic, tragic event. Um, I'm gonna try and make my statements short, but from a personal standpoint, I wanted you to know qualified immunity affects people's lives. Um, it's difficult sometimes for me to talk about this, but I don't think the police got up that day and said, today I'm going to kill Jason Gora, but their actions created the tragedy. It was a wellness check. We were concerned for him. He had some suicidal thoughts. We reached out to the people that we had always grown up to say, you can trust these people, they will help you. We were up front, we said, we believe he has a gun. We didn't want anybody in jeopardy. We didn't want Jason to die that day. We didn't want anybody to die that day. But instead, what happened where their actions were wrong. Their training went out the window. Three of these officers were trained to deal with mental illness. They spotted him on the road. They followed him for a distance. He did not break any laws. He did not have a warrant for his arrest. It was a wellness check. He started down the road and what did they do? They escalated a mental health situation. They turned on the sirens. Four of them chased him at 80 miles an hour down a country road. They not only put Jason in jeopardy, they put themselves in jeopardy. They put the public in jeopardy. There were cars on that road. There were, it could have been a catastrophe for everybody. Instead of de-escalating, they escalated and escalated and escalated. And then they put a car, another policeman, in the harm's way by putting him in a position where he was going to put spike mats down. I believe he was too far in the road. They came on him too quick. Jason did not intentionally hit that car. He did not intentionally want to kill anybody. His only thought was he wanted to get away. He didn't want to go back to the hospital. He didn't want anybody to help him. His family wanted the help. So instead, what happened is they collided he panicked, he got out of the car, he uh, continued to run away. He wasn't threatening them, he was running away. 
They drew their weapons. They chased him. His hands were visible. He had nothing in his hands. He had no weapon in his hands. They chased him across the parking lot. He fell. They shot him on the ground. And A.G. Fry said that was justified. I have a hard time with that. I have a hard time with training and training and training. And then when they have an opportunity to use that training, they choose not to use it. Why? Because they have qualified immunity. No matter what they do, it's always justified. Ms. Boys, Ms. Money. Boys, Ms. Boys, I'm sorry. Yes. And I apologize. I know how difficult this is to share but the three minute time has run that you- All will right, I, I, I will just close and say, please, please make them do their training. Don't give them a shield that says you will never be accountable. The AG doesn't make you accountable. The state of Maine doesn't make you accountable. We are all victims. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Boyce, for taking the time to testify today. I cannot imagine how difficult uh, it is to, to share this story. Um, but thank you for being here. Thank Are you. there questions from committee members for Ms. Boys? Seeing none, thank you very much uh, for your thank time. Thank you. Have a good day. And I wish you peace. I trust that you will do the right thing. Thank you. Um, and I will remind people I sometimes neglect to do this. When you introduce your, when you begin your testimony, please. Uh, list your town of residence, uh, your name and your town of residence. My name is Dale Boyce and I'm from Standish, Maine. Thank, thank you, ma'am. That was my fault. Uh, the next person uh, to testify is Jerry Greenfield. Uh, Mr. Greenfield, as soon as you're ready, uh, unmute your mic and activate your video. And I, I know that there may be two people testifying, uh, sharing the testimony, but I will let you know that it's limited to the three minutes as I instructed someone who told me you would be here today. So uh, thank you very much and begin your testimony when you feel comfortable. Good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. We are Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield, founders of Ben and Jerry's, and co-chairs of the Campaign to End Qualified Immunity. This campaign is a national coalition of business leaders, professional athletes, lawyers, former law enforcement agents, advocacy groups, and concerned citizens dedicated to holding cops accountable. We are here today to express our support for LD 214, an act to eliminate qualified immunity for police officers sponsored by Representative Jeffrey Evangelos. If you want to build trust in public safety, support good law enforcement officers, and respect Mainers' civil rights, you have to vote yes for LD214 and to end the unjust doctrine of qualified immunity. You know, there's people in America who see the trivial act of wearing a mask as victimization. Try being black in, per in public. Try hundreds and hundreds of years of racial hate and injustice. Try walking down the street and being harassed just because you're born black. And try having a civil rights law that was created to allow you to sue a cop who abuses you so distorted that now it makes an abusive cop immune from prosecution. You know, uh, this is really about accountability. You can do all the training you want. You can have all the procedures you want. If you don't hold someone accountable, you're not going to get the result you're looking for. We learned that in business. And now I'd like to turn it over to my partner, Jerry Greenfield, the other co-chair. Good morning. Freedom from malicious conduct, freedom to obtain justice, freedom from victimization, has been turned into oppression. That is what qualified immunity is, oppression. People like to talk about racial equality and how we're making progress, but progress is always next session, next election cycle, next time it's politically convenient. Being victimized by the police isn't convenient. Being told through legislative inaction that black, lives that black lives don't matter isn't inconvenient. 
Some may say, oh, well, this won't affect me. You're right. If you're not black, this probably won't affect you because wearing a mask in public isn't victimization, but being black in America while cops have qualified immunity is. Give these victims justice. Give the American people back their civil rights. Give the American people back their right to sue unlawful acts against bad cops because it was already ours. We had that right and the Supreme Court took it away from us with qualified immunity. It's just not good enough to have lawmakers say Black Lives Matter and not save Black people from being victimized. It's not good enough to sustain the status quo of policing in Maine. The status quo is unsustainable. Without accountability, there will never be trust in public safety. We urge you to stand on the side of justice and vote yes on LD214, ending the unjust doctrine of qualified immunity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Cohen and Mr. Greenfield for presenting your testimony to the Judiciary Committee today. We greatly appreciate hearing from you on this important issue. Are there questions from committee members for Mr. Cohen or Mr. Greenfield? And seeing none, again, thank you very much for your time and uh, for the testimony that I believe you submitted in written form as well. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Uh, I will now move to Diane Olterzewski. I'm sure yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. This is part of the hardest part of the job, I think, is dealing with some names sometimes. Uh, whenever you are comfortable, uh, please feel free to begin your three-minute testimony. Thank you, co-chairs Carney and Harnett and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Diane Olterzeski. I live in Belfast, Maine. I thank the sponsor of this bill from the bottom of my heart. I believe it is essential that we pass LD214 without delay and eliminate qualified immunity as a defense against prosecution and sentencing for any licensed officer as described in the bill. Our police, no less than our citizens, are subject to our law with its core principle that a suspect is innocent until proven guilty. We recognize that extensive and thorough screening and training is essential for police to guide an officer's action in the potentially dangerous situations he faces or she faces. But Americans have now learned that screening and training of recruits is woefully inconsistent and inadequate across the country. We've learned to our horror that where racial bias and de-escalation training is offered, it is often blown off by the police culture of assumed immunity that tends to prevail in these departments. Emboldened by police unions that manage to scrub the record of bad actors and the blue wall of silence, officers too often act as arrogant, lawless vigilantes. I refer you to the excellent discussion about how to reform policing, titled Policing in America is Broken and Must Change, But How? It was in the New York Times Magazine last June 21st, and it includes telling input from retired Camden, New Jersey Police Chief J. Scott Thompson. Please read G Chief Thompson's account of the pervasive police culture. He had to dismantle and begin again to build an intelligent, respectful team of neighborhood police. I begin to think that applicants should be required to pass a community review board before they can be licensed. What makes a bully? It is clear that too many applicants enter the force with hidden agendas. The promise of power and authority compensating for a complex range of psychological problems, whether it be a sense of inferiority, <clears throat> a nagging resentment acted out inappropriately, a fear of impotence, the assumption or fear that anyone with a dark skin is inherently criminal. If we are to have law and order, we must be able to trust those to whom we grant deadly force. 
Failing that, we cannot continue to promise qualified immunity to individuals whose judgment is so questionable and who are daily committing hate crimes themselves. Please vote ought to pass for LD 214. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Oltuszewski. Uh, are there questions from committee members? Seeing none again, thank you very much uh, for your uh, oral testimony today and I, we have received your written testimony as well, which we will all review. Thank you very thank much. You. I will now move to Hannah Musgrove. Um, good morning. Uh, whenever you're comfortable, please uh, begin your three minute testimony. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I live in Biddeford, Maine. I wrote to all of you at the beginning of April on this issue, uh, personally to your emails, and I am in favor of eliminating qualified immunity. To respond to what Richard Pickett said earlier in his testimony, uh, if qualified immunity protects against lawful action, why is it that so many officers who kill unarmed civilians walk free? If a police recruit is scared of a lawsuit against them, they should be sure to follow the law and they will be okay. In response to Matt Harrington, no, Maine is not safe from officers who unlawfully rape detainees and unlawfully kill on impulse. There have been instances of both here in Maine. Stop the killing. Sadly, we all know what this means without saying. Police killing of Americans is out of hand and they must be held accountable by the law. Not only is murder by police rampant, but physical assault and rape as well. This is public violence and terrorism, and police know they can get away with it because of qualified immunity. If a child is not reprimanded for bad behavior, they will not stop the bad behavior. Simple as that. We in the United States must stop turning a blind eye to police brutality. Police killing countless Americans a year is a public health crisis and should be dealt as such in Congress. I am glad to see this act presented here. It is a necessary step, so thank you for that. The government must say that this violence is wrong by eliminating qualified immunity. That is the first step. Police officers are civilians. Being a police officer is a job, a profession. At the end of the day, they go home as civilians, just like the rest of us go home from our jobs. Nobody should be above the law, but with qualified immunity in place, our judicial system is saying that police officers are in a way. Their job is to enforce laws, not to be above it and not to abuse its power. We are demanding accountability for this despicable perpetuation of racism and violence and just outcomes for victims, as well as much more after qualified immunity is eliminated. Thank you for finally writing up this act to end qualified immunity, and I look forward to its passing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning, uh, Ms. Musgrove. And are there questions from committee members? Seeing none again, thank you for taking the time to testify today. And I know that you have submitted written testimony as well, and that will be reviewed by the committee. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I will now uh, move to the next person on my list, uh, Michael Kibita. Uh, nice to see you again, sir. Um, you can begin your testimony as soon as you are comfortable. Thank you, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney, and esteemed members of the committee. Good morning. My name is Michael Cabeda and I'm policy counsel for the ACLU of Maine. On behalf of our members, we urge you to support this landmark legislation because it would restore faith in law enforcement by reaffirming the central principle that no one is above the law. Where there is a right, there is a remedy. This simple concept has been a central feature of legal systems that recognize some measure of individual rights for at least 1500 years. The idea that every right necessarily entail, entails a remedy was celebrated by the framers of the Constitution and was extensively embraced in Marbury versus Madison, the Supreme Court decision, which forms the basis for our entire judicial system. Today, the idea that a right implies a remedy is the reason why you can sue federal officials if they unlawfully break into your home. 
It's why unconstitutionally seized evidence cannot be introduced against you in a criminal proceeding. And it's why you can sue for damages, even if the unconstitutional search doesn't yield anything incriminating or illegal. Sovereign immunity, an exception to the principle that rights require remedies in order to be meaningful, rests uneasily with the idea that no one is above the law. That exception shields the state itself from certain suits. That rule should not extend to public officials who use their authority to break rules that apply to everyone. Unfortunately, some United States Supreme Court cases have suggested that police somehow are above the law. The result has been an unvarnished disaster. In a recent case, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals held that corrections officers were entitled to qualified immunity when they intentionally tortured a prisoner by making him sleep in a freezing cell covered in feces for six days. Even though the Supreme Court reversed that particular case, egregious cases like that happen all the time, including in Maine. Some states like Colorado, New Mexico, and Connecticut have realized that constitutional necessities, like the Fourth Amendment right to be free from excessive force or the Eighth Amendment prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment, will not be realized if officers cannot be held liable for the damage they cause. We should have the courage of our constitutional commitments and follow their example. But this bill can be stronger. If this bill were enacted, corrections officers would continue to enjoy the qualified immunity defense. We urge the committee to amend the bill to include corrections officers, along with other types of officers covered by this bill. Such an amendment would help ensure that incarcerated people can also enforce their constitutional rights, the same as people outside prison walls. We urge you to vote ought to pass as amended in accordance with the amendment that we suggest. Thank you for your time and attention, and I'm happy to try to answer questions. Thank you very much, sir, for your testimony today and for the written testimony that you submitted as well. The committee appreciates your participation in the process. Are there questions from committee members for Mr. Cabetta? Seeing none again, thank you very much for your time and testimony today. Uh, I will now wait for uh, the committee clerk to move the next person into the queue from the queue. And um, Ms. Panette, I'm not seeing up. Oh, I do now. Thank you. Um, I will now uh, recognize uh, Stephen Drew. Um, Mr. Drew, whenever you are comfortable testifying, uh, please unmute your microphone, activate your video, and begin your three-minute testimony. Mr. Drew, I'll, I, if you can hear me, I need you to unmute your microphone and activate your video so that we can see and hear you as you present your testimony. Tom, it looks like Ms. March is also ready to activate it and ready to go. Um, Thank you. Uh, I did note that and I will, um, since uh, they are on the line, I will begin with uh, Ms. March, uh, Tanya March. Um, Whenever you're comfortable, you can begin your three minute testimony and welcome to the Judiciary Committee. You just need to unmute your microphone. You're still muted. Hi, um, I am here to speak because I am a mother. I have six children. I grew up in a white household where um, we were taught to trust the cops and believe that they have your best interest at heart, that they are there to protect and serve. Um, and as I grew older and began to have children of my own, I have interracial children. And I started seeing cases like Tamir Rice and other, you know, even the woman that spoke earlier today about her nephew. And those things began to kind of begin a fear in me that my children were not safe, especially if cops were around. And the last thing that I would do if they were in danger would be to call a cop to come save them because they could in fact be the ones that would actually endanger my children. And I believe that qualified immunity helps protect cops in these types of situations from actually obeying the training that they have been given. And I think that we need to push this bill forward so that way these situations do not continue happening and our children can be more safe and everyone can be held accountable for what they do um, with great 
you know, they, there's great responsibility when you have a position of power and they have a position of power and they need to be held responsible for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. March. Are there questions from committee members for Ms. March? Seeing none, I thank you for your testimony. And Mr. March, I noticed that you had registered to testify as well. Do you wish to proceed, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee and begin your three minute testimony. So my name is Andrew March. Um, I think something unique about me is that I wasn't born in this country. And so I had to pay extra special attention to the Constitution for obvious reasons. Um, I did not grow up. Uh, I grew up as a child in the 90s and I did not grow up um, viewing police in a negative light. Um, I remember our favorite shows as kids was NYPD Blue. Uh, it was a grimy, gritty show about cops in New York City. And, and uh, our other favorite show was um, New York Undercover, just basically this black guy and this Latino guy get together and, you know, become detectives to try to help their neighborhood type of thing. So I, I don't come from this uh, from an anti-police, anti-cop perspective. Um, the other reason I don't come as an anti from an anti-cop perspective is that both of my brothers are law enforcement officers. <laughs> and um, uh, one of them is, is uh, risks his life every single day. Um, the reason that I'm against qualified immunity just has to do with the, the um, in my mind, the contradiction to the vision of the founding fathers of this, of this nation. You know, we all know the preamble to the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal, endowed with inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. The next line says that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And obviously it goes on to talk about how, um, you know, we have the right to amend laws and change them um, when those laws are not supporting that principle. Um, it is obvious to me, and I, I don't I don't think I've ever heard anyone who supports qualified immunity argue against this. The founding fathers would turn around in their graves if they heard that uh, the, the, the children, uh, their children, uh, the men who picked up muskets because uh, of grievance 15 in the 29 grievances, where it talks about how British officers were protected in mock trials. Um, and that's one of the reasons they took up muskets. It's in, incredible to me to believe that those same men would say, yeah, that's great. You've got a group of people now who've, who've got immunity from the Constitution. Great. Um, obviously, that's not the case. <clears throat> Furthermore, some of the defenses I've heard against qualified immunity are strange. One is, if we remove this, then there will be frivolous lawsuits. Well, were there frivolous lawsuits in policing up to 1967? Um, Colorado just passed uh, their qualified immunity and as of December 2020, and the first lawsuit was a mother whose four children were held at gunpoint um, by the Colorado police, and it was all mistaken identity. Whoops. Um, th that's not a frivolous lawsuit. Finally, the idea that we're having a hard time recruiting people because of this is concerning to me. Wouldn't we want to weed out those police who would not want to join the force if they're liable for prosecution for violating people's constitutional rights? Isn't that a good thing that a person would not join the profession for that? Mr. Drew, I apologize for interrupting you, but we are really trying to work the three minute clock. So I would ask you just to wrap up if, quickly if you could. Yeah, th that was that was my last point. I'm, I'm over time. You guys have been very gracious. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony today uh, for the both of you uh, uh, for presenting to the Judiciary Committee. Are there questions from committee members for Mr. Or, uh, uh, for Andrew and Tanya, which is how I see your names up here. Seeing none, thank you very much um, for your time and testimony. Greatly appreciated. I will now turn to Stephen Drew. Glad you got your, the technology worked out. Uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee and please begin your three minute testimony. Yes, I think I've got it worked out. Can you hear me okay now? You're just fine, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first of all, we'd like to thank you all for uh, allowing us to add our voice uh, in support of this bill. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to read a statement that I previously emailed to a number of you uh, regarding our own personal experience uh, at the hands of the uh, Maine State Police tactical team. And with your permission and indulgence, I'll do that now. 
On March 20th, 2019, I called 911 upon the advice and instruction of my wife, S. Lynn Drew, physician, Dr. Kimberly Decker of St. Mary's Health Center in Lewiston, Maine, to request medical assistance in having my wife transported to the hospital for evaluation and treatment of an ongoing and worsening mental health crisis resulting from her suffering from withdrawal from her antidepressant, anti-anxiety medications, which she'd been without for some time. I called for assistance the previous evening, so it was known and recorded that there had been a prior response to our home by the deputies of the Oxford County Sheriff's Office very recently. Unfortunately, during that first response the previous evening, deputies advised that uh, they could not respond to my request for assistance as my wife stated to them uh, when they questioned her that she was not a threat to either herself or to me. They advised me to simply leave her alone for the evening and they left. The following day, the situation with my wife worsened and continued to do so throughout the day, prompting my second call to my wife's physician and again upon her advice and instruction, her assistance in having her transported to the hospital. This time, however, as a result of my wife's worsening state of mind, there resulted in eight hour, what the police called a standoff with the police surrounding our home almost entirely uh, the, the time. My wife spent in a deep sleep as a result of having been drinking a lot through the day as a way of trying to cope with the effects of her withdrawal. The incident culminated in the main state tactical team making an assault on our home by first firing, by their own account, 48 CS 40 millimeter barricade chemical munitions rounds into our home, destroying almost all of our windows, both our doors, as well as causing substantial internal damage. One of these rounds, according to my wife, just narrowly missed striking her in the head, which in all likelihood would have severely injured or even killed her. The officers then violently breached our house, kicked in an open door to a bedroom, kicked open a door to the bedroom in which my wife was sleeping, apparently with enough force that the door got stuck halfway up the, one of the officer's legs when it went through. They then attacked my wife who was lying on the floor where she'd been sleeping with a canine dog, which severely bit repeatedly while the officer stood and watched removing, before removing the dog, according to my wife, which was left with now constant severe pain, terrible disfigurement to her leg uh, and scarring. The officers then proceeded to violently remove my wife from the home without even allowing her to put anything on other than light clothing that uh, she had been sleeping in. Um, and they literally threw out into the yard um, a hard, icy, glass-covered ground. Uh, okay, I've, apparently I've run out of time, but I have uh, I have sent this previously. I just wanted to try and read as much to this into the record as possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Drew. And, and we do have a copy of your written testimony. I know you had sent it to me earlier. We appreciate your Thank time. You. And testimony, and your wife Lynn had registered to testify as well. Did yes, she she's here. Uh, here. Welcome, Ms. Yes. Ms. Drew. Yes, I'll yes. be yes. testifying as soon as you feel comfortable, and I saw you keeping time as well. So you're familiar <laughs> with the three-minute clock. We appreciate that. Uh, begin testifying as, as soon as you're ready. Okay, my name's Lynn Drew. I'm from Waterford, Maine, and I am. Uh, I'm, I'm recording this as a victim and I am not about defending police. I'm all for them. Anytime I hear anybody get shot, I, I just pray the cops are, are all all right. What I am about is the abuse of their power and they severely injured a very innocent person for no reason. I All I needed was to have my medication, which I was not refusing to take, but I did not have it. And all I wanted to, all I do when I get into my depression is I just want to sleep and just be left alone. It didn't happen. All of a sudden I'm being attacked by a dog and thrown out through my living room. My feet never hit the floor. My living room is 20 feet long. They threw me out under the hard, cold, frozen ice, concrete steps and proceeded to jump on me. I don't know how much they all weigh when they're all geared up, but I'm five foot one and I weigh 123 pounds. I had a lot of tonnage on me. And when they did the knee strike to the kidney and the neck, he would do it. There was an officer trying to cuff me and he couldn't because of my bracelets that I wear 24 seven. And he got mad and got up and jumped on me again. That's abusive. 
There was no reason. I wasn't fighting. I wasn't hollering. I never even spoke a word. They pick me up, then they start telling me, oh, do we have to carry you like a baby? I barefoot, frozen ice, with a severe dog bite with the blood running down my leg and down the road or down my pathway. And they're telling me, but we have to pick you up like a baby, carry you like, well, I wanted to say something, but I didn't. I didn't say anything to anyone to warrant the aggressive, violent reactions of these people that promoted their own actions for the violence. I, would, I slept through everything until there was a leg through my door, a dog attacking me. I, the only words I said was, what the, exactly. I never got anything else out. I had to glare at them because I was, I was laying on the floor, pounding my hands on the floor because this dog is biting at me. And I look over at them like, what do you want me to do? I got no weapons. I mean, and then they just reach in, grab me, throw me, jump on me, can't cuff me, jump on me again, and then taunt me. Thank you. This bill has got to pass, please. This is, this is ridiculous. Thank you very much, Ms. Drew. Uh, we Thank greatly you. appreciate your testimony and the written testimony that you submitted as well. Thank you. Um, at this point, I am going to begin working from the list of opponents. If there are people in favor of the legislation that we're considering right now, rest assured, I will get back to you after we go through the opponents uh, who have not had a chance to speak uh, to this point and then that those neither for nor against, but everybody who wants to be heard on this bill will be heard. So I will uh, now turn to those testifying in opposition to the bill and I uh, recognize and welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Um, it's Major Brian Scott, is that correct, sir? Um, Good morning, sir, that is correct. Uh, thank you very much for being here again with the Judiciary Committee and you can begin your three minute testimony whenever you're set to go. Thank you, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Major Brian Scott, and I'm here today to testify on behalf of the Department of Public Safety, the Maine State Police, in opposition to LD 214. This bill has been one of the most talked about proposed statutes in the law enforcement community that I've been involved with during my entire career. This bill would have a negative impact on the law enforcement profession and result in a more dangerous state to live in or visit. It has already had a chilling effect, leaving a tremendous amount of morale issues for honest, hardworking police officers who put their lives on the line every day for complete strangers without hesitation. I have seen more officers resign or retire in the last year as a result of this pending legislation, coupled with the national defund the police movement, which has villainized all cops, not just the bad ones. Some proponents seem to think that the term qualified immunity means absolute immunity, but that could not be farther from the truth. Rogue officers who aim to cause harm and commit atrocious acts are not protected by qualified immunity. No one, and I mean no one, dislikes a bad cop more than a good one. They have no business in our profession. They should be fired, decertified, successfully sued, and when an officer has acted maliciously, all of those things happen now with our current statutes, with our current uh, court cases. Qualified immunity does not protect bad actors. However, qualified immunity offers some level of protection for good police officers who act with the absolute best of intentions in accordance with their training, education, and experience while trying their hardest to do the right thing, but make a decision under the most stressful of conditions that is later determined to not have been the best way to have acted in a particular situation. Decisions that are made in fractions of a second, sometimes while facing life or death, knowing that any inaction can result in a third person being killed or injured themselves, uh, decisions that are later evaluated by others in the comfort and security of their surroundings without any fear or danger, without any limitations on time, decisions that are deliberated by uh, attorneys, judges for weeks and months, and sometimes they can't agree. A police officer can be doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason and bad things can happen. If and when that day comes, they should be afforded some reasonable level of protection. Qualified immunity basically means that if, as a police officer, you do your job to the best of your ability and you make an honest mistake in the official performance of your duties that you may not be successfully personally sued and lose everything that you have worked for. 
However, this LD appears to change those protections so that an officer places everything they own on the line every single time they are thrust into action and compelled to make a decision in circumstances that are tense, rapidly evolving, and uncertain. This law change would in effect require that a police officer, a human being, be absolutely perfect in the performance of their duties because an honest mistake could cost you everything that you have. This result, I will speed it up, I see the clock there, thank you. This would result many officers leaving the profession and those that remain on the job paralyzed for fear to do their job. I've submitted written testimony that has more information. I'd appreciate it if you'd read that. But for the reasons that I've stated, I urge you to vote ought not to pass on LD 214. Thank you for your time. Happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you, Major Scott. And it's nice to see you again. And we do have your written testimony and the committee will review it. Are there questions from committee members for Major Scott? Seeing none, thank you again very much for your time, uh, the testimony you delivered today and the written testimony that you submitted. Thank you all. We'll now turn to, and welcome back to the committee. Uh, we saw you recently, uh, Chief Deputy uh, Rand Maker. Welcome back and begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're ready. Thank you, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett and all honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Rand Maker and I serve as the Chief Deputy of the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office. I'm appearing before you today on behalf of the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office to record our opposition to LD 2114, 214, an act to eliminate qualified immunity for police officers. We are concerned about the reasoning for targeting our profession and the impact of LD 214 will have on hiring and retentions, as well as financial impact to both the employee and the employer. We are concerned that LD 214 will not allow a reasonable law enforcement officer in the state of Maine to make a mistake. I wonder if anyone listening to me today can say they have never made a mistake. LD 214 will prohibit this even if a law enforcement officer is acting reasonably and within agency policy. What I really want you to hear today is how, if enacted, LD 214 will likely cost some lives. A recent example of this impact occurred less than a week ago in the town of Wiscasset. Lincoln County deputies were dispatched to a local hotel after receiving a complaint that a female in a hotel room may need assistance. When deputies arrived, they could hear a woman crying and were uncertain if they saw another male standing near a door. Deputies attempted to make contact with those inside the room for over 30 minutes before they could hear nothing inside. No crime was clearly being committed or even reported. They were left with a decision, make entry or just simply walk away. I'm happy to report the deputies on the scene made the life-saving decision to forcibly enter this room. Upon entry, they found two people in immediate need of medical care due to an apparent opiate overdose. These heroes were able to immediately administer Narcan before medical professionals were staged nearby could enter the room. The medical professionals later transported both these occupants to a hospital room for definitive care. Eliminating qualified immunity would not allow these reasonable law enforcement officers to make a mistake without subjecting our agency or each individual to a potential civil liability. I am deeply concerned that LD 214, if enacted, would, would create a similar situation that we would likely cause some deaths. I can state with certainty that the two individuals found within this room would have died without the decision we made last week. Law enforcement by nature must make difficult decisions each day, often in a split second. If LD 214 is enacted, it will undoubtedly create more tough choices with life and death situations. Thanks for your generosity of your time, and I would be pleased to answer any questions you might have. Right on, Senator Carney. <laughs> Well done, Chief Deputy Maker. Uh, we, we love people who hit the target right on the nose. Uh, and thank you for your testimony and thank you for the written testimony that you submitted as well. Are there questions from committee members for Chief Deputy Maker? Seeing none, again, thank you very much for your uh, testimony today and the written testimony. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, before moving on, I just wanna remind all those in attendance that the chat function is for technical assistance. It is not part of the record, so comments in the chat will not be considered by the committee. 
thank you. Uh, I will now turn to uh, Chief Jared Mills uh, for the main uh, Chiefs of Police Association. Welcome Chief to the Judiciary Committee. It's nice to see you again and please feel free to begin your three minute testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Representative Harnett. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Jared Mills and I'm providing testimony opposed to LD 214 on behalf of the Maine Chiefs of Police Association. A series of events over the past couple of years have led to a reckoning for Americans, including Mainers over a collective response to injustices both real and perceived against racial and ethnic minorities and marginalized groups of citizens. Not the least of these events were the murder of George Floyd at the hands of a police officer and the insurrection of the US Capitol led in large part by a white supremacist group. It is not surprising therefore that these events have led to proposed legislation, some of which is designed to increase the accountability of law enforcement officers. The main Chiefs of Police has in fact already supported measures to increase police accountability. And we believe that, the, that an examination of what is known as qualified immunity is appropriate. But the question of what to do about it is much more complex and nuanced than simply deciding whether to keep it or do away with it. Therefore, we strongly oppose abandoning it, especially without a thorough examination of what it is, how it works, and how it might be changed. We note that Senator Carnegie is sponsoring another bill on this topic, LD 416, which recognizes that simply abandoning qualified immunity is not appropriate. Qualified immunity is called that because it's absolute, it is not absolute immunity, it's limited. Maine law provides immunity to hosts of occupations and entities depending on their role. This includes persons responding to natural disasters, good Samaritans, and officers of charitable organizations who donate their time and skills or just, are just some examples. In many cases, these immunities are qualified. That is, they are limited by the circumstance involved. Law enforcement officers may, uh, law enforcement officers play a unique role in our society. They are charged with enforcing the laws that are designed to maintain a civilized society. Law enforcement officers are asked to immediately rush to see the scenes of some of the most dangerous situations we can imagine, whether it is an active shooter in a building, the scene of domestic, a domestic violence disturbance, or an armed robbery. Many of, our, many of our departments are struggling to find enough qualified applicants to fill vacant positions. We fully expect that if this bill passes, it will become even more difficult to fill these police jobs. How many people are going to choose a career in law enforcement if one of the first things they learn at the police academy is that any action, any action that they take could result in a lawsuit against them personally with potentials for monetary damages. Doing away with qualified immunity will open the floodgates for much litigation against police officers in the state's courts, whether tru truly warranted or not. Most civil actions against law enforcement officers for violations of citizens' civil constitutional rights are brought in federal court pursuant to 42 United States 1983. But in the same decision cited above, the court also made it more difficult for plaintiffs to persuade a judge to waive qualified immunity. Some would say too difficult. The state of Maine has no ability to change that standard by the federal judge to make this determination. It can only change what happens in state courts. But there is a lot of daylight between the status quo and total abandonment of qualified immunity. We think it would be irresponsible to abandon this principle for those we send into danger with no examination of other alternatives. The main Chiefs of Police is prepared to participate in discussions about additional measures that increase accountability, whether they involve how, how law enforcement officers are hired and trained, the policies that guide the work of law enforcement officers, and how those engaged in misconduct are dealt with. In the meantime, we urge you to give LD 214 an ought not to pass. Thank you, Chief Mills. Um, uh, for your testimony today and for the written testimony that you submitted as well. Committee appreciates your input. Are there questions from committee members for Chief Mills? Seeing none, thank you very much, sir. And I will now turn to Christopher Hansen. Welcome, Mr. Hansen, and please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Good morning, thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Christopher Hansen and I live in Rockport, Maine. Um, it has been said several times that getting rid of qualified immunity will not affect good police officers. Um, and I, I couldn't, I really couldn't disagree more. Um, however, the most affected group would be the citizens that our police serve every day. Um, and for the record, I, I am a police officer currently. Um, you see the, the, the good police officers, they're not using 
qualified immunity to get out of a jam when they've done something wrong. Um, QI doesn't protect an officer who's used excessive force or violated someone's civil rights. Police officers involved in shootings, they don't get qualified immunity. There's, there's always a full investigation. Um, QI is not the blanket get out of jail free card that people make it out to be. Um, obviously, some other folks have, have spoken much more eloquently about what QI qualified immunity really is, but um, it's, it's not like diplomatic immunity. You know, um, a, a judge actually needs to qualify it, hence in the name qualified immunity. Um, qualified immunity, it, it simply protects good officers from civil liability when an unforeseen circumstance leads to a less than perfect outcome, even though the officer has used their best judgment, followed all of the, the federal, state, and local laws and policies, guidelines that they're supposed to be following. Um, police officers are, are human. We all are. And as we all know, that no matter how hard we try, sometimes bad things happen to good people. Taking away qualified immunity from these good people because of the handful of bad cops, and there are a handful of bad cops out there, we all know this, but if we take away the qualified immunity to, from the, the good guys because of the bad guys who have benefited from it, it just isn't right. It would be like us taking away all of your car insurance, all the representatives that are, that are here today because one of you had an OUI crash. That wouldn't be fair to you, would it? So anyway, um, there'll be a lot of really good police officers who leave the profession. They're calling really. If you take away qualified immunity, they will no longer be there for the public to call on in their times of need. They cannot afford the risk their families are going to endure because of these, and somebody said it before, frivolous lawsuits, 12 seconds. <laughs> Please don't put the public at greater risk by telling the good police officers you don't appreciate the sacrifices they make every day and putting them at even greater risk by taking away qualified immunity. I really appreciate all of your time today and uh, please, please vote against this. It's terrifying. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Officer Hansen. Um, and I don't know your titles. So I apologize if I'm- uh, I'm a detective, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time and, and your testimony. And I believe you submitted written testimony as, as well. Uh, I am turning to questions for committee members. Representative Libby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question was actually in regards to written testimony because I'm in the committee materials and I don't see it, but I and others do always appreciate being able to go back and reread testimony. So if you, if you haven't submitted testimony, Detective Hansen, um, if you are able to, it would be much appreciated. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Libby. I misspoke. I just checked the list again and uh, I do not see written testimony. Thank you for pointing that out. And again, thank you for being here today, sir. Um, seeing no other questions, I will move on to our next presenter and welcome Damon Lefferts to the Judiciary Committee. And um, please begin your testimony as soon as you're comfortable by unmuting your microphone and activating your video. There we, there we go. Nice Good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Damon Lefferts. I'm a detective from Waterville Police. I've been in law enforcement for 15 years. I got in this profession to help people in need and hold others accountable for the things that they have done, not to take away anyone's civil or constitutional rights. I took an oath when I became a law enforcement officer that I will never betray my badge or the public's trust. A police officer that purposely breaches the public's trust and violates their rights crosses a line into becoming a criminal themselves and should not be practicing law enforcement. Like every profession, some people lack commitment, true integrity, and work ethic, but that speaks for a person's individual basis, not the profession as a whole. For an example, according to a 2018 article from CNBC, the third leading cause of death in the United States is medical errors made by doctors, pharmacists, and surgeons. Only heart disease and cancer cause more deaths than medical errors. A study conducted by John Hopkins University states that more than 250,000 people die in the U.S. each year from medical errors. Doctors and surgeons, just like the police, need to make split-second decisions, and human error may play a role in those decisions. 
but I certainly do not pin that profession as a negativity due to some inadequate doctors, surgeons, or pharmacists that made, made human errors that cost a person's life. Law enforcement professionals will make human errors as well. Violent and, and or life-saving events will happen and possibly turn on you in no time. One evening, I was at a uh, rare dinner at a local restaurant. I was not on duty and I was in dress clothes. The staff knew that I was a police officer and asked me to assist them with an intoxicated woman who has locked herself in the bathroom and was breaking glass inside of the packed restaurant. In my mind, I knew I had to act now for the responsibility to protect the woman breaking glass. Was she hurting herself? Was she making a weapon to hurt the staff or the 40 patrons in the restaurant? I also knew I had to protect the property of the restaurant and I had to be careful about my own safety as well. I knocked on the door of the bathroom and told her I was a police officer and the staff wants you to leave. The female refused. While I can hear banging in the bathroom, I opened the door and the female punched me in the face. The staff saw it, the patrons saw it, and sadly my wife did, all on date night. I pushed the female back and she landed on the floor, and I told her to stay down with her hands on her back to keep her from assaulting me any further. At this point, the restaurant was empty, and sitting there was my wife, crying, obviously traumatized from witnessing the three-minute event which took place, where she saw me get assaulted along with the mere chaos the female was creating. That night, I did not have my weapons or handcuffs in my person after my regular working hours. However, I am always working. I'm always a police officer no matter what. And I'm okay with that. I'm glad I was there to help the staff so they did not get assaulted along with any patrons. Qualified immunity afforded me to act that night for direct protection of others and property, which I promised to uphold my oath to my profession. If qualified immunity were taken away, that would enter my mind if I was ambushed in that situation again. My situation is an example of what qualified immunity does for the officers and the public. You hear about defunding the police, but what you really need to hear is that taking away qualified immunity will depopulate the police, who will want to do this job knowing that every human error may potentially result in a lawsuit. If someone is in trouble and needs an officer, an officer is the only person that is coming, not the National Guard, not the Army, the police officer. If the police officer is not coming, no one else is. The police need qualified immunity to carry out their daily functions, not to defy one's rights. If an officer does that, they will be held accountable by their administration and the Criminal Justice Academy. Qualified immunity is not a free pass, betray your badge, or the public's trust. Qualified immunity needs to remain for everyone's well-being. Detective Lefferts, I, I apologize for interrupting, but I let you go uh, quite a bit over the three-minute time. Okay. I, I want to be respectful to all those waiting to testify. I appreciate that. If you, I, if you could wrap up. Um, That's it. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Detective. Uh, are there questions from committee members for Detective Lefferts? Seeing none, I, again, thank you for your service and I, the, the committee appreciates your testimony um, today. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys. Uh, next, I will call upon Danielle Lefferts. And Ms. Lefferts, you may begin testifying as soon as you are comfortable. I see that your mic is unmuted and your camera's activated, but I'm not seeing you, but we hopefully we'll see you when you begin to speak. Am I good? You are good. I'm not seeing you, but uh, that that's fine. You, you may begin testifying. Thank you. Good morning. I am Danielle Lefferts from China, Maine. I speak to all of you today in support of my husband and law oh, enforcement in opposition of LD214. More importantly, I speak to you on behalf of our three children, ages six, nine, and 11. Please think about what this looks like, not just for officers and our families, but for the safety of your families and communities. Officers put you and other families' needs before their own. My husband knew this was part of the career when he chose his profession, and I knew this is what I signed up for when I chose to marry him. But we also had reassurance and qualified immunity and other protections for our family while he was making split second decisions to protect yours. There are two key words we need to keep in the forefront today, qualified and frivolous. Qualified immunity protects my family from frivolous lawsuits that can easily arise while my husband is trying to protect and serve people in your communities. QI does not make him bulletproof and it does not let him be treated above the law. Taking it away does not improve policing practices it does not implement training for mental health crisis. It does not stop systematic racism. Again, it protects my family from frivolous lawsuits. His actions have to be 100% justified according to the Constitution, the departmental policies, academy training, and state law. The removal of QI at the local levels is not the action or reaction to take against deeper systematic areas in law enforcement that our country struggles with. 
the general public impression is that police and their families get away with things and need to be treated equal to civilians, we are actually held to the highest of standards beyond civilians. I have been pulled over for speeding and issued a ticket as the officer and I laughed about what my husband was going to say. I was not treated above the law. My husband and I live under a microscope. We choose carefully who we allow in our inner circle and we don't use our real name on sporting uniforms. We are constantly shielding our children and having hard conversations with them like not to wear their thin blue line bracelet in a restaurant for fear of our order being tampered with. Can you imagine being woken up in the middle of the night with a phone call from work stating that someone who was just released made a serious threat to kill you and your family? Also letting you know the location of said person was unknown and the last cell phone ping was within miles from your home where your children were sleeping. We have the threats on officers' lives along with their families happen so frequently that officers become numb. Trust me, we want to be treated like civilians, but we are different. Our guards are always up and we are always censoring what we say, do, and where we go. My children should not fear sharing that their daddy is a detective who helps people. This bill is singling out is only singling out law enforcement and not addressing all of the public employees that it covers, such as you and even myself as a teacher. Keeping QI for officers does not mean supporting racism or allowing bad policing to continue. It allows them pr to protect you without hesitation. By removing qualified immunity, you are putting the public in danger. With recruitment rates already at an alarming low, attracting qualified new officers is going to be even more difficult with this protection gone, along with losing the qualified veteran officers. This discussion should be about providing appropriate resources, training, education, and support. Qualified immunity is only a qualified action, not a free pass. A protection- Thank you. Ms. Lefferts, I, I apologize for interrupting, but I, I did let you go over the, the three minutes Sorry. and I need you to Thank wrap you. up. Thank you. Um, please vote not ought, ought not to pass. Thank, thank you very much for your time and, and testimony today. The committee appreciates it. Uh, questions from committee members, Representative Thorne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not so much as a question. I just wanted to thank Ms. Lefferts uh, for showing up today and providing testimony. And it's not my desire to thank every applicant uh, that provides testimony today, but um, having my, my daughter married to a uh, sheriff's deputy who is a detective and she is also in education. I can certainly appreciate your position and the courage that it took for you to come and provide testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Thorne, and thank you again, Ms. Lefferts. Uh, I will, seeing no other questions from committee members, I will turn to our next uh, person registered to testify, uh, Daniel Turtelot. Um, please begin your three minute testimony when you feel comfortable, sir. Thank you very much. Senator Kerry, Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee, I am Daniel Turtelot speaking today on behalf of the Maine Law Enforcement Coalition, which proudly represents approximately 3,000 Maine state, municipal, and county law enforcement offices to testify in opposition to LD-214. After months of negative media coverage, <clears throat> both at the national and state level, the Maine Law Enforcement Coalition made a decision to have critical insights conduct a poll to determine how Maine citizens viewed law enforcement. The coalition was confident that the majority of Maine citizens were supportive, but were not completely sure where the number would be given the barrage of negative media. Here are the results of the poll. First question, how much of an impact do you think law enforcement in Maine has on the state's ability to remain one of the safest states in the country? The results, eight out of 10, 81% surveyed of surveyed voters believe law enforcement contributes to the high level of safety in Maine, with many voters believing law enforcement has a major impact on safety in the state. Question two, in general, how would you describe your view of Maine law enforcement? Results, eight out of 10, 81% of Mainers have a positive view of law enforcement in Maine, including four out of 10 who hold strongly positive view of law enforcement in the state. <laughs> Question three, recently Maine law enforcement has, experienced, has been experienced a shortage of new candidates and a difficulty retaining ex existing officers. How much of a priority do you think this shortage of law enforcement officers should be for lawmakers in Maine? Results, nine out of 10, 88% voters 
of the voters in Maine believe state shortage of law enforcement officers should be a priority for lawmakers. Well over half, in fact, believe this shortage should be a major priority. So if, the goals, if there was a gold standard for measuring the performance of law enforcement officers in Maine, then has to be the, it has to be the opinion of people of the state of Maine. In this poll, it is obvious that Maine people are demanding that, law make, that lawmakers maintain and do what they can to, to uh, keep the level of protection that keeps Maine, the state of Maine, number one in the safest state in the country. That being the case, then it seems that LD214 would certainly go against the will of the people of our great state because of the impact it's going to have on ret retention and recruitment of current and, and future offices. I, uh, I do have one other number on the heels of uh, National uh, Law Enforcement Appreciation Week. There's an, um, another number I want you to consider, 87. This number represents the number of law enforcement officers on the main law enforcement officers memorial that are given their lives while protecting our state. And I thank you very much for the time that you've given me today and I'll answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Turtelot, for being before the committee today and for submitting your written testimony as well, which will be reviewed. We appreciate uh, the, both types of input. Are there questions from committee members for Mr. Turtelot? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much for your time and your testimony today. I will now turn to Edward Tharp. Um, Mr. Tharp, when you are ready, unmute your microphone. I'm sorry, did Representative Poirier have a question? So your hand. I just I just wanted to ask real quickly if the previous testimony, if he could um, send us that polling data. I do not see that in his written testimony. Did you hear the, que the question? I, I did, Representative Harnett. And yes, um, yes, I can. I'll submit that um, as soon as I get off here. I appreciate that. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Representative, and I apologize for missing your hand. There's a lot of boxes up here. Um, it, uh, Mr. Tharp, uh, just begin uh, your three-minute testimony when you feel comfortable, and welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Yes, sir. Can everybody hear me? Yes. And okay. Oh, well. I got a picture. Now that's good. Um, first of all, I want to uh, say that I'm just amazed at uh, the testimony of our law enforcement community, in particular, um, I apologize, uh, Peggy, or I'm Danielle rather. Uh, her profession as a teacher is a calling as so is her husband's. I'm a four, um, and, they, and they, they do these things because they're called to. It's not just because they do them as a job. That's what a police officer does, that's what a teacher does. Um, I would like to say that I am a former firefighter. I have worked with police officers, not just um, alongside them, but with them. In one case, uh, one family of a police officer and a mental health crisis that they were dealing with. And um, I know them intimately and well over 30 years. And I can tell you that um, they have lost something that they used to have when I was a kid, which was that they were highly respected as a teacher um, is in the community. Uh, with all of this disting of so much, uh, you know, that I hear so much, even from the people that are opposed, you know, these emotional stories, and they're very emotional. And, you know, the most honest part of what you're hearing from the law enforcement side is, yes, there are some bad apples, okay? There always have been, and I've actually known a few myself. But I just want to read a statement very quickly. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, I have friends in law enforcement right now, locally and uh, down in the Portland area. I can tell you that these people do their jobs. They go into the job wanting to do the right thing and uh, they need all the support we can give them. So our law enforcement leadership from the local and state levels have done very well in speaking against proposed bill to end qualified media immunity for police officers. All of them have presented ironclad points and truthful examples as to why LDT, LD214 is a disaster for the state of Maine. They have spoken to you with the utmost professionalism, politeness as they should in their possessions. And I will add honesty, you've heard it today. As a citizen and not a member of not the law enforcement community, 
I intend to speak to this issue a bit more forwardly and harshly. So here I go. Maine's finest need to know when risking their lives every day for you and me, just as a combat soldier, that we, the public, have their backs. Now, in a lot of times, a law enforcement officer, you know, doesn't have, he can leave his pr pr profession or she can leave her profession. A combat soldier can't. I've been there, okay? I've not, I have not been in combat, but I've been a soldier. This current social trend to be down on cops is disgusting and dangerous, as is LD214. It is a hard fact that young people are not signing up to be law enforcement officers as they have in the past, and there's currently a severe shortage of officers statewide. This is a huge problem, but not the biggest by far. They are quitting in other states, in some cases by the hundreds. Mr. Tharp? Mr. Yes, Tharp, I, I apologize for interrupting, but I, I need to do it to be fair to all you. Three minutes is up. If you could wrap up your testimony. Okay, sentence. very quickly. I just uh, want to speak out for our law enforcement. They need us. When you're in trouble, they are the first on the scene. They're there to help you. Please vote against this dangerous bill because crime will rise as it has in New York and other cities, and we're going to see it here. We need our police. They need our support. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I failed to hear. I know you registered as a resident of Woolwich. Is that correct? I apologize. Yes, I am a resident of Woolwich. Yes. Thank you. And I see questions from committee members, and I'll do my best to call on you in the order that I saw your hands. Representative Sheehan. Actually, Mr. Chair, Senator Carney has asked me to... Um, be in charge of the timer. So okay. I'm just putting my hand up so that I'll be visible. Thank you. And I, I should point out that I was not ignoring Senator Carney. We leave the hand up of the timer so that that box can be seen in our Hollywood Squares um, Zoom meeting. Uh, Representative Libby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for being here, Mr. Tharp. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Tharp if you were able to submit written testimony as well. I know you hadn't quite finished what you had hoped to say, and I would love to read the rest of what you had to say in a written testimony. You know, absolutely. I'd be glad to do that. Um, if you. you could somehow let me know where to send it, I'll send it. When you signed up to do um, spoken testimony, mm -hmm. there was a box where you could either write your testimony in there or you could attach it um, as a link. Uh, a linked document. I so see. if you go back to where you signed up to testify, that's right where you can submit written testimony as well. Thank you for the advice. I'm a technological moron, so I appreciate your guidance. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, seeing no additional questions, thank you very much, Mr. Tharp, uh, for your testimony today. I'll now turn to the uh, next person registered to testify, and I hope I get the last name right, uh, Elgin Physic. You did get it correct. Welcome uh, to the Judiciary Committee, sir. Be, please begin your three minute testimony when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, committee. I'm speaking out against LD 214. My name is Elgin Physic with the Maine State Police. I have been employed by the agency for 13 years and I am the first black state trooper in the history of the department. Like many of, of you, we have all witnessed recent police incidents and encounters both black men and women on the national stage and watch as the evidence of police use of force has been on full display, <clears throat> excuse me, through videos within social media and a plethora of news channels. When I have watched these time and time again, my core aches as a black man, my core aches as a father of black children, my core aches as a police officer. Through our history, I'm fully aware of the mistreatment of black and brown communities. Beginning with those first ships that traveled to this country in 1619, to the lead up and aftermath of civil war, to even the ultimate Supreme Court decision of Plessy versus Ferguson, black and brown people in this nation have been severely harmed, hated and uncared for through laws, violence and culture of embedded racism. Not to include the era of the Jim Crow, the law and order era of the 1970s, the war on drugs in the 80s, and the most recent tragedies of Rodney King in 1992, the crime bill in 1996 and the killing of Trayvon Martin, which started the Black Lives Matter movement. I reflect and recognize my own personal history is affected by each of these things. Yet I stand here knowing that lawmakers are trying to make a good faith step in preventing any further hatred, violence, or misdeeds coming from coming to Maine and its own police force. 
there is no level, there is no denying the level of racism that is in Maine, just as it's in other parts of the nation. I too have experienced that in and out of uniform and there are still pockets today with a lack of knowledge of black and brown cultural lacks. There is fatigue growing with the black community due to perceived and felt racism. But as you consider the aspect of qualified immunity, changing this or getting rid of it won't fix the problems of racism that manifest themselves here and abroad. It may seem like this is a great step, but it really starts with a mindset of collaboration, of not making this situation about us versus them, but a collaborative effort with lawmakers and departments to burrow down to the nature of day-to-day -day policing and tightening misunderstandings and seeing where the gaps are located. This would certainly come about if lawmakers were able to ride with law enforcement and see firsthand what those around the state are dealing with in their communities every day. And this does mean I'm offering an open invitation to have a ride along with me. My hope is that a more collaborative effort will be an option before we start stripping down aspects that have offered reprieve for officers to engage in their difficult job. We as officers agree there needs to be reform both within and outside of departments. This should be something police and lawmakers work out together before recondition policing for the future. Thank you for your time, consideration, and may we set an example for how we can eradicate racism in Maine. Thank you very much, uh, Trooper Physic. I hope I have your title correct. If I don't, I apologize. The committee appreciates your taking the time and your testimony today. Uh, are there questions from committee members for Trooper Physic? Seeing none again, thank you very much, sir. Um, we appreciate you being here today. Thank you, have a great day, committee. I will now turn to uh, the next uh, person on my list. Before doing that, I'd like to uh, recognize that we've been joined by uh, Representative Newell. If you would like to introduce yourself to those in attendance, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. I am Rena Newell. I serve as the tribal representative for the Passamaquoddy tribe. Please excuse my delay in joining you this morning. I was providing testimony to another committee. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Newell, and welcome. Uh, I will now turn to Jason Levitt. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee, sir, and please begin your three minute testimony when you're ready. I wanna thank the members of the committee for the chance to speak today. My name is Jason Levitt and I'm the Vice President of the Maine State Law Enforcement Association. In my 14 years as a law enforcement officer here in Maine, I have served as a field training officer, a Maine Criminal Justice Academy certified instructor in firearms and interactive use of force, I have worked with local colleges and the university on programs to help students interested in careers in conservation law enforcement. I can attest firsthand that the training provided to all law enforcement officers in Maine is second to none, and I am proud to have a small role in it. Law enforcement is a life of service, service to your fellow citizens and service to the greater good. Every law enforcement officer who puts on a vest and a gun belt and goes to work understands the risk of the next call. Families of these officers, troopers, and wardens know the risks, not some abstract faraway idea, but a real and horrible possibility experienced by families all over the country every year. A loss of qualified immunity will add a huge financial peril to these already burdened families. The results of this increased burden will be catastrophic to the profession of law enforcement. You can't make $50,000 a year and pay $40,000 a year in legal fees to defend yourself against lawsuits. This will be the reality if we lose immunity. There's been a nationwide narrative at work in our country that all police officers are evil racist men. As hard as our media is trying, this is not a narrative that works here in Maine because it is simply not true. Real hardworking Maine residents support law enforcement. These are people who will suffer the most without law enforcement. These are the tradesmen who have to replace thousands of dollars of tools every year because they are stolen and sold to pay for drugs. They are the mill workers who work their whole lives to afford a camp on a Northwoods pond only to have it broken into every year. They are the commercial fishermen who cannot find crew for their boats because drugs have taken such a hold in these towns. They are the families of over 500 people who had a loved one die of a drug overdose last year. I urge you not to let a small group of loud voices steer our state down a path that cannot recover from. There is no path to a better police force that begins with a loss of qualified immunity. There is only a path to no police. The fact that law enforcement officers will have to choose between the career that they love and the long-term financial security of their family. 
It will be a brutal choice to make, but I am afraid there is only one option. Some officers close to retirement may roll the dice and try and keep their heads down until they can go. My fear is that the good young officers we have fought so hard to recruit and retain will make the only reasonable choice and leave. These officers deserve better. They deserve the best from the communities they serve. When they are gone, what options will we have? Who will answer the call? Who will find the missing child? Who will respond to a desperate call for help? Who will protect a half a billion dollars in natural resources? Who will be the calm voice in the chaos? And who will fight the monsters? I assure you the national media has no answer to these questions. They will need to be answered here and now. Thank you, sir. Vote against. Me, sir, I'm sorry, you've gone over the three minutes. So I just need 14. Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there que and thank you for your written testimony as well that I see that you submitted. Um, are there questions from committee members? Seeing none, thank you very much for your time, uh, the testimony you provided and the testimony that you submitted. Greatly appreciated. Uh, I will now turn to Jeff McCabe. Mr. McCabe, uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Please unmute your mic and activate your video and begin when you're ready to deliver your three minute testimony. Great, thank you. Um, good morning. It's been a powerful morning already. Um, I really appreciate uh, an opportunity to listen to all sides of, of this issue this morning. Also to recognize the moment in this, in, that we're in in the state and also in the country. So Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Committee on Judiciary, my name is Jeff McCabe and I serve as a Director of Legislation and Politics for the Main Service Employees. And I'm here in opposition of LD214. MSCA represents uh, law enforcement supervisors within the executive branch. And I've had the opportunity to speak with some members this week uh, who reached out to ask for help. Um, this bill as proposed would only affect law enforcement officers, no other public sector workers, public officials elected or appointed are included in this bill. Personally and professionally, I've interacted with folks carrying out law enforcement duties associated with our state's natural resource agencies. These folks protect people, the natural resources, and those interactions may be due to my hobbies, my educational background, or my work over the last 20 years, including as a main guide. So today I find myself looking through that lens and thinking about this bill and how it may affect those folks. It is important in the discussions around this bill, you consider things associated with the roles law enforcement officers play in protecting life, natural resources, and property around the state. For the folks we represent, many of them are involved in using equipment like aircraft, ATVs, snowmobiles, and other items while carrying out their duties. Much of this work is done while traveling on unpaved road, trails, and varying types of water, including the ocean, rivers, ponds, and lakes. They plan and carry out search and rescue on land, water, and air. They work in remote areas, often alone. In doing so, they make split-second decisions, and that is what they, we require them to do. This bill will be a deterrent to law enforcement to respond and act decisively at a time when they are being asked to do more with less resources. We're concerned this proposed measure would actually create further recruitment and retention issues. Currently, labor as a whole is struggling with conversations around which laws should continue to be enforced, how we enforce those laws, and how folks responding to crisis. Too often, law enforcement officers find themselves left responding to a crisis that could have been prevented by other means. It's clear we need to raise wages and invest in a broader, deeper social safety net to prevent the disparate conditions of poverty. We need to expand our addiction and mental health support in response infrastructure. We need to invest in restorative and rehabilitative practices in our correctional system. We look forward to working with legislators on which we believe there is increasing momentum to address. We believe that things leading up to a critical incident are important, not just the actions of an officer responding in crisis. This bill and many other issues this session are challenging without the face-to-face -face interaction and deeper dialogue not broadcast via Zoom and YouTube. I look forward to the day that we can return together and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have for me at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. McCabe, uh, for your testimony today. And, and you may have heard committee members uh, love to have written testimony as well. I did not see any written testimony submitted. Is that something you 
could do um, after the hearing, if you have not already? Yeah, absolutely, Representative. I, I plan to upload that shortly. I, I sort of took some notes and I, I sort of struggle with, uh, you know, being part of a hearing as a, a former legislator, uh, sitting and taking notes and seeing if there's additional things that I may want to add. So I'm working on my final edit and I, I will get that to you folks momentarily. Thank you and totally understood and welcome back to the body in uh, which you used to serve. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate all your time. Are there questions from committee members for Mr. McCabe? Seeing none again, thank you for your time today you. and uh, for presenting your testimony. I will now turn to Jessica, Mc Jessica Ramsey. Uh, when you unmute your microphone and activate your video, uh, feel free to begin your three minute testimony. Good afternoon, Senator Carney, Representative Hartnett, ladies and gentlemen of the Judiciary Committee. I'm here to speak in opposition of LD 214, an act to end qualified immunity for law enforcement officers. My name is Jessica Ramsey and I'm a lifelong resident of Southern Maine. I am currently a police officer for the city of South Portland and have been in public safety for almost 20 years. I have also served as an advanced emergency medical technician and a 911 dispatcher. As I hope you have been able to tell, I'm prideful of my profession and the men and women I've worked with in my career. Though I'm here in front of you today for a reason that is not only vital to Maine law enforcement, it is critical in sustaining the quality of individuals we maintain in our ranks. Imposing legislation to eliminate qualified immunity based on a national agenda that is without merit and is harmful to maintaining the safety and security of Maine citizens and the communities we work in would be a great disservice to the citizens of Maine and detrimental to Maine law enforcement as a whole. The purpose of qualified immunity, as you know, is to protect government employees from frivolous litigation. Qualified immunity protects a broad range of government officials, and yet Maine law enforcement officers are the sole target of LD-214. We take an oath of honor and become law enforcement officers because we believe we have a job to do within our communities. For some of us, that's enforcing traffic laws to prevent fatal accidents and impaired driving. For others, it is maintaining a sex offender registry and trying to ensure there are no other victims. Sometimes our passions lie in community policing and providing services to the citizens. For most of us, no matter what our specialty, we are constantly striving to build positive relationships throughout our communities. Qualified immunity is not an automatic privilege. It does not protect me as a law enforcement officer from criminal charges or in internal investigations and discipline. If I break the law or act outside of city or departmental policies, it simply protects me from civil litigation and unwarranted lawsuits for doing my job and upholding the law. As you all know, we leave our families at all hours of the days and nights. We miss vacations and holidays. Our suicide and divorce rate is substantially higher than most other professions. We see things no one should have to, have to see or hear. And lately we've been subjected to a generalized view of our profession that is radically unwarranted and frankly disheartening. I love my job. I love the people I help. And sometimes, yes, I hate the things I have to do as part of my profession. But don't we all have something we don't like about our jobs? Should I be worried that the parent of a child I take away from them due to an alleged allegation of abuse can later come back and sue me personally if it was deemed that abuse never occurred? Law enforcement officers are already under a microscope. Our heads are constantly on a swivel. Should I be fearful every day when I go to work that I'm gonna be sued for doing my job when I'm acting within the law and our departmental and city policies? I'm confident when I say that if LD 214 passes, you will see a mass exodus of amazing, compassionate, trustworthy human beings who just happen to put on a law enforcement officer's uniform every day in our communities to keep them safe. Though we love our jobs, our families come first. My nine-year-old son and my 10-year-old daughter should never have to worry that mommy isn't going to come home, and yet they do. It's the nature of the job. Not only do they have to worry about me making it home, they have to worry about their father making it home as well. Please don't make our jobs harder as parents and force us to leave a job we love or risk losing our houses, my kids' education investments, or worse. Please Thanks. look at LD. Officer Rams, I need you to wrap up. I've let you go over a bit. Thank you. Okay. Please look at LD 214 from a point of view of a Maine lawmaker, not based on a national political agenda. Maine law enforcement officers are remarkable individuals and should be treated that way. We continue to support you every day by going out and doing our jobs to the best of our ability, and we don't want to have to make decision to leave law enforcement in fear that we will be subjected to unwarranted, costly civil litigation. Please thank, thank support you. us. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, but I've, I've let you go over quite a bit, and I we do have a lot of people still to testify. We greatly no appreciate your time and testimony, and thank you for your decades of public service as well. 
Thank Are you. Are there questions from committee members for Officer Ramsey? Seeing none, thank you for the, your oral testimony today. And I know you submitted written testimony as well. We will review that. Thank you for- Mr. Chair, uh, I have my hand up. Oh, I am sorry. Representative Libby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for being here today. Uh, Detective Ramsey, Officer Ramsey? Just sorry. Officer. <laughs> Officer Ramsey, thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks for the promotion. I, <laughs> I know, it happens here sometimes on our committee. <laughs> I wonder if you could just finish your testimony, please, is my question. Yeah, sure. I just closed it, hold on one second. Um, it was just very brief and short. Um, I essentially, um, the only part that I didn't finish was that as law enforcement officers in the state of Maine were scrutinized and that the Maine Criminal Justice Academy has set into place requirements that most other states do not have. MCJA requires hiring individuals to a place through rigorous hiring process, which includes polygraph examinations, extensive background checks, <coughs> psychological exams, and prior to being allowed into the basic law enforcement training, we all have to go through that. We're required to go through hundreds of hours of basic training and privileged to have the opportunity to attend multitude of advanced trainings throughout our careers. All of these things are done to ensure that officer that graduates the Maine Criminal Justice Academy is a well-rounded, law enforcement officer, an individual with the utmost professionalism and integrity who serves their community with honor and compassion to weed out those that cannot uphold that standard. Um, we taken, uh, the only other thing that I had to say was that I hope that you support us by not implementing LD 214 to end qualified immunity for law enforcement officers. And I'm happy to try to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, uh, your commitment to our communities and uh, your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Officer Ramsey. Appreciate your time. I will uh, now turn to Joanne Mason and then Justin Huntley. Um, Ms. Mason, uh, nice to see you again. Uh, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. And Thank please you. begin your three minute testimony when you're ready. Do my best, uh, Senator Carney and Representative uh, Arnett and the esteemed members of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify today. I am Joanne Mason from Reedfield. I have been married for nearly 38 years to a career law enforcement officer. So I'm speaking today as a wife. Criminal acts done while acting as a law enforcement officer does not qualify anyone for immunity from criminal prosecution or civil action. The axiom that the law enforcement will be more responsible to the public if there is a personal financial risk assumes that the police find their own finances more important than their freedom. I highly doubt that theory. Putting the risk of civil lawsuits directly on an LEO will create a situation where split second life and death decisions will not be made by muscle memory and training because doubt will creep in and people will die because of it. Community members and public servants will die because of it. If you are okay with that, then caring for human life only extends to those who are not in charge of protecting the laws that you politicians write. Then be clear to those around you that you do not support law enforcement officers. If any law enforcement officer is trained correctly, vetted correctly, and managed and monitored correctly, they are unlikely to make serious mistakes and intentional acts against people's rights. We need a dramatic change in the system of vetting and certification management. Society needs a centralized clearinghouse of improper or non-sanctioned behavior. This will ensure that cops who are below standard in any department will not be able to go to another department without fear of full history following them every time. Keeping in mind that the uh, law enforcement in Maine is not a career that anyone believes they'll become wealthy. Low starting pay for certified officers is common, especially in the rural parts of Maine. Removing qualified immunity, immunity will make it even more difficult to hire, retain well-suited qualified people to law enforcement. We will lose experienced and well-trained officers because they will not want to put their families at risk. Making substantial changes need to start with how we recruit, hire, train, and monitor officers, not how we punish those who do wrong. If you start ending the protections to officers that stop the removal, what is to stop the removal from other public officials, public servants? Immunity such as for firefighters, paramedics, corrections officers, or dispatchers. Any public servant personally liable beyond what is already written in the laws is a downhill slope and will not help the public feel safer. 
I encourage you not to make rash decisions due to the nationwide angst and think through the rep repercussions of this type of law. Because when you write the laws, you expect them to be followed. And when they are not, we have law enforcement to protect the public and enforce them. When we have justice system to punish and rehabilitate those who do not. Law enforcement officers who do not abide by the laws or their standard operational procedures are not protected by any greater standard and removing qualified immunity will not dissuade anyone from doing wrong. It will only create a situation where people can file a multitude of frivolous lawsuits which will clog the system and create an enormous cost to the municipalities. Thank, thank you, Ms. Mason. Uh, I'd let you go over the three minutes and I'm trying to be fair to everyone by keeping that Absolutely, time. I'm here. I'm available to answer questions now or at any time and thank invite you. law enforcement, uh, invite you all to uh, join a law enforcement officer on a ride along and understand better what they do. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, submitting testimony today. Um, Representative uh, Libby. Thank you. I simply wanted to ask Ms. Mason if she could please submit written testimony as well. Yeah, I, again, I wanted to make sure that uh, I had everything I wanted to say put down um, prior to this uh, before I got on here, but I will uh, type it up and send it off. Um, I think I can just uh, go to that same, same site spot. Yep, that. Exactly. Thank, Thank you exactly. for your time. Thank you very much. Um, Thank Ms. Mason. You. It was nice to see you again. As nice well. to see you too, Tom. Um, uh, I will next call on Justin Huntley. Um, Mr. Huntley, when you are ready, just uh, unmute your mic, activate your video and begin your three minute testimony. Sure, can you hear me okay? Perfectly. All right, greetings and thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear in front of you today. My name is Justin Huntley and I've worked in law enforcement for the past 16 years. I currently work as a detective with the Maine State Police and wanted to offer you my insight as a rank and file line level law enforcement officer as you consider the ramifications of LD-214. To say that LD-214 would threaten public safety in Maine is an understatement. When a police officer is asked to step in and resolve a highly stressful and evolving situation, the police officer must have the peace of mind to act in accordance with their training and in good faith, knowing that if something goes wrong, they will not have to forfeit their personal assets. I have heard from colleagues in states that have eliminated qualified immunity for police officers and the aftermath is troubling. I have heard police officers in these states um, quote unquote, look the other way and work hard to make sure they are in no position to have to make an essential arrest. Sadly, these police officers have learned that it is safer for them liability wise to show up and take a report from a victim than to put any attempt into trying to stop crime before it happens. The skyrocketing crime rate across urban America is a testament to this. I am convinced that we have some of the most dedicated law enforcement officers in the world working right here in Maine. However, if LD-214 is signed into law, I am aware of an alarming number of Maine law enforcement officers who have said they will resign. For them, the substantial risk to their livelihoods has outweighed their desire to serve. I work with a number of men and women who volunteer for specialized high-risk assignments, such as working on a tactical team, a bomb team, and a crisis negotiation team, just to name a few. These are the people that we, the rank and file, call when we need to call 911 for an emergency that is beyond our capability. I have heard many of these people discuss their plans to resign from these assignments if qualified immunity is eliminated. Many of these teams barely have enough members to operate as it is. I would ask the legislative members of this body to consider, God forbid, a crisis in their districts in which these specialized law enforcement officers are needed but unable to respond because they no longer exist. Qualified immunity is not a free pass for law enforcement officers to act egregiously. The courts routinely deny qualified immunity to police officers when they deem it appropriate. Furthermore, I can almost assure you that if the legislature wants to have a conversation about designing a mechanism to punish legitimately bad police officers, the law enforcement community would be happy to have that conversation. I respectfully ask all of you, not as a law enforcement officer, but as a constituent and a citizen who enjoys the safety and security provided by our dedicated police officers to oppose this legislation and open a dialogue about sensible improvements to the criminal justice system that protects the rights of all Mainers. Thank you very much. And I will note, I have not submitted my written testimony, but I promise to do that as soon as possible. Thank you, Detective Huntley, for your testimony and for eliminating the question I was about to ask you. I uh, greatly appreciate your time and we look forward to receiving your um, written testimony as well. Thank you for being here today. 
I will now turn to committee members uh, and open it up for questions. Representative Thorne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And with the indulgence of Representative Evangelos giving me his permission to ask a question, I'll ask a question of Detective Huntley that will hopefully serve its purpose to other committee members. You mentioned, uh, Detective, that uh, other states had enacted these uh, eliminating the protection of immunity. And might that have something to do with when we see images and pictures of of vehicles that are burning and things that are being looted and smashed that first question we ask is why is there no law enforcement there stopping these people from doing this? It might that be that maybe those states have that elimination of protection from immunity that just allows cops to stand back, let it happen, and take a report rather than get involved? Well, sir, in the circumstances you're describing, and again, talking from uh, colleagues in other states, um, my understanding from them is that a lot of times in that situation, when you see that stand back and hands off approach, their chief complaint is sometimes they're harnessed at the will of the politicians that are in charge. Um, again, that's one of their chief uh, complaints. When I was uh, speaking about officers um, not taking action in other places, this alarmingly is things I'm hearing from places that have eliminated qualified immunity because uh, they're just weighing out the risk versus the reward. And sadly, they're choosing not to take action in order to save themselves uh, financially. Thank you for that answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rep Representative Thorne, and uh, thank you again for being here today, Detective Huntley. I will now turn to the next uh, person on my list, and I welcome to the Judiciary Committee, Kristen Gway. Um, please begin your testimony after you've, uh, well, so as soon as you're comfortable. Um, so go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and other distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. My name is Kristen Gay. I actually, I live in Jay, um, but my husband is Detective Christopher Gay of the Augusta Police Department. I am opposed to LD 214. My husband started in the Augusta PD in 2006. And like most new officers, he has sort of run the gamut of all of the shifts nights, afternoons, or, or evenings, and days. He's now a detective, but in the last 15 years, he has missed birthdays, holidays, vacations, anniversaries, parent-teacher conferences, uh, little league games, um, you name it. But there have been no questions asked. As we, my, my kids and I know, he's committed to protecting and serving for 15 years. <laughs> And for 15 years, I have become an expert at holding my breath because every single time he walks out our door, I hold my breath until he walks back in or until I get the phone call, I'm okay. And for 15 years, I've listened to him whimper in his sleep, knowing he's probably having nightmares about the suicide that he was called to, the child abuse case, the rape or the unattended death that he was called to investigate. For 15 years, he has told me very little. He tries to keep me from worrying about him while his shoulders carry the worry of not only me and our kids, but of the missing woman that he searched tirelessly for for two years, or for the elderly veteran who he knows is all alone, or the drug addict that he hoped would recover. Now there is a new fear, the fear that qualified immunity, a term that I never even knew existed until recently, would be removed. The fear that in doing his job, the job, a job that he was called to, that he refuses to give up, that he, we, can be sued and lose everything we have been working for. Sued in a frivolous lawsuit by someone who does not know him or me or our three kids. The very person that my husband rushed to help, rescue, or protect would be able to rip away our lives even if he did everything within the established rules and training and acting in good, good faith to serve the public. So I ask you to consider this. 
If you have an emergency, an accident, or someone is invading your home, or you are being attacked. Sorry. <laughs> Will you call the police? Will you pray that they arrive as soon as they can? I think the answer is yes. And I would love to say that without qualified immunity, you might not get that protection, that quick response, that rescue you are so desperately praying for. But I know that my husband and all of the tenured cops that I know are still going to get to you. They're sworn to protect you and serve you and they will continue to do just that despite the efforts to take away this protection. As for me and all of the families of these brave men and women, we will go on worrying. And should we lose our livelihoods because of a lack of qualified immunity, well, at least we know you'll still be safe. Thank you for your time and letting me present. I'm opposed to LD214. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony, Ms. Gay. Um, the committee greatly appreciates it. Are there questions from committee members for Ms. Gay? Seeing none again, thank you very much for your, your time and sharing the personal details of um, being married to a law enforcement officer. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, I will now turn to Russ Taylor. Uh, Mr. Taylor, please feel free to begin your three minute testimony as soon as you are ready. You still need to activate your video, but you're okay. set to. Okay. You, you can begin with, the, with your, your testimony. Um, okay. In the interest of time. Thank you. Am I, uh, am I on now? We can hear you. We can't see you, but uh, we, we need to proceed. Well, I think that's about Hi. to change. There you go. We can see okay. your shoulders and your red tie. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, good morning, committee members. My name is Russ Taylor. I'm a representative for the New England Police Benevolent Association. <clears throat> NEPBA represents over 4,000 police officers from out New England, including hardworking and brave police officers in Aroostook County, Sheriff's Department, Presque Isle Police Department, Madawaska, and Caribou Police Departments. I'm here today to speak against LD214. Qualified immunity does not protect illegal actions by police officers. Rather, it safeguards all public officials in situations where the law is unclear and doesn't give them adequate guidance. Abolishing qualified immunity will have a negative, unintentional consequence for all main citizens, courts, public officials, and police officers. I served as a police officer for 35 years. One day, as working as a narcotics detective in plain clothes, I received information from an informant that a person was selling a carload of stolen guns at a certain location. As I was pulling into the location in an unmarked car, I observed a male in his 20s sliding a rifle into the back of the car. Three people were together, two ran off, and I took my service weapon out and saw the young man, about 22 years old, who had a pistol in his hand, at his side, partially covered, covered by a hoodie. I announced that I was a police officer and ordered him to drop the weapon. He did not. I pointed the we my weapon directly at him, ordering him to drop the weapon. He did not. I was calculating in my mind, trying to figure out, if he starts to move his gun up, will I have time to shoot first? He just stood there with the gun in his hand at his side. I kept ordering him and telling him that I would shoot if he moved. As other, other units were arriving, he dropped the gun, was arrested. As he was being put in the wagon, one of the other officers told me he wanted to talk to me. When I approached him, he said, thanks for not killing me. I then asked him, why didn't you just drop the gun? He replied, I could see in your eyes, you were ready to kill me. You said if I moved, you were going to shoot me. 
a lot of things went through my mind that day, trying to keep myself alive and not having to take someone's life. I would hate to have some police officer under the same circumstances have it to make a split second decision, worrying about, will I get sued? Will I lose my house? Will I lose my job? Because, because the bad guy didn't see in his eyes. And by the way, I think to this day, he was trying to make up his mind if he had the chance to shoot me. If we are going to put officers in this position of having to make life or death decisions, they have to know that society has our back and is not going to let some ambulance chasing lawyer torment the family for years afterwards. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. I, I've let you go on over the three minutes and I need to be respectful right. of all, all of the folks that want to testify. Greatly appreciate you being here today. Uh, do you plan on submitting a written copy of your testimony? Yes, I, I will, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Taylor? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. I will next uh, call on Shane Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, please begin your, your three-minute testimony as soon as you're... Uh, thank you. I think some of the members are familiar with me. My name is Shane Stevenson. I'm a resident of Saco. Uh, I am a police officer in Maine, here representing many officers throughout the state. In the beginning of last year, I remember people waving to us and being extremely supportive when COVID hit. It was amazing to see everyone thanking us for having the courage to show up every day despite the lockdowns and risks to us and our families. A lot has changed over the course of a year. All of that stopped after tragic events that officers in Maine had nothing to do with. I can tell you that last year was my most challenging year in law enforcement. It has felt like an all out attack against the majority of excellent officers that serve the community daily. I've had urine thrown at me during protests and people flipping me off while crossing the Casco Bay Bridge to notify a family that their loved one committed suicide. I take pride in serving the public despite the hatred I experienced simply for wearing a uniform. This bill will not provide the intended result Representative Angelos is intending. It will be detrimental to the citizens and the good in the law enforcement community. It will make recruiting compassionate, capable, and intelligent officers even more challenging. The experienced officers and leadership that foster some of the nation's best law enforcement practice will vacate as soon as they possibly can. This will leave massive voids in the profession and their historic work will be lost. Look at the main Criminal Justice Academy job postings before deciding on this bill. There are vacancies all over the state. I constantly, in my travels, ask for those calling for change to join me in this career. I ask for them to be the change and serve their communities. I very rarely find anyone willing to be that change, especially in today's climate, which is extremely challenging. Look at the cities paying excessive amounts of money to undo the damage that's been done in other states that have passed this. Law enforcement in Maine is how law enforcement should be in the rest of the country. If you look at all the other locations where qualified immunity was taken away, you'll see that violent crime is up. This is not what Maine citizens deserve. Representative Jared Golden did the work before he voted. He asked the Somali population in Lewiston what they wanted, and they told him a better relationship with police and less crime. I think this is something everyone can agree on. I condense down my testimony. I will submit written testimony uh, to you. And I also want to include a letter from Chief DeLuca from Holton. This reaches all the way in Southern Maine, all the way to way up North. And I'm scared of what lies ahead. I did leave law enforcement and came back and I'm hoping that the Maine legislature does their due diligence and does what they need to do. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Officer Stevenson. And I apologize if I don't have your title correct. The committee appreciates you being here today and looks forward to receiving your written testimony. Are there any questions uh, for our last presenter? Seeing none, again, sir, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to uh, talk with us and share your experience. Thank you. 
Uh, I will now turn to uh, a regular uh, person who appears reg person appears regularly before the committee, and welcome back, uh, Sheriff Morton, for your three minute testimony, sir. Good morning. I apologize for the uh, document in front of me. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Troy Morton, and I am the Sheriff of Penobscot County and President of the Maine Sheriff's Association. Maine Sheriff's unanimously, unanimous position is to oppose LD-214, an act to eliminate qualified immunity for police officers. To approach a decision on whether or not qualified immunity should be eliminated in Maine, it's critical to understand how this protection works for law enforcement officers. I hope to illustrate that in this, this essential tool by sharing a story. An elderly woman hears somebody entering her home at night. She lives alone and acting on her fear, she dials 911 and reports the break-in. The young, the young officer who is on duty receives the message from dispatch and heads towards the address provided. The officer is a husband a father of two children, and their family has just bought their first home. En route to the break-in, the officer does not exceed the speed limit, but unfortunately, he is involved in an automobile accident. At the time of the accident, the elderly fem female calls the police and tells them that her son had stopped in to surprise her, and there was, in fact, no break-in. If qualified immunity were to be abolished, this well-meaning officer could face devastating charges as he was no longer heading to the scene of a crime. This devastation, the devastation of a lawsuit could destroy the officer's financial stability and his family could lose their home. Proponents of qualified immunity limitation wrongly, or wrongly claim that nearly all judgments and settlements would be paid by the government's employers or insurers. In, Colora in Colorado, the only state in the country that has abolished QI, the officer would be personally liable for up to 5% of the judgment. In Maine, where a majority of sheriff's officers are facing staffing shortfalls, the beginning salary, some entry level positions as low as $20, uh, $28,500. Maine ranks 43rd in our country for law enforcement salaries. Eliminating qualified immunity would undoubtedly impact our efforts to recruit and fill vacancies. The national movement to abolish qualified immunity is in response to the events that have unfolded across the United States. Maine sheriffs acknowledge that many of these tragic, horrific events should have been prevented. We detest police brutality and we stand together in our efforts to find reasonable ways to prevent this toxic scenarios from finding their ways into our state. It's important to remember that abolishing qualified immunity would not change the outcomes you've heard about. Qualified immunity does not protect an officer whose actions fall outside their agency's policies. The men and women who wear the badge in the state of Maine commit to serve and protect each and every day of their careers. Those who carry out their duties with integrity and honor are the most devastated when one of our own missteps. It's a reflection on all of us. Those who dishonor the badge can and must be held accountable for their actions. The misconception that eliminating qualified immunity would prevent a victim of law enforcement misconduct to cover from the actions of an offending officer. This is simply not true. Qualified Thank immunity you. only protects- Officer, I mean, uh, Sheriff Morton, I apologize. I'll let you go uh, over the three minutes, but I do need you to wrap it up if you could, sir. I have two sentences, sir, and I appreciate that. Qualified immunity only protects an officer who performs their jobs within the parameters of the policy set for. If an officer violates the law, he is not protected from qualified immunity. I appreciate your consideration and it's my pleasure to answer any questions. And as an Thank officer, you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Representative, I'd only add, I have to add with this part, as an officer for more than 30 years, I can't think of a more important bill that uh, we oppose. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Sheriff Morton. Uh, and I will turn to committee questions. Representative Moriarty. Steve, you're muted. Uh, Representative Moriarty, you're muted. Of course I was, sorry. Uh, Sheriff Morton, what uh, sort of liability insurance coverage does, does your uh, department uh, carry? And are you aware of a, a carrier ever uh, asserting uh, an exclusion 
uh, based upon the particular conduct uh, involved? So I can speak specifically for the county sheriff's offices. They're covered by a county risk pool that provides uh, coverages to all the county sheriff's offices. Uh, as to their statistics on whether, uh, to answer your question, whether they paid out on something that's extended, I, I wouldn't have the answer on that. Well, do you know whether, do you know of any deputy or officer who in fact has ever become personally responsible for a civil judgment? I'm not personally aware of that. And I think that's our point behind uh, if qualified immunity goes away, that that will become a reality. Good, thank you. Thank you, Representative Moriarty. Are there additional questions for Sheriff Morton? Seeing none, thank you for your time again, Sheriff Morton. It's always good to see you. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to testify today. I will now turn to- uh, Representative Poirier has a question. Uh, th thank you, uh, thank Mayor you. Carney. Representative Poirier. Thank you, sorry, I tried to get it in there a little sooner. And thank you, Sheriff Morton, for coming to speak with us today. I just wanted to get your opinion um, on costs if this bill were to go through. Is it your assumption that costs for uh, counties or municipalities insurance-wise that you would see a great increase without qualified immunity in insurance costs? So certainly I think there would be impact on the government's insurance. Uh, but, but to be quite frank, Representative, I look at the wives and husbands that testified today, I worry more about the officer's family and the liability that's being put on them. Who pays for their individual insurance and coverage uh, if that is removed? And so while to answer your question, and representing the county, I probably have to say the right thing. Yes, there'll be an impact to the, the county government, state government, municipalities. But I worry too about that man or woman who serves in that role and their protection. And Mr. Chair, may I ask a follow-up, please? Yes, you may, Representative. Okay. And Sheriff Morton, do you think there is also a chance that without qualified immunity that those officers may even have difficulty actually obtaining those type of policies at all? That's a that's an interesting question, one I haven't thought. Tremendous question. I hope that somebody uh, perhaps uh, during work session could answer from the risk pools or from insurance providers or, or whatnot, uh, but uh, tremendous question. I appreciate you asking. Thank you very much for your insights. Thank you, Representative. And again, thank you, Sheriff Morton, for being with us today. Thank you. I will uh, be a little slower. I am trying to move things along, but if there are other questions from committee members, if you could raise your electronic hand. Seeing none, thank you again, Sheriff. Uh, I will now turn to uh, Thomas Pappas. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee, sir. And please begin your three minute testimony whenever you're comfortable. Thank you, Representative. Good morning to the members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Tom Pappas. I'm the current president of the Maine State Troopers Association, representing 270 troopers. We too are also members of the Maine Law Enforcement Coalition. So today, as I speak before you, I am proud to be one of the voices representing over 3,000 state, county, and local officers in our great state. I am testifying today in opposition of LD 214. I am an active member of the Maine State Police and I've been a certified law enforcement officer since 2006. I grew up in New York City. However, once I became an adult, I chose to plant my roots here because of all the things Maine has to offer. One of the most important attractions to me was safety. Along with several other attributes this great state has to offer, the elimination of qualified immunity would strip that from your constituents. Largely due to the national dialogue that at first trickled into this state, but has now flooded it, I have seen police officers leaving at alarming rates. They have either re resigned after serving between five and 15 years or are retiring when they had no plan to do so. In fact, the most recent example was a fellow officer buying back less than one year of prior service time at an astronomical rate so he could retire nine months early. There are many police officers that are teetering on the edge to seek other employment. Why? Because mentally and physically, they cannot take this job as it stands now, let alone what's potentially on the horizon with the passage of LD 214. 
If LD-214 passes, we are left with officers that do stay or the ones graduating from the academy, but you can't accelerate experience and maturity. How many frivolous suits can those people sustain while following the constitution, the law, all academy endorsed techniques and staying within all department policies and procedures? I know you've heard about recruitment and retention. Maine currently has some of the highest trained individuals in the nation, thanks to our Maine Criminal Justice Academy. Among those ranks, we have members with additional training that respond to the most serious incidents in the state. This is not in their job description. These are extra duties above and beyond their assignments. I have met with a number of those individuals. The message to me was loud and clear. If this passes, they will not put themselves at any extra risks to face again, not the criminal suits, but the civil suits that are frivolous, that are stripping of qualified immunity would open them up to. They would abandon those units to avoid any extra chances of being sued. Lastly, I wanna to touch on proactive policing. This is policing in which there is not a 911 call, but in fact, a police officer in an area doing community policing who sees something out of place and, and investigates it before a crime occurs or during the commission of it. But the police officer's proactive actions mitigates the risk of victimization. Trooper Pappas, I apologize for interrupting, but um, I, I've let you go over the three minutes, so I need you to wrap it up if you could, sir. Sure, I got about a par one paragraph left. The foundation okay. of case law has been built on these types of cases. If you have played sports, you know that the best offense is a strong defense. As it stands now, currently with the national narrative, this group of officers are extremely hesitant to do this type of work without the traditional 911 call where there's a victim screaming for help. The passing of LD-214 would eliminate any type of proactive work as these highly trained officers would want the backing of a victim of a crime on their side in court during these frivolous civil suits that LD-214 would open, up, open us up to. I am proud of the members that I represent and stand shoulder to shoulder with them every day and love the state of Maine and all its attributes. I speak for all of us when I say we are terrified for all our families and friends as to what the state looks like in the past, if the passing of LD-214 happens. Please vote ought not to pass LD-214. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, are there questions for Trooper Pappas? Seeing none, again, the committee thanks you for your time today. Do you plan on submitting written testimony, sir? I will, sir, immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That takes me to the end of those who had registered to testify in opposition. I will go through the room again uh, later, but right now I'm going to turn to people who have testified, who have registered to testify neither for nor against. And I would ask that, um, Supi reads my mind. Um, Ms. Menhart, um, uh, you uh, please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you are ready. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you very much. And I know you guys have a long day already. Um, so I have submitted my, my written testimony and I um, kind of bring a different perspective to this in the sense that I uh, was the deputy director of the Police Community Relations Task Force when Abner Louima, the Haitian immigrant that was beaten and sodomized in New York City, when that task force wrote its recommendations. Then I spent seven years running NAMI Maine, which meant I, I spent over eight hours alone, often the only non-cop with a thousand police officers across the state of Maine. So I do not think that Maine's policing is perfect. I, I don't think our academy is perfect. I also don't think that quali removing qualified immunity is the right step to take right now, first step. You'll see that I outline a whole bunch of things that I think should be examined and considered before that very reactionary move is made because it's true that I was a child welfare worker and I had qualified immunity when I removed a child and whether that was the right decision or not, I couldn't be sued in that moment. And, and that is what it would do if we take it away from law enforcement. I also hold the unique role of being the sibling of a civil rights lawyer and I'm married to an individual who's been a police officer in the state for 28 years. So I, I see inside of both perspectives and there are challenges in our police force in Maine. There um, definitely is an old guard and a progressive guard. Uh, the progressive guys are really trying to transform law enforcement in Maine and the old guard, not so much. So 
I absolutely think we need to look at things like the academy, how prom prom sorry, promotions are decided. We need to look at who does the misconduct reviews and how transparent are those. But we need to look at the systems, not demonize the individuals. You don't promote systemic change when you go after individuals. You, you promote systemic change when you evaluate from a very transparent and inclusive perspective, the different aspects of our system. So I, I would just strongly advocate, and I am um, working on a dissertation on how to increase um, procedural justice and citizenship behaviors among law enforcement, because that's what we all want. The more procedural fairness that, th that they are shown, the more procedural fairness they show the public, the more um, well they're treated by the departments, the better they treat uh, their citizens. And that's not Jenna's opinion, that's a lot of research um, that says that. And so when we think about ways to transform law enforcement, there's a lot of things to look at. And just this reactionary um, get rid of qualified immunity is, is, is not what I would recommend as someone who has had plenty of battles with law enforcement and has stand toe to toe in support with some law enforcement um, across the last 25 years. So my testimony does list a whole bunch of things, but what I will close with is to say, my strong recommendation is that you all think about passing legislation to create a committee to plan to modernize and professionalize law enforcement in Maine, and that you really include innovative thinkers on that group, and that we really look at how do we move the law enforcement forward and not just pass something that will drive folks out of law enforcement. It'll actually drive the folks who have more choices out. In my opinion, that'll be a really negative unintended consequences. Thank, thank you very much uh, for your time and testimony today and for the written testimony that you submitted as well. Are there questions from committee members? Seeing none, again, thank you very much uh, for your time today and thank you for your patience. Uh, yeah. I know this has been a long morning. Thank you all very much for your time. Bye-bye. Uh, I will now uh, call on my final person registered to testify neither for nor against, and that is Rebecca Graham. Uh, welcome uh, to the Judiciary Committee again, Ms. Graham. Uh, begin your three-minute testimony when you're ready to go. Thank you, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Rebecca Graham, and I am here on behalf of MMA and at the behest of our 70-member Legislative Policy Committee. And I'm providing testimony neither for nor against because I've submitted a substantial bank of material that pertains to both of the bills that you'll be listening to today, and we find 416 more workable. Summary judgments or qualified immunity is not always available or granted to police, contrary to what you've heard here today. And I encourage you to review the materials I submitted with my testimony um, for some evidence of that. Those materials um, also include efforts from our neighboring states to address these matters, which include model policies from the committee to understand what systems for behavioral accountability already exist here in Maine, and that there's an opportunity for enhancement and change that's worth exploring there. We can have well-trained, kind-hearted, ethical employees, but they're always going to be human, and the law has involved to understand and address this fact. Qualified immunity is one of those tools that recognizes that these employees in particular are called on to make split-second decisions under extreme stress in rapidly evolving, dangerous scenarios, and those decisions have consequences for everyone. When they've acted with due regard to their training and the policies of the agency they represent, they and their families deserve our protection at the same, to the same degree that those on the receiving end of those decisions deserve justice. And QI doesn't remove other paths of civil recourse for those individuals. Granting employees in these circumstances as a summary judgment is an opportunity for system change because it's at that point that the injured party can and does, can and does, return the onus back onto the agency to determine if the policies that they were adhering to require review or are in line with accepted practice. Removing this option means that the focus is gonna be entirely on the individual and not the system. The committee should consider is, the is it the responsibility of the individual or the system to drive the change. As the Supreme Court recognized in Harlow versus Fitzgerald, there's a cost to our social fabric for opening public officials up to unchecked litigation. Qualified immunity was constructed to strike the balance between the competing values of vindicating constitutional rights and protecting public officials from meritless suits. And municipal police find themselves in these situations daily, and because of this, they're far more likely to attract suits. And it's for those reasons that officials find the proposals that are under LD 214 entirely unworkable as drafted. We share the desire to eradicate bad cops from our ranks. However, legislative reforms have to be proportional, informed, and evidence-based to protect the existing workforce and attract and retain the brightest community-oriented officers. And that requires 
unified bipartisan investment. And you should ask yourselves if you want to pay for litigation or do we want well-paid, well-trained ethical employees? Officials want to work together with our state partners to do better, shit, better with our partnership on reform. And the national conversation arrived here through a system of underfunding a wide set of tools that included defunding community policing programs, health and social programs, and then it asks our law enforcement to be the stopgap for that fallout. And with that, I see my time is almost up. So I will be testifying again on 416, and I'm happy to answer any questions or bring back any material or additional information that you may desire for your work session. Thank you very much, Ms. Graham. We appreciate your time and testimony today. Are there questions from committee members? Representative Moriarty. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Ms. Graham, I'm a, a little puzzled about your several references to summary judgment. How does that play into the your, your view of uh, the impact of this bill? A summary judgment is the process to which qualified immunity is arrived at. So it is the judicial review of the set of circumstances around an incident in which um, a, a qualified immunity case can be brought. And it's at that point where they decide whether or not there are merits to that, whether or not there's well clear established law and whether or not those expectations um, of that activity, given the circumstances, either would be reasonable or objectively um, feasible under existing or, or another trained individual would react in that same way. Where it isn't clear or there are questions about that, qualified immunity isn't granted. And the Druin case that I included in my testimony is an example of where it wasn't included However, the, the officer also prevailed, and, it, and that is the, the piece that I don't think that folks really understand. If I could follow up, uh, if there are intensely disputed factual issues in a case, as there would likely to be, summary judgment is not likely to be granted on, on behalf of either party, correct? Correct. And it frequently is not. Right. So cases go full length to, to trial, and then it is determined whether or not there was a violation or not. Correct. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you for that thank question. You, Rep thank you, Representative Moriarty. Are there additional questions from committee members? Seeing none, thank you very much, Ms. Graham. We appreciate your taking the time and being here today with us. That ends the list of people that I'd had signed up when the hearing began at nine o'clock but I know that some people signed up after that. So I am now going to turn to the attendee room and ask if there are any persons who wish to speak in favor of LD214, if you could raise your electronic hands. And I am seeing two, three. So I will begin by asking, um, Supi is always ahead of me. Uh, I would now recognize Lori Boxer Maker. Um, welcome back to the committee and please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Okay, thank you. I'll get started right away. Um, thank you, Senator Carney and Representative Harnett and members of the Judiciary Committee. Um, I've enjoyed actively listening to everyone's testimony this morning. I've been taking notes and I think that the best use of my time is not to reiterate everything that's in my written testimony. I urge you all to look at that, but I did want to respond to some of the questions that I've heard some of you asking, as well as some of the things that I've heard other people testifying about. So let's start with um, Representative Poirier's questions about insurance. One um, study that I did not include in my um, written testimony is a study that has been going on at the Yukon Center for Insurance Law, and they're looking at um, an act that was uh, enacted in Connecticut on police accountability that's not um, directly a qualified um, immunity exemption or an act to end qualified immunity, but it does hold police officers accountable in a different way for civil rights violations. And the Yukon Center for Insurance Law is looking at whether there would be be, um, ramifications in the way of costs um, in increased insurance premiums for municipalities, which is what Representative Poirier was asking about. And then they, I believe that their preliminary findings suggest that there won't be exponential increases in insurance costs. So I'd um, definitely refer you to that study, uh, preliminary study. Happy to get you all a copy of that as well.
well so that it's readily accessible to you. I've also heard a lot about people's lives um, being lost if we were to, as a state, decide that this was an appropriate course of action to end qualified immunity. And I um, just urge you all to think about the fact that right now, people's lives are already being lost due to the fact that there is um, wide discretion for officers about their acts and wide and, and very narrow accountability for officers. Um, I'm testifying here today as someone who um, highly respects many police officers. And um, some of the people that you heard from today are people that I work alongside regularly and um, I respect. Uh, however, um, I'm a big proponent of the fact that um, we need to do something about this system that's not working um, and we need to start um, applying our laws equally across the board and holding officers accountable the way that we hold other professionals accountable. Which leads me to that um, discussion that we've heard from some others about split second decisions. We as a society have a number of professions where people are required to make split second decisions and they do not have the benefit of qualified immunity. Let's think about um, you know, some of the people that we heard cited today, emer emergency room professionals, surgeons, air traffic controllers, those people have to make split second decisions too, as do I, um, an attorney, a trial attorney in the courtroom. And I'm not exempt. Um, you know, <laughs> we're in a pandemic right now and I'm still held accountable. And so um, should, you know, our law enforcement officers in all different types of settings be held accountable. Um, I recognize that those um, officers are faced with life and death situations and we want them to be able to um, act responsibly and not question their actions, but it's the same thing with respect to surgeons. Um, there's really no difference and there's no qualified immunity there. Uh, Ms. Box for May Cumber, I'm sorry, I need to interrupt you because we I've let you go over the three minutes, but I need you to wrap it up. Okay, okay, all right. Um, I, I just also, because I'm an attorney, I want to speak just very briefly to the fact that there will not be a flood of frivolous lawsuits because attorneys are bound by rules of ethical and professional conduct as well as the main rules of civil procedure. And many of us turn down cases, many cases every week that don't have merit. And it's highly unlikely that people are going to waste their time and resources on cases that are frivolous. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Th I, thank you very much. And I failed uh, to ask you at the beginning, could you please identify uh, where you live and who you represent? Correct. Sorry. Lori Boxer, Matt Cumber. I'm a resident of um, Portland. I work throughout the state and I am testifying today on behalf of the Maine Trial Lawyers Association. I'm the president of the Maine Trial Lawyers Association. Thank you very much. And thank you for your patience uh, today. Are there questions from committee members? Seeing none, thank you very much for your uh, testimony. And thank you for submitting the extensive written testimony that you did as well. Sure. Thank you all for your time and service. Thank you. I will now call on Catherine Martinez. Um, Ms. Martinez, as soon as you're ready, just uh, unmute your microphone, activate your video, and begin your three-minute testimony. And welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Hi, thank you for having me. Unfortunately, I don't have video available today. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Catherine Martinez, and I'm a New York City-based activist, advocate, and founder of the Ending Qualified Immunity Project, which was started last spring to advocate for legislation to end qualified immunity at the federal, state, and local level, so victims of police misconduct have a viable path to justice when their rights are violated. Across the nation, law enforcement have continued to escape accountability from criminal prosecution when they commit constitutional violations against the public. And again, when they're victims of police misconduct, attempt to seek justice in, 19, in Section 1983 actions. Congress passed this law during Reconstruction to empower newly freed Black Americans with a cause of action against official misconduct. The Supreme Court then gutted the Civil Rights Act by inventing the doctrine of qualified immunity and imposing an almost insurmountable burden on Section 1983 plaintiffs whose rights have been violated, unless they can prove with a case almost with the exact facts that their rights were at issue were clearly established at the time of the violation. Qualified immunity shields police officers from accountability, obstructs the pursuit of justice, incentivizes a police culture of lawlessness, undermines the constitutional rights of every person in this country and Maine residents, but particularly marginalized communities of color that are already over-policed and underprivileged. What started out as an intention to avoid frivolous lawsuits has developed into what Justice Sotomayor wrote is an absolute shield that tells police they can shoot first and think later. 
Last year, George Floyd's death shocked the nation and sparked protests, triggering calls for police reforms, including the end of qualified immunity. About 1,000 people are killed each year by law enforcement. Less than 2% of fatal police shootings are criminally prosecuted, and only eight officers have ever been convicted since 2005 of murder. Black and Latinx, Latinx Americans are disproportionately impacted by the lack of police accountability. Black Americans in particular are more than three times more likely than their white counterparts to be murdered by the police. I'd like to also address some comments that were made. Um, New York City actually did not abolish qualified immunity. They limited the doctrine for unreasonable search and seizure only. And of course, we know that law enforcement did not limit themselves to uh, only violating our fourth and 14th amendment rights. Also holding police officers accountable is absolutely not a step to towards eliminating policing, but a commitment to ensure equal justice under the law and for all main residents. Police are not held personally accountable due to indemnification clauses, and so city and taxpayers actually foot the bill for police misconduct. We agree with the ACLU that correction officer, correctional officers should be included, and so we support that amendment. To Danielle Lefferts, police are not held to a higher standard. In fact, they're held to a lower standard. Ignorance of the law is not a defense to liability unless you are a police officer. To Jessica Ramsey, uh, championing black and brown lives is absolutely a movement with merit and to say otherwise is an exercise of incredible privilege. Law enforcement need mental health resources to deal with the stress of their job, not a blanket shield to kill with impunity. And to Jenna, we absolutely need systemic changes like ending qualified immunity at the state, federal and local level to address systemic issues, including racism in policing. Anything less is a disservice to Maine residents and all Americans. Thank you very much for your time, everyone in the committee. And that is my time. Thank, thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Martinez, and thank you for submitting your written testimony as well. Are there questions from committee members for Ms. Martinez? Seeing none, again, thank you for taking the time uh, to be here today, and I will now move on to Lauren Bonds. Ms. Bonds, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Please begin your three-minute testimony as soon as you're ready. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chairs Carney, Harnett, and members of the committee. My name is Lauren Bonds. I'm the legal director of the National Police Accountability Project. Thank you so much for allowing NPAP the opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, NPAP is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to holding police officers and correction officers accountable to constitutional and professional standards. We strongly support the passage of LD 214, a bill that will eliminate qualified immunity and provide victims of civil rights abuses with the opportunity to sue police in state courts. The doctrine of qualified immunity has created a nearly insurmountable barrier for communities to hold police officers civilly liable in federal and state courts when they, are, when they encounter civil rights violations. We've heard a lot today about qualified immunity doesn't protect people who act outside of the law. That is blatantly false. It categorically only protects people who act outside the, outside the law. So qualified immunity is a two-step process. First, the court considers whether a constitutional violation occurred. Then it considers whether the constitutional violation was in contravention to clearly established law. We only get into qualified immunity if the court recognizes that a constitutional violation has indeed occurred. So the clearly established law requirement has developed to essentially require a plaintiff to be able to identify a factually analogous case uh, within the jurisdiction where the person is suing. You can think of a number of really problematic outcomes this would have, and I could tell you about all of them, but I'll talk to you just about one case. In the case of Corbett B. Vickers, a deputy sheriff accidentally shot a 10-year-old child who was lying on the ground after he repeatedly was trying to shoot a, uh, a family pet that was on the scene that was posing no risk to anybody at the site. Even though the court found that the deputy sheriff indeed violated the child's constitutional rights, it found that he was entitled to qualified immunity because no other police officer had been sued in that jurisdiction for accidentally shooting a child while trying to shoot a, a dog. Um, there are dozens of other equally ludicrous and unjust outcomes that have resulted from the doctrine of qualified immunity. But I won't go into all of those. I will, uh, I will add them to my uh, written testimony, which I intend to submit after, um, after this hearing. One of the core policy functions of permitting people to sue for their civil rights violations is to deter future violations. Um, if government officials know that they can be held accountable, they're more likely to act in a more judicious and careful manner when they're carrying out their duties. 
by enhancing opportunities to hold police officers accountable for misconduct, um, LD214 will deter future constitutional violations and will make Maine communities safer. We urge you to pass uh, LD214 and remove, remove immunities that undermine police accountability. I'm happy to, happy to answer any questions and we'll um, send you along some more extensive uh, written testimony because I know we're short on time. Thank you very much, Ms. Bonds. You uh, wrapped up one second ahead of the three minutes. Well done. Uh, uh, are there questions from committee members for Ms. Bonds? Seeing none, uh, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to testify today. We look forward to receiving your written testimony and thank you for your patience in what's been a long morning. Uh, I will check the attendee room one more time to ask if there are any persons who wish to testify in support of LD214. So please raise your electronic hand. Seeing none, I will ask if there are any persons in the attendee room who wish to speak in opposition to LD214 to please raise your electronic hand. Seeing none, I will ask if there are any persons in the attendee room. I'm sorry, Representative Libby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe that there is at least one person waiting who had contacted me, a Corey Reynolds who wishes to speak in opposition of. If Mr. Reynolds uh, is in the attendee, all right. Uh, if the committee clerk, thank you, Representative Libby. I did not see an electronic hand come up. If uh, could committee clerk, uh, Ms. Panette, please move Mr. Reynolds into uh, the panelist room. Uh, Mr. Reynolds, uh, good afternoon. As soon as you are ready, please feel free to present your three minute testimony. Good afternoon, Senator Carney, Representative Poirier, uh, and all the other members of the Judiciary Committee. Um, our law enforcement is there to protect us when bad things happen like crime. We need to support our law enforcement Yes, there is some bad cops, but there's also some bad governors. So we just need to support them. The police officers are there to protect us. They need to do better at training and nobody deserves to die, an officer or any subject of the community. If you take away our law enforcement and you need assistance, someone is breaking into your home or whatever is going on, you need them to help you. Or if someone that don't agree with your liberal agenda goes wrong, you always need police there to protect you. So I am not in support of this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, could you please uh, state your uh, residence and if you are representing anyone here today? Waterville. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Are there questions for Mr. Reynolds from any committee members? Again, thank you for taking the time uh, to testify today and for sticking it out through this rather lengthy hearing. We appreciate your time. I will check one more time in the attendee room. Is anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to LD214? Seeing none, I will ask for uh, the final time if there's anyone who wishes to speak neither for nor against LD214. Seeing none, having received testimony from those present, oops. Uh, Tracy Gregoire, if uh, she could be moved over. Uh, Ms. Gregoire, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. If you could state your name, residence, and the capacity in whether you're speaking in favor, in opposition, or neither for nor against LD214? Sure, my name is Tracy Gregoire. I live in Topsum and I'm speaking as a citizen and a mom. Okay, in, in okay. You, in, can you activate your video or is that not possible? Oh, maybe if I switch screens, it goes away. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, 
So yeah, I'm speaking now just because I, um, you know, I have a son at home <laughs> um, due to COVID cases. Um, so I, I, I'm a mom of a 12 year old who is black. Um, he identifies as having brown skin. He's adopted. Um, he also has autism and ADHD and anxiety. And, you know, I think, you know, as a mom, we tell our kids they need to have consequences for their actions, right? They're, you know, if they do something, there's a consequence. Um, we support law enforcement. Um, you know, most of them are, are great people and do a good job, but there needs to be consequences for the ones that are taking lives or harming people and not following the rules. And I don't have all the answers, you know, whether it's um, limited immunity or something else. I think we just need to step up as, as a state and figure this out. And I'm happy to, you know, be a part of those conversations. I can tell you it's really hard as a mom to have a 12 year old who is afraid of the police and literally over the past few months gets worse and worse and actually starts to bolt, um, even though he's very verbal and, and intellectually does very well academically. He just cannot deal with the news, even if we're not watching it, the news coming from his friends about more black people being shot or people of color being shot or harmed. And some of them are kids. Um, I will say that, you know, I think there's less of this in Maine, but there's still racism. I grew up in Lewiston. I was a part of the anti-racism rally when the KKK came to Lewiston. I was in meetings with police who denied that there was racism in the city. I think we need to acknowledge the problems with the system and work on it together. And like I said, I don't have the answers. I just think we need to figure it, figure it out together. And I appreciate the, the committee listening to all of these bills. I know it's uh, going to be an even longer day for you than for me, but um, thank you for the time. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Gregoire. Uh, do you plan to submit written testimony? Um, yeah, I'm happy to do that. I wasn't sure if I could do that later today or tomorrow, or if there was a time limit on that. There, there's, there's not a time limit. The sooner you get it in, the sooner it will be before the committee members, though. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from committee members for Ms. Gregoire? Seeing none, oh, Representative Thorne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, less of a question, but more of advice. Thank you, Ms. Gregoire, for for showing up and providing your testimony. And I feel compelled to offer you some advice and I know you can't shield your son from his friends and so forth, but I would definitely shield him from the news because as a result of local news showing national news about a lot of these incidents, it does fan the flames of those that are, are trying to put our trust in our police force. So that would be my only advice for you, if you could. Right, certainly. And, and like, as you know, like middle schoolers are all on the news and listening to it. And the reality is he's not always probably going to live in Maine. And there's racism here, too. And I can't, as, as a mom of a child of color, like deny that, right? Like, so we have had to have those, you know, tough discussions with them but also have reached out to local police um, who are very supportive and we're really thankful for that. Um, That's great. Thank you. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. Um, are there additional questions? Seeing none, thank you very much uh, for taking the time today to share your personal experiences with the Judiciary Committee. It's greatly appreciated. Um, this, uh, I hope, is the last time I ask this question, but are there any members in the attendee room who wish to be heard in any capacity on LD214? If so, please raise your electronic hand. And seeing none, um, I now, having received testimony from those present today wishing to testify, I, now will, I will now close the public hearing on LD214. I thank the committee members. I thank all of those who participated in uh, our three hearings this morning. Given the time, we do have one more public hearing to go, uh, but in uh, fairness to particularly our staff uh, on, these, um, on the, these hearings, I am going to recess the hearing.
until 1.15. Uh, I would ask people to be back as please as close as possible to that time so that we conclude our final public hearing on LD 1416 and then move into our work sessions. I would advise uh, all members to mute their microphones and shut off their videos and we will uh, get together at 1.15.
Hey, Jeff. I just e emailed you if you could um, take a look at it. Okay, Tom, I will. Thanks. Hello. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Tom. Do you do we have a plan for this afternoon? We're just gonna keep. I like his sense of humor there. Work work in progress there. Okay. We're gonna stay with the schedule we have. It's not <coughs> sustainable. Um, I don't know what to say. Okay. I, you know, I, I think that you have a great committee that can try to figure that out, see how long the hearing takes and then start moving into the bills. Yep, that's the plan. Um, right. And I think the first bills you're going to take up are the ones that you didn't get to on Tuesday, right? That is correct. All right. Um, I got your email and... Um... You might, can you call me? I don't think you want to, I think well, we're on Zoom. This is innocuous. Um... I would prefer to see if we can develop an amendment at work session and failing that um, would look at your suggestion, but I don't want to, um, it seemed like there was overwhelming support for it amongst the prosecutors and stuff, so. And, and, and there is on, on the committee, it's a question of um, where it goes. Um, so we're floundering in the work session and I'd be open to the suggestion, but I want to give it a try. Okay. Um, and I am open to the, uh, AG's office part of it, but um, only if um, there's a firewall of an Inspector General. And they know talking. how to do that. They know how to do that. All right, committee members, as uh, you return, if you could please activate your cameras so I can know who is here. Uh, make sure we can start up. We did say we would start at 115, and I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, uh, we, we, we're good to go. Uh, and I know that people may be joining us late, but we have too much work to do. So we need to start. Um, <coughs> Excuse uh, me. Oh, with that. Uh, Tom, Tom yes, before Carney. we get started, I'm wondering if either Peggy or Soupy could post in the chat the order of the work sessions this afternoon. I was starting to do it, but realizing that it was my turn to introduce my bill. Sure. Peggy is saying something. I will take care of that. I will take care of that. Thank, Thank you. you. That, that helps all the folks who are, are waiting. Thank you very much, Peggy. I, I'm just going to post LD numbers. I hope that's enough. Yes. OK, great. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, committee members and members of the public in attendance. Welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. We will now hear our last public hearing of the day before moving into work session on a variety of bills and the order of the work sessions will be posted in the chat by our analyst. Um, and I will now open the public hearing on LD 1416, an act to limit qualified immunity of law enforcement officers in Maine Civil Rights Act claims. And the bill will be presented by my co-chair and our colleague, uh, Senator Carney. Senator Carney, welcome. And Thank you. Public hearing. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, Chair Harnett and esteemed colleagues on the Judiciary Committee. As you know, I'm Ann Carney representing Senate District 29, South Portland, Cape Elizabeth and some of Scarborough. It's an honor to be before you today to introduce LD 1416, an act to limit qualified immunity of law enforcement officers in Maine Civil Rights Act claims. The Maine Civil Rights Act prohibits intentional interference or an attempt to intentionally interfere with rights under the US and Maine constitutions and under federal and state laws by using force or the threat of force to harm people or property. And if you look at my testimony committee members, you'll see a hyperlink 
to the Maine Human Rights, uh, excuse me, the Maine Civil Rights Act. So under the Maine Civil Rights Act, the Attorney General could bring an action on behalf of an injured party to get injunctive relief and civil penalties. An injured party could also bring um, his or her own civil action for damages. Maine Civil Rights Act claims can be brought against private parties or against government actors. So it's a little different than the federal civil rights law. LD 1416 actually only applies to claims against government actors and a particular type of government actor that is law enforcement officers. The act itself, <clears throat> excuse me, the act itself does not mention qualified immunity. That comes into the picture through the federal case law that established immunity for a government official unless the rights they violated were clearly established at the time of the violation. You heard much testimony this morning that qualified immunity is too broad and that law enforcement officials should be held accountable in situations where they have instead been granted immunity from liability for a violation of rights. And you also heard a lot of testimony from members of the law enforcement community about the importance of qualified immunity within, um, with, yeah, the importance of qualified immunity. LD 1416 would deny qualified immunity in those egregious situations if four factors are met. First, the officer's conduct in fact violated constitutional or statutory rights. Second, the law enforcement officer used or threatened to use physical force or violence in the violation of rights. Third, the officer was required to receive training under Maine law. And fourth, that the agency employing the officer was also required by Maine law to have policies concerning the use of physical force. Uh, an officer who has received training and works for a department that has use of force policies yet still violates constitutional rights would under this proposal not be able to argue that those rights were not clearly established. This bill strives to focus on the most egregious situations and to deny qualified immunity when all the factors point to the right being clearly established, the officer having received training on the use of force and the officer's department having policies prohibiting unlawful use of force. The bill limits liability in these cases to $10,000 per violation. And here I wanna go off, off the script of my prepared testimony um, because I think what we, we saw this morning was that this is an extraordinarily difficult issue. Understanding qualified immunity just from a legal perspective is really challenging. And then understanding how it applies in real life to the, the hard work that law enforcement officers do day in and day out is also complex. And I think actually the most challenging thing is figuring out how we can rework qualified immunity so that it provides the protection that law enforcement officers need and yet doesn't allow those egregious situations that um, you know, horrify all of us when we see them unfolding. I don't think honestly that 1416 achieves that balance. Um, I learned a lot from the testimony today, both by the proponents and opponents speaking with regard to Representative Evangelist's bill. And I thought that it was actually an incredibly powerful hearing and has given me a lot to think about. I, I do feel that um, it's really important for us as a state and as the community of Maine to work together to figure out how we can um, improve the qualified immunity standard and um, have a really serious conversation about when um, law enforcement officers should or shouldn't be liable and how we can kind of elevate the quality and also still provide protection to those who do put their lives on the line when they um, work as law enforcement officers. And so with that, I'll thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Senator Carney, for bringing this bill forward and presenting it to your committee. Um, and I will now open it up to questions from committee members, beginning with Representative Gallagher Reckett. <clears throat> Senator Carney, um, I, like you, was listening to the uh, the testimony all morning, and I 
wondered if uh, the person who mentioned that they, I don't even remember whether it was a pro or con, who mentioned that they thought that corrections officers should be included as well as law enforcement officers uh, in um, whatever the procedures ended up being. Have you thought about whether or not corrections officers would be a reasonable addition to your bill? I haven't thought about it. I do think that it's something that should be really carefully vetted. I can see that um, that that might very much be appropriate. Um, but I didn't I didn't give it any forethought. And as, as I said, I think that this proposal um, needs more work and needs more thoughtful consideration. And that would be part of that process. Thanks. Thank you. Are there additional questions for the bill sponsor, Senator Carney, for members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much uh, for presenting uh, LD1416. And I will now um, move to those persons who have registered to testify in support of LD1416. And I will point out that I do have quite a few people on the list, but I think some people may have decided, it may have touched on both bills in their original testimony. So I'm not certain we will hear from all that I have, but I will begin um, and we will still use the three minute clock, which I will run. Um, and I will begin by recognizing uh, Mr. Cabetta from um, the uh, ACLU of Maine. Welcome back to the Judi Judiciary Committee, sir. And you can begin your three minute testimony whenever you're ready. Thank you, uh, Representative Harnett, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, good morning. And thank you to Senator Carney for sponsoring this important piece of legislation on Michael Capetta Policy Council for the ACLU of Maine. And on behalf of our members, we urge you uh, to vote that this bill ought to pass as amended. The abolishment of qualified immunity would restore faith in law enforcement by reaffirming the central principle that no one is above the law. Uh, the notion that where there is a right, there is a remedy was directly translated from the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 into the Constitution of Maine when Maine became a state in uh, 1820. As a result, Article 1, Section 19 of the Maine Declaration of Rights explicitly guarantees that every person shall have the right to redress when their rights have been violated. Qualified immunity works to undermine this right. In the words of United States Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor and the late Justice Ginsburg, the Supreme Court's quote, one-sided approach to qualified immunity transforms the doctrine into an absolute shield for law enforcement officers, gutting the deterrent effects of the Fourth Amendment. The court's decision sends an alarming signal to law enforcement officers and the public. It tells officers that they can shoot first and think later. And it tells the public that palpably unreasonable conduct will go unpunished, end quote. That was from the 2018 case of Kissela versus Hughes. Qualified immunity has repeatedly served to shield extremely harmful and unconstitutional behavior. Abolishing it is absolutely the right thing. Abolishing it in Colorado and New Mexico has not led to a rash of frivolous lawsuits there. With or without qualified immunity, uh, frivolous, lit frivolous litigation is illegal and unethical. It is in the inherent and statutory power of courts to sanction people who bring frivolous lawsuits. Nor has the abolition of qualified immunity led to an exodus of officers from the law enforcement profession in those states. If anything, it'll lead to an exodus of the bad apples we hear so much about. This bill would cap the personal liability of police officers who are found guilty of violating civilians' constitutional rights at $10,000. We believe that such a restriction is unnecessary and could create unjust outcomes. Consider, for example, the recent widely publicized trial of Derek Chauvin, the officer who killed George Floyd in Minnesota. Although he's been found guilty, Chauvin could still receive a pension of more than a million dollars. Uh, although pension forfeiture is extremely rare, capping liability at so low a number could deny justice to aggrieved families. Uh, and in any event, in almost every case, indemnification clauses in the contracts that unions negotiate for their police officers uh, require the state to foot the bill and not uh, police officers personally. Uh, we recommend that the committee amend the bill to remove the section limiting liability uh, uh, and with that amendment, we urge you to vote uh, to pass as amended. Uh, and I thank you for your time and attention, and I'm happy to try to answer questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cabetta. Um, appreciate your testimony, and I believe you submitted it in writing as well. Uh, thank you for that. 
Uh, are there questions from committee members for Mr. Cabetta? Seeing none, again, thank you for your time. Uh, I, I see you were optimistic when you drafted your testimony starting with good morning. Um, I've, made that, I've made that mistake regularly on this committee, um, but we appreciate your being here and always welcome your input, so thank you. Um, I do have a few more people signed up as testifying in support, but I do not see them in the attendee room. So I would ask if they are there, if they could raise their electronic hand. Is there, I do see, uh, okay. Um, it's not on my list, but uh, if we could move Lori Boxer McCumber over to the panelists. That would be great. Uh, and Ms. Boxer McCumber, uh, proceed. Uh, welcome back to the committee, and you may proceed with your three minute testimony as soon as you're ready to go. Okay, I'm ready to go. Thank you, Representative Harnett and Senator Carney and members of the Judiciary Committee once again. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to have a couple more minutes to extend some of the testimony previously offered. Um, many of the points that I was just about to raise were raised by the ACLU. Um, I'm here testifying today as a resident of Portland and also as a um, as the president of the Maine Trial Lawyers Association. And um, we're testifying in favor of this legislation um, if it could be amended to remove the cap. Um, we do not see a reason for having a cap um, in this legislation, particularly <laughs> where victims shouldn't be forced to suffer the cost of um, the trauma that they suffer if there is an abuse of power by a law enforcement officer or anyone else. And so it seems um, illogical to um, put that type of a cap on this legislation. And I would love to hear more about why that was done. Um, as we've heard from others, and as I re reiterated before, in many of these cases, um, insurance contracts or employment contact tracks or union contracts are gonna protect the individuals if they're acting in the scope and course of their employment. And often insurance companies will defend these individuals or pay settlements um, if the person is um, involved in litigation. And so some of the concerns that we heard um, the spouses of law enforcement officers expressing to this committee about going bankrupt or being personally exposed um, simply don't exist um, or are very minimal. And I think the academic studies that um, have been done on that um, support the fact that these families actually are not bearing the costs um, of litigation, whereas victims are um, regularly bearing the costs of bad acts against them. So it just seems um, like it's not a balanced um, piece of legislation when it has a cap. So we would like to see that removed. Um, I do think it's interesting. Um, there's been mention of a couple of other states that have adopted um, an elimination of qualified immunity. There aren't a ton that have done this. I know there are a number of states that are in the process of trying to eliminate qualified immunity, but we did hear earlier that there were problems in other states. And I would urge this committee to make sure that they actually do the research on that because I don't believe we have enough data um, that's being in place from other states um, to actually make those statements. So it would be helpful if we all had um, solid data before such statements were relied on by the committee. Um, and um, the last point that I wanted to make was um, perhaps this committee may, may want to consider doing what others um, have suggested and actually broadening um, who it applies to. Because in New Mexico, for example, um, the legislation actually applies to all government actors. And um, so that is something that um, perhaps this committee also wants to consider. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Boxer McCumber. Uh, am I correct that the, the testimony you submitted earlier on LD214 also included a discussion of um, LD1416, is that right? That is correct, and I believe I submitted it under both bills, so everyone should have received it for both LD1416 and for 214. It, it may be the system's not updating as quickly as we might like. With We're using lots of technology these days. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. I will now open it up to questions from committee members, uh, beginning with Representative Moriarty. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Attorney Boxer Maycumber, I wonder, uh, in your experience, how frequently do liability insurers either decline to defend or decline to indemnify based upon a uh, policy exclusion? Well, my experience is that often defense uh, liability insurers are defending, um, and that's been the default. That's my experience, but I admittedly do not do a lot of these types of cases. Most of my practice is um, with people who have been injured as the result of uh, bicycle or pedestrian crashes. I see. Okay, thank you. Are there, <clears throat> excuse me, additional questions from committee members for Ms. Boxer-Maycumber? Seeing none, I do have uh, uh, just a few. You. Sure. <clears throat> said you were troubled by the $10,000 cap. Did you, and I may have missed this, did you have another number in mind or did you think that you should, it should not have a limit at all? Yeah, uh, um, you know, in other situations, there are not, there are no caps for this type of egregious behavior. And so the, the question here is why place a cap on someone? In, in fact, what, especially in a situation where someone has received all of the training um, and has had access to policies and if they still are um, violating civil and, and constitutional rights, why should we actually limit it for that person? And I understand that the limit pertains to their personal liability, but um, if they are acting in that scope and course as well, or um, apart from their, their government position, um, there's no reason that they should be treated differently than anyone else in, in our view. Thank you. And my other question, and I don't have your testimony in front of me and I apologize, but I believe sure. in it, you talked about the fact that we don't even consider qualified immunity until after it has been established that a constitutional right has been violated. Is that your understanding as well? Correct. Yes. I think someone else mentioned that, but I would um, affirm that statement. Okay. Um, thank, thank you very much. Uh, are there other questions from committee members? Seeing none, again, we thank you for your time and testimony uh, this morning and this afternoon. Um, and I thank you for yours. Thank you. And I believe we have another person who's indicated an interest in testifying in support of LD 1416. And I would recognize, uh, welcome back, uh, Catherine Martinez, uh, to the afternoon session of the Judiciary Committee. And whenever you are set, uh, you can begin your three minute testimony. Hello again. Um, so I didn't have plans to actually testify on behalf of this bill, but I just heard something that I'd like to correct on the record. Um, the way qualified immunity works under the Supreme Court precedent is uh, two steps. One, you need to answer if it's a constitutional violation. Second step is whether the law is clearly established at the time. Each circuit has its own rules based on how they conduct their business in their circuit. Um, the Supreme Court has actually decided that you no longer have to answer the first question of whether there is a constitutional violation. You can skip that step and can go straight to determine whether there was a const there was a clearly established law or not. So in fact, so so we're what we're having is we're stalling civil rights uh, precedents and the clear the establishment of clearly established law. And it's a cycle of um, it's, a, it's a cycle where if, if you don't, they're not clearly establishing the law because they don't have to answer whether there was a constitutional violation. So therefore, the violations don't get est clearly established. So it, it, it's not the case that first they have to go into whether there was a constitutional violation. The circuit courts are actually free to skip that step and go right ahead into determining whether the law was clearly established at the time, which is part of the issue and why we need to um, create a state remedy across all state legislatures to provide victims of police brutality with a viable path to justice. And that's what we can do here with either of these two bills, amending it so that it does include correctional officers. Uh, and so that's the end of my testimony. I just want to establish that. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Martinez. Uh, there are at least one member of the committee that would like to ask you a question. Uh, Representative Thorne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, since having this morning uh, had two messages left for me, uh, one from Missouri and one from California about what Representative Reckitt asked about 
including corrections officers. I was curious, uh, Ms. Martinez, if you practice law in Maine? I do not practice law in Maine. I'm a law school uh, almost graduate and I intend to practice civil rights litigation, but I'm the founder of the Ending Qualified Immunity Project. I have taken civil rights litigation and I am well-versed on the uh, clearly established rule and qualified immunity doctrine in general. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Thorne. Are there additional questions for Ms. Martinez? Thank you very much. Thank you for being here today and, and best of luck with the rest of your um, legal education. Thank you very much everyone for allowing me to speak. Uh, and I will check one more time, are there any persons in the attendee room who wish to speak in support of LD 1416? Seeing none, I will now turn to those who have registered to testify in opposition. And my first, uh, First person I will call it is uh, welcome back, Major Scott, um, and please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're ready to go. Thank you, sir. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Major Brian Scott. I'm here today to testify on behalf of the Maine State Police and the Department of Public Safety in opposition to LD 1416. Maine law enforcement officers are amongst the best trained officers in America and work tirelessly around the clock 365 days a year, placing ourselves at great risk of injury or death to protect others in the performance of our duties. On average, 174 police officers are killed in the line of duty and another 56,504 are assaulted annually. We put on our uniforms and go to work each day, hoping to make a difference in the communities that we live in. We pray to make it through an entire career without having to take a life or lose our own. However, we do know that in order to uphold the law, we at times must use force to defend others or ourselves or to effect an arrest. Officers are not robots. We are human beings. We have weaknesses. We feel pain, fear, vulnerability, and we will make mistakes in determining exactly what course of action to take when we are thrust into perilous situations. We will bleed when we are cut. We will bruise when we are kicked or punched and we will suffer from PTSD after seeing things no person should ever have to see. As humans, we will not be perfect and should not be expected to operate flawlessly in an incredibly stressful and dangerous situations. Even with the best training, no person can be expected to never make a mistake. However, the vast majority of the time, officers' actions are without doubt conducted with great uh, professionalism and are error-free. There are thousands of times every day where interactions between the public and officers are conducted without any issues whatsoever. This bill would remove the protection of qualified immunity for police officers only, but not all of the other governmental entities that are also currently protected by qualified immunity. This one, the ones that are most likely to need this protection are the only ones targeted by this bill. This seems quite unfair, especially when the bill removes the defense. The defendant did not violate a clearly established statutory or constitutional right of which a reasonable person would have known. In other words, if a police officer unknowingly violates a statute or a constitutional right that is not clearly established, we can be sued for up to $10,000. As an example, several years ago, police officers in Maine were required by law to collect blood from every driver involved in a fatal crash in Maine with or without probable cause to determine their blood alcohol concentration. Recently, the Maine law court decided that law enforcement must have probable cause to require the driver to submit to the blood draw. Maine law enforcement immediately ceased the practice to ensure that we were not violating anyone's constitutional rights. If this bill would have passed, officers could be sued for up to $10,000 for every time they required a driver involved in a fatal crash to sit to a blood draw if the driver did not consent uh, without probable cause prior to that ruling. This proposed limitation of qualified immunity is yet the latest attack on what is an honorable profession. The warranted protections provided by qualified immunity shouldn't be limited for all of our professional Maine law enforcement officers because of the actions of a relatively small number of terrible national examples. This is going to result in fewer officers on the job and those who stay too fearful to do their jobs. Maine will not be safer with fewer officers. As I stated earlier, officers are human beings and therefore will never be perfect. But if we work hard to do the job to the best of our ability, operate under our training, education, and experience, along with departmental policies, we should be protected under the law for those very rare times when we make an honest mistake and do not perfectly execute our duties. For these reasons, I urge you to vote ought not to pass on LD 1416. Thank you for your time. Be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you very much, Major Scott. I will now turn to committee members for questions, beginning with Representative Thorne. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome back again, Major Scott. Uh, thank you for your service and what you do for our state. Um, I'm not sure if it was you that may have mentioned it earlier on uh, 214, uh, which <laughs> ironically 214 is the DD form for discharge from the military. Um, but how many times has qualified immunity been exercised, I guess? Are you aware of that on a police officer? Uh, good afternoon, Representative Thorne. Thank you for the, the, the question. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't collect those types of statistics at the Maine State Police, so I, I wouldn't know how many times officers have been sued and then later ended up with qualified immunity after summary judgment. I, I, I have no idea on that, sir. Okay. And a follow-up statement, if I may, Mr. Chair? A question or a statement? Statement. Br briefly. Most of my questions are brief, Mr. Chair. Thank you I'm, for I'm just reiterating. Reminding, I'm just reminding the committee members this is a public hearing. It's not It's not a time for committee members to make statements, but go ahead, sir. In respect to your position, I won't make my statement. Thank you, and we'll move on. Thank you, Major Scott. Very welcome, sir. Thank you for the question. Um, are there additional questions from committee members for Major Scott? Seeing none, thank you again for your testimony. Thank you for being here both this morning and the afternoon, and thank you for the service, your service to the people. Welcome, of the state. Thank you all. Um, I will now turn to uh, Jared Mills. Welcome back, Chief Mills. Um, I will start the clock when you begin your testimony after you've unmuted yourself and activated your video. Thank you, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Jared Mills, and I'm providing testimony uh, in, uh, in opposition to LD 1416 on behalf of the Maine Chiefs of Police Association. In our testimony on LD 214, we explain why it is our position that the concept of qualified immunity should not simply be abandoned. This bill does not do that. We respect and appreciate Senator Carney's and Representative Morales' introduction of a measured approach to this complex matter. It is the Maine Chiefs of Police position that it is premature to establish in Maine law an alternative to the court-established concept of qualified immunity without a closer examination of that concept and possible alternatives. With respect to the particulars of LD 1416, it is not entirely clear to us the effect of the first criterion contained in the proposal 4686, subsection 1, subsection A on lines 8 and 9 of the bill. As an example, if the law enforcement officer puts a subject on notice that they will be handcuffed and taken into custody, if they do not cease and assist their offend, offending activity, would that constitute a threat of violence that would cost the officer the benefit of the doubt in a court's decision whether to grant qualified immunity? Given that some degree of physical force may be employed in taking someone into custody, this is a reasonable question. It is because of this quite it is because of these questions like this that we believe LD 1416 should not be given the committee's support at this time. Instead, we request that this bill be carried over to the second regular session, that in the meantime, some sort of study group be established to examine the implications of abandoning or modifying qualified immunity and to come back to this committee with recommendations for further action. The Maine Chiefs of Police Association would welcome the opportunity to participate in such a study. Thank you for uh, having me and I'll entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Chief Mills. Uh, the committee appreciates you spending so much time with us today. Are there, <coughs> excuse me, questions from committee members for Chief Mills? Representative Porter. Thank you, Chair Harnett. Um, Chief Mills, thank you very much for joining us again. Um, my question basically is, um, we've previously had bills come through our committee that discuss um, having studies done to um, combat you know, possible racism within um, police force um, and biases, basically. And do you think seeing the results of those sorts of studies first before going forward with any bills like this would be useful before implementing a bill such as this one before us. Thank you for the question, Representative Poirier. Yes, I, I, I do concur with that. I, I think um, 
I think we all agree, and you've heard testimony today, that we all agree that uh, we need to uh, affect positive change and move in the, uh, the direction of the systemic issues that we're having and correcting those. But to do so with just eliminating uh, certain things that we've had for years um, without a close analysis and looking at how we can improve um, certainly is, is uh, I think, remiss at this point. You know, in, in our, my tenure as a police chief, I've been, been doing this for 23 years. Um, when we deal with issues, uh, when we deal with discipline, when we deal with correction or anything, a policy change, uh, we don't just rush to judgment on something. We look at all angles of something on how we can improve mm -hmm. regularly, um, you, you know, and that type of thing. So I, I would concur with that, that uh, I would like to look at um, the overall, uh, because even as a police chief, you know, qualified immunity is a very difficult thing. Uh, subject to wrap your head around, uh, you know, even, even the, your legal professionals uh, who do, the, do this um, on a daily basis. So I think we all need to take a step, look at uh, the entire uh, qualified immunity and how we can move forward to improve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Poirier, and thank you for your response, Chief Mills. Are there additional questions for Chief Mills? Seeing none, thank you very much for your time again this morning and this afternoon. Committee greatly appreciates your input and your willingness to work on these issues uh, moving forward. I will now return to the list of persons that I have signed up to testify and that are in the attendee room. And the next person that I have is Sheriff Troy Morton. Welcome back, sir. And please begin your testimony as soon as you're ready. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate it. Good to see you and I appreciate all the hard work your entire committee is doing today. My name is Troy Morton. I am the Sheriff of Penobscot County and President of the Maine Sheriff's Association. Maine Sheriff's unanimously, unanimous position is to oppose LD 1416, an act to eliminate qualified immunity for law enforcement officers in Maine. LD 1416 is personal. This bill targets law enforcement officers only. Many of you, as well as lawmakers and other committees, and other committees are friends with your police officers and sheriffs you represent. Not a day goes by that sheriffs aren't contacted for our positions on a bill while legislature is in session. We work closely with the Maine Chiefs of Police, Maine Department of Public Safety, Maine State Police, and, and other invested law enforcement partners. To take a moment and think of take a moment and think of the chief police, chief of police in your community. Think of the officers who conduct checks on the elderly during the winter. Think of the sheriffs who come to each of you to find solutions for some of Maine's toughest issues. Who is the first in the line to demand better health, mental health resources? Law enforcement collective voice has been working tirelessly to address Maine's opiate crisis. Those faces, the officers and sheriffs you have relationships with, those are the people being most impacted by this legislation your respected friends and your colleagues. Many of you have been motivated by the events unfolding across the country. When you read the language of LD 1416, many of you are taken back to June of 2020 and the despicable actions of a former police officer, Derek Chauvin. As lawmakers, you feel compelled to use your position to ensure that there are no more George Floyds or Breonna Taylors. We stand with you in that endeavor. Police misconduct has no place in Maine. LD 1416 is not the answer you seek this session. We've made some important decisions on law enforcement accountability. We need to invest in those discussions and find solutions that meet the ongoing and real issues in Maine. LD 1416 targets the very allies that many of you call friends. Please recognize the wake of devastating devastation this bill will leave and vote ought not to pass. I appreciate your time again, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Representative Harnett, I do have an answer to Representative Poirier's question. I'm not sure if it was appropriate to answer now, although the bills are similar. Uh, but no, that, that's fine, sir. You, you can answer that now. You mean the question from this morning regarding insurance? Yes. And so uh, quickly, we'll, we'll have much more uh, in detail for the work session, uh, but I, one of my detectives monitoring uh, this morning quickly made two local phone calls to insurance carriers right here in the Bangor area and was told in both cases that there was no such insurance available to provide to cover that officer. 
independent insurance for the officer or their family. And so um, we look forward to trying to bring some of that to work session and hopefully I answered your question. Thank you very much, um, Sheriff Morton and Representative Porter, since it was your question, was that helpful? Very much, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, uh, committee members with questions, Representative Evangelos. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and hello, Sheriff Morton. Uh, Sheriff Morton, um, I don't want anyone to be misled. Um, police departments do carry uh, professional liability for their offices, do they not? Right, the risk pool provides as, the, as a government agency, and it's, that's kind of our concern, if qualified immunity is to go away and the burden put back on the officer individually, there wouldn't be insurance for the officer or their family. Well, you know, qualified immunity, uh, whether it's there or not, the insurance policy doesn't change. Um, the insurance policy that you have is required to um, come to the defense of the officer. Isn't that correct? Well, I don't, I don't want to dispute that. I'm not an insurance specialist, as you know, uh, a sheriff, but uh, the concern, Representative, and, and by the way, we greatly appreciate the discussion. I think that's the most important thing that occurs here today. Um, but we are concerned that you are opening up these officers, their family, their livelihoods to lawsuits that come at different angles other than simply going after uh, the insurance carrier or the risk, and in the case of sheriff's offices, the risk pool. I think you should, uh, for the work session, uh, and I'll do the same on my end, but I think you should check on that because um, we've had these discussions around insurance on other issues and the answer is always the same. The um, one it was the campground owners, um, the insurance policy is, uh, and the insurance company is required um, uh, as part of the stipulations in the policy to, to defend the officers. Thank, Thank you. you, Representative. I, I believe that the risk pool has provided uh, written testimony. Mm -hmm. If they haven't, I will feel that they did. They do. That helps. Thank you. Are there additional questions for uh, Sheriff Morton from committee members? Seeing none again, thank you very much uh, for spending maybe more time than you wanted to today with the Judiciary Committee, but we always welcome your input, sir. We appreciate it. important discussion. Thank you. Okay, um, that ends the list of persons that I know who wanted to testify in opposition to LD 1416 uh, that registered, but I will check again in the attendee room to see if there are any persons who wish to testify in opposition. And I do see a hand come up and I see somebody being moved over perhaps. Okay. Um, if we could move Shane Stevenson in as a panelist. So, um, welcome back, uh, Officer Stevenson. And, and thank I, you. Feel, if I'm getting your title wrong, please correct me. At any no, point. that's correct. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and you are welcome to begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're ready to go. So, uh, I'm constantly hearing um, that bad apples will be the ones that leave if qualified immunity is taken away. I can honestly tell you all that that is not going to be the case. Um, you know, the things that we are doing in public is, is almost, uh, almost unimaginable uh, for, for things to work out the way they do many times. Uh, I know for me personally, very recently, I've had two uh, life and death situations that could have resulted bad, but by, by fortune, luck, or some other um, you know, process, I was able to get through it all and successfully avoid a deadly force encounter or some sort of complication. Um, qualified immunity is something for officers to strive for. It's an incentive for people to do the right thing. If they do the right thing, then they qualify for immunity. Um, I agree with Lori, what she testified to earlier. Um, she thinks that we need to research how everything is going in all these other cities. I agree. This needs to be researched until it's passed, because I think it can be detrimental to what Maine is doing and the satisfaction rating among the people of the survey that was mentioned earlier in earlier testimony. Um, officers will be afraid to go above and beyond without protection of putting themselves out there. Uh, people are leaving the profession now to go mow lawns because the demand on us is becoming too great. Uh, Representative Poyer uh, also asked if additional research is needed. And I, I, I agree that we should research this more. 
Uh, in regards to the personal insurance plans, these insurance policies cover representation, but sometimes that representation is one, the lowest bidder, and also it doesn't protect the person. Doctors and other professionals can carry professional liability insurance, and that professional liability insurance will cover them so they're not going to be personally out of money. So I think these are very different things that we need to look at. This bill is extremely complex, and I think it's going to ruin law enforcement and the good things that we've done. And I'd like to be a part of the process to try to make things better in the state. So thank you very much, Officer Stevenson. Um, and, and we appreciate you taking the time out to testify before the committee, both this morning and this afternoon. Thank Are you. there questions from committee members for <laughs> Officer Stevenson? Let me give another second. Seeing none, uh, again, thank you for your time this afternoon and this morning. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other persons with their hands up to testify in opposition to LD 1416, I will turn to those who registered to testify neither for nor against and welcome back to the Judiciary Committee, Rebecca Graham from MMA. Ms. Graham, when you are ready to begin your three minute testimony, just uh, unmute yourself, activate your camera and uh, have at it. Thank you, Representative Harnett and Senator Carney. My name is Rebecca Graham, and I am testifying neither for nor against LD 1416 on behalf of MMA and at the behest of our 70 member legislative policy committee. As I indicated in my earlier testimony in the last bill, municipal officials do want to work with our state partners and do better um, on partnership with reform. While there is a more balanced approach with LD 1416, the limits on, and the limits on personal liability are welcome. We support the main chiefs of police suggestion to take a deeper dive on these issues to better inform this committee and ultimately the public around something that is an extremely complex process that is being touted as a silver bullet when in reality it's going to divert fiscal resources away from investing in results-based reform. We also share uh, the main chief's concerns with regard to language under section 4686 and opening up the officer to liability for an alleged violation where um, the involved person is using a threat to physical force or violence against a person. Officials are concerned that that language and its possible interpretation of the legislation might be uh, limiting because limiting personal liberty rather and unconditional movement and sometimes life is essentially a job requirement of law enforcement. The threat of physical force is necessary is a necessary element and, and of ev everyday duties of law enforcement. So while the goal is all voluntary compliance, that threat of physical force and restraint is an element of every rest, uh, arrest and necessary to respond to protect life and property. So officials don't want our officers to second guess using that threat of physical force to detain an individual when responding to a domestic assault or bar fight or removing an individual from a business president uh, or residence. Uh, not all police are represented by unions and there is a risk pool of police officers. And as you have heard, um, they are unable to obtain private insurance. So we do think this is one of the areas that needs a deep dive in its intersection with court claims. And also creating a two path process between state violations and federal violations will certainly enrich in trial lawyers, but it might leave genuine uh, violations a greater challenge to pursue for an individual and twice as costly for communities. So we would like to continue to work with the committee and um, stakeholders on this process. And if you choose to carry this over as has been suggested by the main chiefs of police, we'd be happy to work with you on that as well. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Graham. Uh, we appreciate your time and testimony on both bills today. Uh, are there questions from committee members for Ms. Graham? Seeing none, again, thank you very much for your time and for the testimony that you submitted. Um, we appreciate your effort. So I will take one more look at the attendee room to ask if there are any persons in attendance who wish to testify in support of LD 1416 to please raise your hand. Seeing none, I would ask if there are any persons in attendance who wish to speak in opposition to LD 1416 to please raise your electronic hand. And seeing none, finally, I would ask if there are any persons uh, in attendance who wish to testify neither for nor against LD 1416 to please raise your electronic hand. 
And seeing none, uh, I want to thank all those who came to testify uh, on this bill this afternoon and having received testimony of those present today who wish to present. Um, I will now close the public hearing on LD 1416. And with that, I will return the uh, virtual gavel to my co-chair, Senator Carney, uh, and I will have to deactivate my video for a, a while, but I will I'll be back shortly. And thank you again. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Harnett. And um, I'm just gonna mute you. I muted you as well, um, Representative Harnett. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to begin our series of work sessions. And I think that um, our analysts put into the chat the order in which we are going to take up the bills. And our first one is LD 879. And um, Peggy, thank you for joining us or appearing. I know you're here all the time listening. Um, could you please, let's see. So we'll open the work session on LD um, 879. And for those who are in the attendee list, Typically we will um, ask the bill sponsor to join the panel, but for others who have joined us and are in the attendee space, we'll, we'll actually only invite you to join the panel if we have um, specific questions for you. And so LD 7, uh, 879 is, and I'm changing gears here. So give me just a moment. LD 879 is um, Senator Kimes' bill, and she is already on the panel. Uh, did you wish to speak, Senator Kime? Okay. So uh, Peggy, if you would like to um, give us kind of a um, top level bill analysis, and then we can uh, do a deeper dive, please. Yes, thank you. So um, this bill amends the Human Rights Act. It actually amends the definition of unlawful discrimination um, in the definition section. It says unlawful discrimination includes, and this is paragraph G of that subsection 10, and it says discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations, credit, educational opportunity on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, except that a religious corporation, association, or organization under current law it says, that does not receive public funds is exempt from this provision with respect to employment, housing, and educational opportunity. Um, and what Senator Kimes' bill would do is strike out that qualification that um, the exception for a religious corporation association or organization um, in those instances um, wouldn't be limited to ones that do not receive public funds. So if there's a, um, a religious organization that receives some sort of federal grants or municipal grants or some, some kind of um, is involved in some kind of government program, they would not lose their ability to um, make employment, housing and educational choices based on um, the affiliation with the religion. They can make those um, or um, on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity um, in those three areas, as long as they're, they're focused on their religious activities, I believe. So that's what her bill would do is take out that limitation. So it, mean, it would mean that a religious corporation, association or organization would not be violating the Human Rights Act if they um, made choices on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity in employment, housing and educational opportunity that the, when those are functions are of the religious organization. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, committee members, are there any, well, first of all, um, Senator Keim, do you wish to, to be heard on, the, on this, to speak with us about the bill before we move into questions? of Peggy? Um, no, I don't. I think I shared everything in the public hearing. Thank you. Great, thanks. 
Um, okay, committee members, are there questions for, um, for Peggy? Not seeing any questions, committee members. Um, are we ready to vote on this bill? Oh, go ahead, Representative Libby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to move ought to pass. We have an ought to pass motion. Is there a second? Seconded by uh, Representative Poirier. Any discussion on the motion? Not seeing any. All right, the committee is ready for the vote. Thank you very much, Ms. Panette. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Carney. No. Senator Carney votes no. Senator Sanborn. Senator Kime. Yes. Senator Kime votes yes. Representative Harnett. No. Rep Thank you. Representative Harnett votes no. Representative Babbage. No. Representative Babbage votes no. Representative Galgay Reckett. No. Representative Galgay Reckett votes no. Representative Moriarty. No. Representative Moriarty votes no. Representative Sheehan. No. Representative Sheehan votes no. Representative Hagan. Representative Libby. Yes. Representative Libby votes yes. Representative Poirier. Yes. Representative Poirier votes yes. Representative Thorne. Yay. Representative Thorne votes yes. Representative Evangelos. Representative Newell. No. Representative Newell no. votes no. I will call the absentees. Senator Sanborn. Senator Sanborn is absent. Representative Hagan. Representative Hagan is absent. Representative Evangelos. Representative Evangelos is absent. I have, sorry. Madam Chair, I have four members voting in the affirmative, seven members voting in the negative, and three members are absent. Thank you very much, Ms. Panette. And for those who voted um, no on the motion, the report is, is ought not to pass. A representative Harnett? Did you, you took the words right out of my mouth, Madam trying Chair. Trying to get better at remembering that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and um, with that, the, the, the motion, uh, the votes on, on LD 879 are um, seven ought not to pass, four ought to pass, and three absences. And with that, we'll close the work session on 879 and move on and open the work session on LD 982, an act to protect against discrimination by public entities. And um, I just wanna give everyone a status report on this, I believe, and Peggy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we were um, waiting for some amended language on that. And has that arrived? Um, I, I do not have amended language. I had heard, I hadn't actually seen anything official that there were folks who were working on this. Um, it, it, it's amending the public accommodations chapter. And I think that there was a concern that that wasn't really the right way to address this question. That was my and understanding. I have, and I don't have an amendment, sorry. Okay, so I think at this point, it makes sense to, um, it makes sense to table this matter until we actually have the, the um, sponsor's proposed amendment so that we're not um, taking up time that we don't need to spend. And so Representative Sheehan, do you have a motion? Um, yes, I move to table in light of this. Senator Kahn? No. Is there a second on the motion to table? Uh, seconded by Representative Harnett. And we'll move on to the vote on the motion to table. Want a, excuse me, do you want to call the roll or are you just going to raise your hands on a table? Um, we can try raising our hands. Let's use our electronic hands and, and let um, 
Ms. Panette register it that way. Got eight. And eight with, oops, it's changing. Wait a minute. Uh, Let's, it, can we just quickly do a roll call, please? Because I, um, I think it's, it's, that's very confusing the way we were doing it. I, I'm happy to do so, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Senator Carney. Yes. Senator Carney votes yes. Senator Sanborn. Senator Kime. Sorry, no. <laughs> Senator Kime votes no. Representative Harnett. Yes. Representative Harnett votes yes. Representative Babbage. Yes. Representative Babbage votes yes. Representative Galgay Reckett. Yes. Representative Galgay Reckett votes yes. Representative Moriarty. Yes. Representative Moriarty votes yes. Representative Sheehan. Yes. Representative Sheehan votes yes. Representative Hagan. Representative Libby. No. Representative Libby votes no. Representative Poirier. No. Representative Poirier votes no. Representative Thorne. Nay. Representative Thorne votes no. Representative Evangelos. Representative Newell. Yes. Representative Newell votes yes. I'll call the absentee. Senator Sanborn. Senator Sanborn is absent. Representative Hagan. Representative Hagan is absent. Representative Evangelos. Representative Evangelos is absent. I have, Madam Chair, I have seven members voting in the affirmative, four members in the negative, and three members are absent. Thank you very much, Ms. Panette. So the tabling motion carries. So LD 982 is tabled. We'll close the work session on 982, move on to our work session on 1180. This is an act to prohibit discrimination in housing based on a person's participation in a rental assistance program. And Peggy, if you could please give us the, um, the top line analysis and then we can do a deeper dive as necessary. Yes, thank you. So um, this bill adds a new subsection to what's considered housing discrimination and is therefore prohibited under the um, Human Rights Act. And it's um, um, for any, uh, anybody who is renting or selling housing to refuse to rent or negotiate um, for rent because the person's source of income is public assistance program or because of the requirements of any program providing the source of income or refuse to participate in or comply with any federal, state, or local requirements of a tenant-based rental assistance program. Um, and, and it's worded that way about the requirements because um, it, currently it is um, illegal housing discrimination for um, a, a decision to be based on, um, because the individual is a recipient of federal, state, or local public assistance but the law court has gone back to look at like the original application section of the Human Rights Act to talk about um, business necessity and um, that a, a business would not have to um, comply with limitations in the act if, um, if it was consistent with business necessity to not go along with those things. And, and there was a law court case that said the burden um, on, on housing providers to comply with all the requirements of different housing um, assistance programs made it a, a legitimate business necessity to avoid renting in those situations where it could. They, um, um, a housing owner could choose not to rent based on that reason. Um, so the language of this bill is intended to overcome that um, interpretation of the existing law. Thank you very much. Um, committee members, 
is there, uh, are there questions for Peggy? I'm not seeing any, I, I had a question for you. Oh, the, there's a couple committee member questions. We'll start with those. Representative Libby. I actually don't have a question. I have a motion, but I'd be fine with letting questions proceed first. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Reckett. Oh, you, you're, um, we can't hear you. I was saying I had the same statement as Representative Libby, so she's welcome to go first. Okay, so let's go back to you, Representative Libby. Um, you may make your motion. Thank you very much. Um, I move ought not to pass. And is there a second? Senator Kime seconds. Any discussion on the motion? Um, I actually, I have a question that I would like to ask you, Peggy. Could you please review for us um, what the Maine Human Rights Commission testimony was on this um, bill? Um, I believe the commission testified in favor. Let me look through my pile real quick. It's not really organized. That's all right, and and um, and I'm also wondering if the commission had proposed any amendment. Um, I did not note an amendment. Um, I know that um, commission the the commission council is in the attendee room. If you have a question. Um, Okay, let me just, I think what I'll do is um, bring the commission council over um, to the panel just to answer that question. I'm just, I miss, I think I might be misremembering and I just wanted that clarification. So um, Ms. Archer Hirsch, I'm going to bring you over for the purpose of answering that specific question. We, we are, um, there's something I think blocking your video, Ms. Archer Hirsch. That Maybe another you. computer screen. Ah, there yeah. you are. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I am, um, I think I'm probably misremembering, but did the commission propose any um, amendment to LD 1180? We did not. Um, and we did testify in favor. Thank you very much. My for, pleasure. For Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being there. Any other? Okay, I'm going to return you back to the to the attendee list. Um, any other discussion before we move on to a vote on the ought not to pass motion? Representative Libby. Thank you. I do wish to speak to my motion, so I will do that now. Uh, we already have a housing crisis here in Maine. We've heard all about that. Um, and this is not, in my opinion, the way to fix it. We've heard extensive testimony against this bill. And uh, I think it, it shows clearly this will increase the housing crisis rather than decrease it. If landlords don't want to participate in the program, they should not be mandated to. This solution is looking to fix a government problem uh, by mandating that private businesses participate. It's an incredibly lazy way to attempt to bolster up a government program that needs a fix uh, through mandating private business participation rather than actually fixing the program. And I will be voting uh, not to pass. Thank you, Representative Libby. Committee members, is there any other discussion before we move on to the vote? Not seeing any. Um, and Ms. Panette, I think we're ready for the vote. And this is on the uh, Representative Libby's ought not, to, ought not to pass motion. 
and uh, which was seconded by Senator Kine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Carney. No. Senator Carney votes no. Senator Sanborn. Senator Kime. Yes. Senator Kime votes yes. Representative Harnett. No. Representative Harnett votes no. Representative Babbage. No. Representative Babbage votes no. Representative Galgay Record. No. Representative Galgay Record votes no. Representative Moriarty. No. Representative Moriarty votes no. Representative Sheehan. No. Representative Sheehan votes no. Representative Hagan. Representative Libby. Yes. Representative Libby votes yes. Representative Poirier. Yes. Representative Poirier votes yes. Representative Thorne. Yay. Representative Thorne votes yes. Representative Evangelos. No. Representative Evangelos votes no. Representative Newell. I will call the absentees. Senator Sanborn. Senator Sanborn is absent. Representative Hagan. Representative Hagan is absent. Representative Newell. Representative Newell is absent. Madam Chair, I have four members voting in the affirmative, seven members voting in the negative, and three members are absent. Thank you very much, Ms. Panette. And um, for those who voted no, um, the report would be ought to pass. And is that correct, everybody who voted no? Yes. That's our report. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Panette. Thank you. And um, that closes the work session on 1180. And we'll open the work session on LD 1294, an act to prevent discrimination against domestic violence victims. And Peggy, if you could again, give us the, the analysis and then we'll see if the bill sponsor wishes to be heard as well. Thank you. So um, this bill amends the Human Rights Act in two subchapters, one on um, housing discrimination and one on employment discrimination. And it adds in the status basically of, a per, of the either, um, so the first section is employment. So either the applicant for employment or later on the employee, um, herself or his himself um, because the applicant sought and received an order of protection from abuse under Title 19A Chapter 101. So that would that would kind of classify that as a status in, in an employer or um, a labor union or an, um, um, a, a hiring entity would not be able to discriminate, discriminate against um, a person based on the fact that they have um, sought and received a protection from abuse order. So that applies in the um, employment context. And then um, starting in, um, I believe it's section three, it, no, section two would be in the unlawful housing discrimination. So the same thing, somebody offering housing or um, once housing has already been secured they would not be able to um, discriminate against somebody, take any kind of action um, because the person had sought and received an order of protection from abuse under um, Title 19A. It, it's the same language repeated over and over and over. Um, this is this kind of status based on activity um, is rather than you know religion or gender um, is be is um, parallel to that for um, a person who has filed a workers comp claim um, or um, is protected under the whistleblowers protection act so those are also um, kind of protection for an activity that somebody engaged in um, that that this law already protects Thank you very much. And was there a suggested amendment um, relating to it being a 
think a final protective order perhaps? Um, you had um, different suggestions. I know that some people, I, I think um, the commission did recommend that it be um, limited to a final order of protection um, as opposed to an ex parte order um, to make sure that there was an opportunity for a, a hearing in that situation. Um, I'm not saying that the landlord or the employer would be the defendant in these cases, but but that there would better, there would have been an opportunity for a full hearing on the claims and, and that's in, and the order was then issued. So there, there was that suggestion. There were some other folks who said it shouldn't be based on having a protection from abuse order at all, but the commission thought it would be clarifying to say it was a final protection order. And, and we would do that by cross-referencing the specific section of 19A as opposed to the chapter. Thank you. And just to, to reiterate, so the final protection order that would, that the protection under the Human Rights Act would be connected to would be an order that had had not just the preliminary hearing, but the final hearing where all of the parties to that protective order could be heard. Right. That there would be an opportunity for such hearing. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Harnett. Thank you, Madam Chair, and this is for Peggy as well. I believe there was a second suggested amendment from the Maine Human Rights Commission that the relief only be available to plaintiffs in PFA cases and not to respondents when there are sometimes uh, issues, when there are mutual orders of protection that are issued. Is that correct? That is correct, and I'm trying to remember the exact ability of a court to issue a mutual order of protection. I'm thinking that that's no longer permitted, but um, I, we I can think that, it. yeah, I think that's correct. If it's a protection from abuse order, it can't be mutual. Okay. I, I, I do think that is something that the commission had recommended um, a, and that law was changed so there you can't have a mutual order of protection. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So the Second Amendment is not needed. Is, is basically. I, I will doing. double check, but yes, I think that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't know whose hand was up next. Uh, do uh, Representative Sheehan or Senator Kime? Do either of you? Can you? T whoever was first, please speak. I, I think I was first. Um, okay. I just, after hearing um, about the two amendments, I would like to make a motion ought to pass as amended the first amendment. Sorry. Thank you. So th the first amendment relating to the order being a final order. Thank you. Is there a second on that motion? Seconded by Representative Harnett. Um, Senator Kime. Thank you. Um, we heard uh, testimony in opposition from the Maine State Chamber, and I was wondering if they were here and could speak to the amendment. Um, is there somebody in particular who you... Um, well, it was Peter Gore who actually um, submitted testimony. And I, I am not familiar with everybody who might be representing the main state chamber. Do you, can you take a, uh, Mr. Gore is not um, in the right. attendee list. Are you able to access that attendee list, Senator Klein? Yes, and I don't see anyone there from the chamber that uh, that I recognize. Okay, alrighty. Um, let's just uh, ask the bill sponsor if um, for her reaction to the um, proposed amendment as well. Welcome, Senator Bailey. Thank um, you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am fine with the proposed amendment to make it a final order. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Representative Sheehan, your hand is still up. Did you have another question? 
Okay. Uh, Representative Libby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am I'm trying to figure out, I, I haven't seen the amendment yet. Is that the, the piece at the end of the analysis? No, that's current law. Where is the amendment that I can access that? Um, that isn't drafted yet, but the oh, way, no. Okay, I thought um, I was What we would something. do Sorry. is, <laughs> no, no problem. Instead of saying um, Title 19A, Chapter 101, we would okay. say Title 19A, Section 4007. Because oh, okay, the, so it moves where this is? Right, instead of saying any order issued under that whole protection for okay. chapter. Changes that. Focus it to just section 4007 because that's the final order. The temporary okay. orders are issued under section 4006. Only final order. Okay, and then my, I, I have less of a question and more discussion. Um, I understand the intent of this bill and I, I think it's extremely well in, intended. Um, my concerns more lie in, um, we had a bill and I realize this is a completely different type of bill, but we had a bill that was going to add um, disclosing pests as a requirement um, on a real estate disclosure. And the reason that I think we unanimously didn't support it was that the concern was um, a couple fold, and I think those apply for me here. One, that by starting to add things to the list, um, it might make folks think that things that aren't specifically on the list are then excused. Um, and I don't want to see um, any form of discrimination excused because it's not listed. And so that is one concern that I have, um, that as we get more specific, it, it actually excuses other discrimination or is seen to. And my other concern um, is that I wonder if it is the actual, and maybe other folks could um, lend some um, help to help me understand this. Is it the order itself that, that folks are perhaps being discriminated against? Or is it the circumstances surrounding the order? Is it the fact that someone with an order um, might have undergone economic abuse and might not have a stellar credit score or something like that. Um, I just am wondering if, if there's some nuance there and if, if anyone else has these same types of questions. Go ahead, Representative Reckitt. Um, I understand your concern, um, Representative Libby, but I don't believe economic abuse is an issue that would arise in a, uh, prote a final protective order in the same kind of way that the risk of uh, continued uh, abuse might be. Um, I think that, um, <clears throat> I, I just don't think it's, it's gonna expand in that kind of way. Um, I, at least I've never seen it expand in that kind of way. So I think that um, the concern is really that if someone is trying desperately to find a place to live and uh, they would not necessarily on an application for rental disclose the information that they had a protective order. I don't, I've never seen a rental agreement that, that asked that question, um, but somebody could, I could, I could see a time when a, um, responded in a protective order might endeavor to have the person against whom they have um, uh, done wrong, um, they might want to keep them from getting an apartment and they might disclose to a landlord in order to try to keep them uh, in their power. I mean, I have watched that happen with uh, people trying to, uh, to, trying to establish a new life uh, that people would try to undermine that possibility. And I think that's what this is trying to prevent is that someone who is literally trying to uh, start a new life in a new place doesn't get into undermined by innuendos or actuality uh, that they had a protective order at some point. Yeah, I, I would just like to add that um, you had said, Representative Libby, something about, you know, 
uh, types of discrimination that are not listed in the Human Rights Act being kind of excused if we add too many things to the list. And the, the way the Human Rights Act uh, functions is that only those things that are listed are protected. And so it doesn't present that kind of danger because there, there are lots of reasons that you can legally discriminate against somebody. It's just, if it's listed in the Human Rights Act, then those are the narrow set of reasons why you couldn't discrim discriminate against someone. And I think that this is a really important piece of legislation. I think it's very similar to the two anti-retaliation protections in the main Human Rights Act. And, and as Representative Reckitt said, I think it helps um, people who are trying to start a new life free of, of a situation that's really personally dangerous to them that, that this legislation helps them start that new life. See a couple of other hands up, Senator Kime. Thank you. One of the issues brought up by the um, but in Peter Gore's testimony was the question of how long the status of the recipient being, um, you know, having got a order of protection, how long does that last? So, so if you ever get a court order for protection, um, you then become part of the protected class for the next year, the next five years, the next 25 years. H how long does this put you in a protected class? Does anyone have an answer to that? <clears throat> I do, if you... Yeah, and I can... Um, basically, the, the order is uh, used to be one year. Uh, then it, the... Uh, the orders were extended so that many were two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, you have to go back to court to extend it. And it's very unusual for them to be extended. Uh, uh, I think I've only heard of one lifetime protective order ever. So, um, and I think, um, so I think it's likely to be maybe two years uh, would be a safe bet. Uh, but, the, but this language, just to maybe clarify my question a little bit, this, this language just says, you know, a person who has sought and received an order. So it doesn't say it has to be a current order or that they still have to have one. It just says mm -hmm. they've sought one and received it. Mm -hmm. I think the limitation happens in a different way, Senator Kime, because it, it prevents somebody from being denied a job or housing specifically because they've received a protective order. And so it's not like somebody who has received a protective order has this kind of lifetime shield. It's just that that can't be the motivation for denying somebody of a job or denying them of housing. And so but it, that- But it is a lifetime shield at that point. Well, o only if the prospective employer knows about the protective order and bases the decision on that order. And, you know. Right, but, but it's lifetime, I guess, after that. It, it is lifetime. Probably so, I mean, we, we probably don't want people to not get jobs because 50 years ago they had, a, had to get a protection order from a court. I mean, I guess that's where I would come down on that one. But yeah, I guess if in that extreme situation where somebody knew about it decades later, yeah, I think it would apply. Representative Reckitt? No, sorry, I'm a, a slow hand lower, sorry. That's okay. Any additional questions or discussion? Are we ready for the vote? Sure. Thank you, Ms. Panette. Thank you, and Madam Chair. Actually, do yes, we do have a motion. I just didn't write it down. So we had a, a motion by uh, Representative Sheehan ought to pass as amended 
with reference to the specific section so that it would only apply um, extended protection to somebody who gets a final protection from her from abuse order. And it was seconded by Representative Harnett. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Senator Carney. Yes. Senator Carney votes yes. Senator Sanborn. Senator Kime. No. Senator Kime votes no. Representative Harnett. Yes. Representative Harnett votes yes. Representative Babbage. Yes. Representative Babbage votes yes. Representative Galgay Reckett. Yes. Representative Galgay Reckett votes yes. Representative Moriarty. Yes. Representative Moriarty votes yes. Representative Sheehan. Yes. Representative Sheehan votes yes. Representative Hagan. Representative Libby. No. Representative Libby votes no. Representative Poirier. No. Representative Poirier votes no. Representative Thorne. Nay. Representative Thorne votes no. Representative Evangelos. Yes. Representative Evangelos votes yes. Representative Newell. I will call the absentees. Senator Sanborn. Senator Sanborn is absent. Representative Hagan. Representative Hagan is absent. Representative Newell. Representative Newell is absent. Madam Chair, I have seven members voting in the affirmative, four members voting in the negative, and three members are absent. Thank you very much, Ms. Panette. For those who voted no, could you please let us know what your report is? Ought not to pass. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, um, do you need any additional information, Supi, on that one? Okay. With that, we'll bring the work session on um, 1294 uh, to a close and open the work session on the um, last, well, <laughs> the last um, bill that we were supposed to have a work session on on Tuesday, and that's LD 1374, an act to extend the time period for filing a complaint under the Maine Human Rights Act for discrimination based on an alleged sexual act, sexual contact, or sexual touching. And um, Peggy, we are ready for you when you're ready for us. Great. Well, you, thank you. You just described the bill basically. So under current law, if somebody wants to file a complaint with a complaint um, of discrimination with the Human Rights Commission, they have to file it not more than 300 days after the alleged act of unlawful discrimination. This would extend that to um, two years in only the cases where the complaint is based on an alleged sexual act, sexual contact or sexual touching. Um, and um, so it would give them two years after the act, contact, or touching um, um, happened. Representative Libby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Peggy, a quick question was trying to figure out the timeline on this. So um, is this I'm trying to figure out how uh, things fit together with civil and criminal in this case. So if um, there was sexual contact or sexual touching or, or whatever case may be, and it were handled in a criminal matter, obviously that can take some time. So would this statute of limitations um, be affected by that? As in, if there were a criminal matter and it took a year and a half to resolve with that person, then the statute of limitations would be up and they couldn't take any civil action. That's what I'm trying to trying to figure out if a delayed criminal case, if it were taken up would delay. Right. And my, understand, my understanding that the fact that there is um, a, a criminal case pending or whatever would not affect this, the running of this statute of limitations. This is really um, that the first step is is to resolve what the problem is, and you know they try to do a lot of conciliation, and um, so people can continue their relationships without the discrimination. Um, and if that's not resolved, then there there can be um, a civil suit 
um, that's after the either the Human Rights Commission um, finds reasonable grounds or if they don't reach that, then somebody can go ahead for, and in that case, it would probably be damages and maybe injunctive relief as opposed to a, a criminal case, which be, would be a separate um, con, um, uh, prosecution and would be by the state ending up right. with, you know, some kind of criminal penalties. So this, this complaint, this discrimination complaint could be ongoing simultaneously with potentially criminal and civil and this discrimination complaint could all be going on at the same time. Is that correct? Um, I don't know of a reason why that couldn't happen. I okay. mean, okay. It, uh, I don't know what, um, you know, depending on, on the class of crime that those those acts would be, the statute of limitations is, it varies. Okay. Um, Right. And I, you know, I don't know if the commission has ever run into cases before where the act of discrimination is also a crime and that okay, they okay. were dealing with that. Okay. Thank you. Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Peggy, just to clarify my understanding, the two statutes of limitations would run simultaneously and one Statute of limitations would not delay or suspend the other. I, I I don't believe there's any kind of they call it tolling when you stop the running of a statute of limitations based on the fact that there is a criminal case pending or that there was in a criminal case that there's a human rights complaint pending. I don't think either one of those tolls the statute of limitations in the other um, case. Good. Thanks. Senator Kine. Thank you. One of the issues I want to bring up is that um, by extending this and then looking at the Human Rights uh, Commission ability to, you know, they, they're given a couple of years to investigate things as well. So the, we could be looking at the Human Rights asking the Commission to look into details that could be as long as four years um, earlier than um, than the alleged action. I mean, the, they could be looking back four years, and given the deterioration in in memory of people, so the deterioration of evidence. Basically, I, I just find that this is um, going to be really difficult for the person that's accused. Um, difficult for the commission as well, but at, for, for everybody to just e even prove that they're not, um, you know, to prove that they're innocent with this. So I, I just feel like this is a opening something up probably more than more than people have memory to, to back up is the problem here. I, I would um, representative record. I'm going to kind of jump the line here if you don't mind, but I kind of share your concern, Senator Kine, because I think one of the big policies underlying the Maine Human Rights Act is to try to get um, issues uh, reported and dealt with through the administrative process quickly so that people, um, you know, people who are subject to sexual harassment in the workplace, for example, get a, a quick remedy and that it's really, that's kind of part of the framework of the Human Rights Act. And so I think I, I appreciate kind of the, the um, concerns raised by the bill sponsor, but I also think that, um, that this change would impact the functioning of the Human Rights Act in a lot of ways that, that maybe don't, benef don't achieve the benefit that's intended. Um, Representative Reckitt? I'd like to move on not to pass. Is there a second? Seconded by Senator Kime. Is there any more discussion committee members? I am not seeing any. Um, Ms. Panette, I think we're ready for the vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Carney. Uh, yes. Senator Carney votes yes. Senator Sanborn. Senator Kime. 
Yes. Senator Kime votes yes. Representative Harnett. Yes. Representative Harnett votes yes. Representative Babbage. Yes. Representative Babbage votes yes. Representative Galgay Record. Yes. Representative Galgay Record votes yes. Representative Moriarty. Yes. Representative Moriarty votes yes. Representative Sheehan. Yes. Representative Sheehan votes yes. Representative Hagan. Yes. Representative Hagan votes yes. Representative Libby. Yes. Representative Libby votes yes. Representative Poirier. Yes. Representative Poirier votes yes. Representative Thorne. Yay. Representative Thorne votes yes. Representative Evangelos. Yes. Representative Evangelos votes yes. Representative Newell. I'll call the abs I'll recall the absentees. Excuse me. Senator Sanborn. <laughs> Senator Sanborn is absent. Representative Newell. Representative Newell is absent. Madam Chair, I have 12 members voting in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and two members are absent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Panette. Um, so the ought not to pass motion carries and that finishes the work session on 1374. And we can um, move on to the remainder of our work sessions that were originally scheduled to start at one o'clock today. I feel like we're making progress, everyone. Um, and so we are going to, let's see, I just want to kind of refresh my, myself um, Peggy or Soupy, do you remember if there was any um, any bill that we needed to take first for various reasons this afternoon on this list? No? Okay. I, I don't think so. I, I know uh, Representative Warren was not going to be available until probably three. after three. three. Yeah, so you're good. Okay. She just okay. didn't want you to take it up earlier. Okay, so let's um, move forward then with LD54, and this is our um, colleague Representative Evangelos' Evangelos bill, an act to amend the laws governing post-conviction review in order to facilitate the fair hearing of all newly discovered evidence. Right, so this bill, if you were on the committee last year, looks like a repeat of the committee amendment. It amends the post-conviction review law to um, provide that there is no deadline for um, a, a defendant to um, file a, for post-conviction review if a claim is based on newly discovered evidence. Um, uh, regardless of when the newly discovered evidence could have been obtained or discovered through the exercise of due diligence. So that's a big change from um, the current law. Um, this also allows the court, it, it um, allows the court to require the petitioner to provide additional information about the nature of the newly discovered evidence that the, that's intended to eliminate um, frivolous claims that somebody might bring up that really don't go to the heart of the case. Um, the fact that a petition uh, initiated pursuant to the old statute uh, was dismissed as untimely filed or for the failure to exercise due diligence does not preclude the initiation of a petition for review under this subsection based on the same or different newly discovered evidence. So that what that is saying is since the current law limits has a time period for newly discovered evidence to be brought forward. Um, um, and the question was whether there was due diligence, could it have been discovered earlier? Um, some claims have been rejected and never got to the point of being reviewed. Um, this would say uh, this law allows those to be brought forward again. They'd still have to go through this process, but the fact that they had been brought up and dismissed as not being timely filed does not mean they couldn't be brought up um, on for the substantive reasons now. Thank you very much. Um, committee members, are there questions for Peggy? Uh, go ahead, Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Peggy, I believe we have an amendment from Senator Kime. 
you do have an amendment from Senator Keim, and um, I'm sure she will speak to that. Um, this was actually her minority report last year. Um, so this language has been around and um, I can speak to it or she can speak to it. Uh, Go ahead, Peggy, sure. Uh, right, so um, if, if you don't have it, I can share the screen. Does everybody have it? Yeah. Um, it it's adding one more sentence in there that says, the court may summarily dismiss the petition if it determines that the petitioner has not made a prima facie showing that the new evidence was material and would have affected the jury's verdict. So that follows if the court requires the, the um, petitioner to kind of explain what this claim is about. Um, and if the court decides that, that is, there's not really a case there to go forward, a prima, fa a prima facie case is not a, a significant amount of information to put forward um, that the, the court can dismiss it. Um, I, I think that might be what is intended anyway by allowing the court to require information um, in, in whenever the court thinks it's necessary. And this gives the court the ability, it, it clearly says the court can say, no, you're not going forward with this. Yep, thank you. Um, committee members are there. Oh, Senator Kime would, Representative Evangelos, I know your hand has been up. Since we're on the amendment, we'll hear from Senator Kime and then we'll hear from you. Uh, go ahead, Senator Kime. Uh, sorry, I, I actually don't mind waiting till after Representative Evangelos. Yes, I, um, so I do think that the change in this bill and, and considering this bill is important and, and as, a lot of you recognize we did talk about this last session and this was the minority report. I just think in some way we need to limit um, how much of this is, is brought forth and, and this was an attempt to sort of um, make sure that we're being careful of court time and that uh, the issues that are brought forward are have merit uh, in a way that would um, limit the expenditure of time. Um, I do also, I asked Stephanie Anderson if she could speak to us regarding this bill. She has, um, was the district attorney of Carmel County for a great number of years and has sort of uh, real expertise that I think would be helpful to this committee. And so I had asked if she could join us um, just to share uh, a couple of perspectives on this with the committee if, um, with the chair's permission. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I. I am, uh, think that, that that is fine. I would very much like to hear from Representative Evangelos first. And I actually also had a question for you, Senator Kime. The language that you're proposing, did, did that come from, um, from a representative of the judicial branch? And the reason I'm asking is because I had originally kind of envisioned that that sentence about the court requiring additional information was something that gave the court enough leeway to create its own legal standards and process. And it sounds like the language you're proposing is sort of limiting the direction that the court would go in and creating a standard instead of letting the court do that. And so can you just uh, give a little bit more information about where your language came from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, yeah, so, so it was last session and it was just in discussion with the attorney general's office actually. Um, with me saying, I think this is really important and, and how do we put in some language to make sure that um, it, it's safeguarded in some way ar around what could be just a huge amount of resources looking at all the cases. So, so this was, so it did not come from the courts and I, I think it would be good to hear from them with that concern because I, I think that's a valid question to ask. Yeah, thank you. Um, go ahead, Representative Evangelos. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we've been working on this bill for two years and um, the committee report was uh, nine to two with two not voting in uh, the previous legislature. We did uh, compromise um, um, with um, 
some of the people that had concerns and with the assistance of Chair Carpenter, we added a sentence. Uh, the court may require the petitioner to provide additional information about the nature of the newly discovered evidence. So this is left already up to the, the judge. And this committee has heard overwhelming evidence um, regarding deficiencies uh, in our uh, criminal justice and defense systems. Um, the likelihood that we have uh, innocent people sitting in prison because um, they can't bring evidence forward and because uh, the prosecution claims that their first lawyer uh, should have brought information forward and didn't. I mean, those are not adequate reasons to keep somebody in a cage. We want evidence heard. We do it for the cold case homicide squad. We don't put any limits on anything and I don't think we should. Um, <clears throat> but as Mr. McKee made clear, um, you know, we shouldn't have a time limit on this either because otherwise we end up with people uh, um, sitting in prison. Now the irony was a uh, pleasant irony in this case that um, three days before this bill was heard, uh, <clears throat> we had a, the classic case of uh, the Supreme Court coming out with the decision um, uh, saying that the uh, defendant would have prevailed in a case if he had been allowed to uh, uh, provide evidence, but he wasn't. And he ended up serving three years in prison because he wasn't able to get the evidence in front of a court. So with that all said, <clears throat> I'm gonna get a motion out uh, ought to pass. Uh, we've worked two years on this. We've heard overwhelming evidence and I think we should vote on it. And if um, uh, the minority uh, members um, uh, aren't comfortable with it, they can just vote on the minority report. But Senator Kine, we already have language in there. We tried to compromise um, and brought that language in. And, uh, and I think Mr. McKee made a compelling case. So my motion is ought to pass. Is there a second on the ought to pass motion? Seconded by Representative Babbage. Um, and um, committee, dis is there a committee discussion? I would like, I have some discussion. Um, Senator Kime, do, do you feel that um, if we were able to, uh, that the, the benefits of the, well, to, to pose the question to the judicial branch as to whether the standard that's currently in the, the bill or the language that you pr propose is preferable um, to facilitating um, appropriate judicial review. Do you, are you prepared to support um, to support this legislation? Because I do think that if we can if we can report it out of committee with a unanimous committee report, it will go the the path of the bill through the legislature is, is much more assured. And uh, and I agree with you, Representative Evangelos, that the policy is really important. I just uh, would hate, I, I would like the bill to have its best chance at getting enacted. Um, what what do you think, Senator Kime? I, I would like to hear from the judicial branch on, on the language of the two. Um, and because I, I think the idea is, you know, can they summarily dismiss um, so yes, I would like to hear from them on that language. I, I'm i fine with uh, doing an ought to pass as amended today if we're you know, wanting to just move this quickly. I don't know if there's someone here that can speak to this. Um, but again, I will just mention that I was hoping to hear from Stephanie Anderson um, with, uh, with the chair's permission. Um, I... Okay, let's, if you can just ask um, her one question, because I know that um, Representative Evangelos also um, does have uh, um, time constraints this afternoon, and we have another bill of his to do a work session on, and maybe I will multitask and see if I can um, reach out to someone at the um, judicial, um, in the judicial branch. So let me um, bring Ms. Anderson in, and you may ask her the question. Uh, Representative Harnett? I would be happy to reach out to uh, Julie Finn if that would help you to continue to chair. That would be very helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
And Ms. Anderson, um, you have appeared on our screen. It's nice to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? We can. Senator Keim has a question for you. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Anderson. Um, I was wondering if you could just speak to your experience and you know what this would look like in terms of resources. And um, I, we talked about the courts being able to summarily dismiss something if it doesn't look like it has merit. Um, so I just wondered if you could just speak to that based on your experience. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you for the question. Well, these, these cases are very labor intensive. Um, I think you heard testimony from Ms. Finn from the judicial branch that they do about 100 a year, um, if my recollection is correct. If, if this is opened up to everyone for any time length, uh, people who have already submitted petitions before, it will be at least initially um, a very large burden on the court. Uh, these hearings also take a lot of time from uh, prosecutors and from defense attorneys. Um, and I think this bill, if I may, it ought to also be, um, you should consider it in tandem with 1273, which is the bill I believe you're taking up next, uh, because the impact on uh, post-conviction review and whether or not you open them up to more cases uh, might have an impact. It might inform your analysis on 1273. Uh, Post-conviction review is designed for errors that occurred outside of the court, um, errors that occurred through ineffective assistance of counsel. Now, some types of newly discovered evidence already don't have a time limit. They don't have the one year. Those, that's evidence based on DNA. Uh, that can be brought at any time. So I don't know if that answered your question. Um, one thing you might consider doing um, is um, changing it from one year to a certain number of years, like five. Um, that would, um, you know, that would that would reduce somewhat uh, the fiscal impact that this bill would have. I mean, and it this it also, you know, this was mentioned before in testimony Ms. that Ms. there Anderson, is a policy. Ms. Okay, Anderson, okay. I'm, I um, apologize for interrupting. We this is a work session, and so we're really trying to kind of hone in on this one sentence. And we appreciate you making other okay. suggestions, but we're really um, working here toward uh, answering one very specific issue to see if we can all come come on board on this legislation. Thank you so much for, for being here today. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, I think we have not yet heard from um, Representative Harnett. Uh, Representative Evangelos, your hand is raised. Would you like to um, to speak with, with the committee? I do want to speak with the committee, but um, let's hear from Representative Harnett and then you can recognize me. Or whatever order you want to take. Oh, here we, he has magically appeared. Right, and uh, I'm trying to get a link to Julie Finn uh, so she can join us. Oh, thank you. It must have been up just residual. Okay, committee members, this will just take a, a, a moment. Well, may I speak then? Yes, go ahead. Um, I do remember Julie's <clears throat> had some concerns um, when we heard the bill, you know, around court resources. Um, and then <clears throat> it was made clear um, that 90 or 95% of the people in prison um, pled guilty. They're not eligible uh, for um, relief under this statute. You. This started out as a innocence project bill and we, it was a five page bill <clears throat> that they helped me draft and we whittled it down to one paragraph uh, with the assistance of uh, Mr. McKee and Mr. Maycumber to an extent. Um, and I also raised <clears throat> with Justice Mead earlier in the year that when we're trying to get these criminal justice reforms through, we, we always have the resources to convict them to try them, convict them, and to imprison them. Uh, we never get any concerns expressed uh, around court resources. 
But if the court has to spend some resources um, to exonerate an innocent person, um, so be it. It's the way our justice system should work. Uh, we're not going to get, uh, I think um, one state indicated that they only had like five uh, additional um, appeals. Um, so A, if you pled guilty, you don't have any uh, coverage under this. Um, and B, um, if we have innocent people in jail, um, I, uh, I did discuss with Justice Mead and he agreed with me that, uh, you know, we've got to have the resources to address this. It may take a little bit more resource, but it's not going to be a lot because there aren't that many people that are gonna qualify for uh, um, um, pursuing the petition. And they can all do, only do so after it's reviewed by a judge. Thank and, you, uh, Representative Evangelos. Makes you incredible. So, um, that, but that's what Ms. Finn said. There would be some more pressure, but that was somewhat um, um, repudiated by the fact that um, uh, the vast majority of people incarcerated aren't eligible for uh, relief under the statute. Thank you for, for raising that additional um, issue. Um, we've been joined by Julie Finn, who's the analyst for the Judicial Department the judicial branch. And Ms. Finn, we, we are, um, you probably recall LD 54, that's the legislation that we're talking about. Do you need um, to see the document or have any kind of a refresher on it? Uh, no, I actually was watching on YouTube, so I didn't have a link. I just had to get in the right virtual space, I guess. Um, so I was listening to your discussion um, and I only just saw Senator Kimes' amendment, um, which I think probably gives the judges more latitude, um, but I have not had a chance to review it with them, which I really can't say, yes, we love this amendment or, or not without doing that, um, which I could get back to you on fairly shortly, but I, I just can't, I, I can't say for certainty right now as I sit here. Uh, okay, and um, is that something I, we, um, the legislative process is, is um, moving really rapidly at this point. Is that some information that you could bring back to us in um, on Tuesday potentially? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I will say another thing that I looked at, um, which was similar because uh, Representative Evangelos had mentioned Massachusetts um, Criminal Rule 30 has a similar provision in it. Um, so I think that um, that is a, a model that, that I'm familiar with. It's sim similar to sem Senator Kimes amendment. Um, but yes, I would be happy to review that um, quickly and absolutely would be able to get back to you on Tuesday. <laughs> Representative Evangelos, if we were to table this until Tuesday and then uh, take it up first thing Tuesday morning, would that be acceptable to you? No, ma'am. Uh, no, Madam Chair, it's not acceptable because this is the identical amendment um, that was heard in the 129th. And um, uh, Ms. Finn uh, weighed in on that, that, you know, it may take uh, some limited amount of resources in the court. Of course, anybody that um, files a post-conviction review is gonna take up some resources. But this is about justice and about allowing a pathway for an innocent person to get out of prison. And we, we put the language in to satisfy the minority to allow uh, for a judge um, to review the evidence uh, and they would decide. And we had an attorney, a former attorney general draft that language, Michael Carpenter. He's the one that put the language in a former uh, you know, attorney general uh, representing the prosecution side. So um, I don't want to wait any longer. It's been two years and uh, Ms. Finn um, weighed in on the amendment. It's the identical amendment. There's no new news. Uh, there'll be a few cases and it'll take up a limited amount of court resources. And I don't want to wait. There's a motion on the floor. I want to vote. And does it matter to you? Because I, like you, am very, um, concerned about the underlying policy. I'm so concerned that I feel that if we had a unanimous committee report, and maybe I should ask the committee um, if we're headed in that direction or not, but uh, 
you you understand as an experienced legislator that having um, a unanimous committee report would really um, help the bill work its way through the legislative process. Well, the minority report is based on some additional language uh, for the judge. And um, the question to Ms. Finn was uh, in relation to the resources of the court. She's not gonna weigh in on uh, you know what the judges are going to do. That's not that's not in her prerogative. She's just going to say that uh, this is this is our concern about the resources. But again, and I'm going to reiterate this: we took this up with Justice Mead, and he agreed with me that the courts have to have the resources to adjudicate these cases. We don't have a choice. We've already been cited with this by the Sixth Amendment Center for not doing a good job, and this is just a, a simple bill that removes time limits. And it's, uh, uh, Julie, it's rule, it's rule 35B of the main Massachusetts criminal code, not 30, I'm pretty sure of that. Um, so no, I, I, I don't see any need to wait because um, this is not a new amendment. This is an amendment that's been around for two years. And, um, um, and even if she comes forward and says, uh, well, we're worried about the resources. Well, I'm worried about innocent people in prison. What comes first? If, if we're going to say that we cannot exonerate people because we don't have court space and time, but we've got the time to uh, prosecute them and incarcerate them, um, it's the same argument I've been making all session, that the resources have to be distributed equally. We're not doing very good at that. Um, you know, we're having trouble with getting indigent legal resources. Uh, now I'm running into trouble getting resources um, to help innocent people in prison. So whether her answer is yes, it will uh, put a little extra strain on the court system, it's not gonna make any difference. That doesn't mean the person, can you imagine if you have a son or daughter stuck in prison and well, we don't have the resources to hear the case, but next case uh, convicted, send in prison. You know, it, it can't keep working this way. So I wanna pursue with a vote today. We lost two years on this. I'm here. sorry to interrupt you, Representative Evangelist, but I really want to move the work session forward. Well, I want um, to move the question to Ms. Finn was not, is it or is it not going to take up court resources? The question was, is the language that's contained in the original bill or the language that's contained in Senator Kimes um, proposed amendment, which language gives the court the flexibility it needs to develop the procedures to implement this statute. And I just wanted to clarify that. Representative Libby, you've had your hand up for quite a while. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do have a, a few things, a few quick things to say. One is that I and a number of my fellow legislators were not here in the 129th. So anything that went on there is somewhat moot as we are new to this bill. And so I appreciate the work that was done previously. I was not here for it and it doesn't have any bearing on this, this bill before us today. Um, there has been a significant um, change in circumstances. We've gone through a lot in those last two years. And I am very interested in uh, Ms. Finn's analysis of this bill. Um, and finally, I, I would say certainly I can't promise anything as far as unanimous or not unanimous, but since I always start from a no, um, I am certainly more inclined to um, get towards a unanimous report when I have all of the information in front of me, including a report back from Ms. Finn. Senator Kine. Thank you. I, I appreciate what Representative Libby said. I, I, we do definitely start talking like we were all part of um, the discussions last time and we weren't, and I, my apologies. Um, but my question, Representative Evangelos, is does, is it your assumption, are, are you saying that you believe the language mm -hmm. that's, in your, that's in your original bill, your, your bill this time without the amendment, covers the same ground as the amendment that I'm proposing. Yes. You're saying it's not necessary. And okay. I, I just want to give the uh, judge the full discretionary authority. Okay. I just was, I was unclear if that was what you were stating. And then, so I, I understand, um, 
your urgency to to pass this. I I would like the question asked, but I don't mind if you know a vote is today. You know, I would still vote uh, ought to pass as amended, and I'd probably just throw my amendment language in, and then you know we could always reconsider if that if it came to it, and that you know we learned that that was in the best interest of the bill and the vote. So I'd be fine uh, approaching it that way as well. I understand um, Representative Evangelos urgency, but I also think that we have to recognize that not everybody here has um, walked, plowed this ground already. Thank you very much, Senator Keim. And um, Representative Babbage, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, you know, we are 14 independent thinking people and um, I realize that the amendment that Senator Kime is offering is merely a sentence, but if it doesn't change anything, then um, it's uh, maybe clarifying, but not substantive. Uh, if it does change something, if it changes the threshold, then I may not be in favor of it. And so if a political consideration is unanimity, then if we had some sort of a commitment that if the court felt that that was, I don't, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just not seeing a path forward where the time is justified to delay. I don't, I don't, uh, so, so, so I'm just telling you that I, I think we spent a lot of time to get to achieve what I think everybody wants in that uh, newly inserted, <laughs> it was actually part of the original bill this year, but in that second sentence, um, and, uh, and I'm comfortable with that and, and, and fooling around with that, uh, you know, I, I, if it, I, 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 I agree with Representative Evangelos in this particular case. I'm not sure if delay is gonna get us to yes. Thank you. Thank you for raising that point, um, Representative Babbage. Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know that if I had been involved with this for uh, two years, I would also be extremely impatient at this time, um, but I haven't uh, had that experience. Um, I don't think that the uh, additional sentence has anything to do with judi judicial resources at all, because either there's going to be a claim for post-conviction review or not, but the standard for uh, sort of the evidentiary standard uh, uh, to be uh, met by the petitioning party and the procedural action that a court might take, I think it would be interesting and helpful to have clarified. So if we're talking a delay of five additional days and no further, um, I would, uh, out of respect for, uh, to Senator Kime, uh, await uh, the input from uh, Julie Finn. Um, and if, if the court or the judges haven't been able to speak or collaborate by, by that time, I'd be prepared to vote on uh, the pending motion as it is. I, I frankly don't, I, I frankly think she'll come back and say the judges find this to be helpful because it, it lays, lays out a standard for review, which might preclude the full expenditure of resources in a case which isn't adequately based. Yeah, and I actually kind of have the opposite feeling. I feel I'm concerned that Senator Kimes language might be a little bit too restrictive for the courts. It's a it's a conundrum, um, it given, is. given the the time pressure to do something today. I wish, um, I wish it was acceptable to the sponsor to wait. Um, Peggy, can you can you answer a question for me? Um, because uh, the other thing I I know that um, Representative Evangelos had said that um, this review statute doesn't, um, it doesn't apply to anybody who um, pleaded guilty. And I'm not seeing that in the statute. And I, and I just don't know the answer to that question. Do you know if the 
post that if this um, post conviction review process is available to people who pled guilty or just to people who were convicted after a trial? Well, um, I, I don't have that exactly, but I have um, uh, rules of unified criminal procedure post conviction review rule 67 and it refers to that petition shall be limited to the assertion of a claim for review or one or more criminal judgments arising from a single trial or from a single proceeding for the entry of one or more pleas of guilty or nolo contendere or a single post-sentencing procedure. So um, I, I, I understand that Representative Evangelos has information that um, it doesn't apply to people who have pled guilty, but, but I don't have that same information. So um, it, if he could share that source, that would be great. That would definitely put my mind at ease. Um, and, and then we could go on with that. I, I, I don't think it says anything in the statute about it. Is, and, and so in looking at rule 67 of the Uniform Criminal Procedure, it appears to authorize somebody who has filed a plea and um, I found a form that looks like that is an option that you check off that um, it was either a plea or jury trial or a bench trial. Okay, can Representative Evangelos, can you shed any light on that for us? Yes, uh, <clears throat> Mr. McKee had uh, told us that it would just be a very small pool of people that would be eligible for relief under this because obviously if you pled guilty, um, you're not gonna make a post-conviction plea for innocence, you, you pled guilty. Um, so uh, that information came from attorney McKee uh, representing uh, the main Criminal Defense Lawyers Association. He is here. Okay. Let's, I'm, I'm gonna bring him over because I do feel like this is, this is such an both urgent and important matter that, and I would May like us to get- another thing briefly? Yes, the reason why this committee waited uh, two years is because, um, you know, we were promised a stakeholder group that was going to weigh on this, and it never happened, and it frustrated the progress on the bill. So, if you think I'm, uh, I want to um, finish up on this today, uh, I have good, I have good grounds for that. Um, Madam Chair, this was two years that potentially innocent people sat in prison. Uh, because of a delay uh, in the committee. Um, so that's why I, I think it's time to vote. And Mr. McKee is here, so let's hear from him. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm just joining in. I, uh, you all moved very quickly in some of your previous bills. So I caught the last bit of the question, which is, can a person um, who has pled guilty in the, um, be, uh, bring a post-conviction review just in the general process, so separate from this bill? Um, first of all, exceedingly rare, right? You pled guilty, so you're kind of done. But there are, you know, to, to be frank, there are situations where a person could do that um, because of uh, information um, or details or whatever that their attorney did not provide to them. And they pled guilty under, you know, some idea that, you know, that they were guilty, but in fact, there was other information that their attorney, failing in their representation, uh, did not give to them. And so in that situation, they say, well, geez, I didn't know, but there was another eyewitness who said that this never happened, you know, I want to be able to challenge my attorney because they really didn't do a very good job if I'd known that and never would have pled guilty. And in that situation, they would, you know, try the case and potentially be found innocent. So there's that piece. But having been involved in post convictions 28 years now, um, those are not the cases we see. We see it's after trial. Um, so or after some sort of a preliminary proceeding where they say that mistakes were made by the attorney. So I do agree, very narrow class of cases. Um, but there is that rare exception uh, where that, uh, in fact, could happen. So there's no, there's no legal reason why you would be precluded if you had pled guilty. Right. So there are, correct, there are circumstances where that can happen. Great. That's, thank you. That's really helpful to um, helping us hone in on a, a path forward here. Thank you. Um, Representative Babbage, is, did you have another question or is that a residual hand? No, I do not, ma'am. Okay, Thanks. Representative Thorne, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. McGee, uh, is it possible that if this were to pass, that even though the 
there haven't been that many at this point that this would change and that there'd be some some more Hail Marys, if you will. I mean, if I'm sitting in jail and I got nothing to lose and somebody finds something, I'm going to file on this in an attempt to get out of it. Is that, do you see that as a possibility? Well, not, I mean, the bill is drafted, talks about the bringing forward of new evidence. So we're talking about new trials based on newly discovered evidence and the, and the bar to that is the bill is now. So you're still gonna to have to be able to come up with that new evidence in the first place. So the time bar, the biggest concern, which is, you know, you can't do it because you just, you know, it was, it was a, little, a little bit too late, um, would be eliminated. In theory, there always could be those, but um, I've found that as, as these statutes have changed and um, over the years, that there really hasn't been a change in the basic number of cases. Um, lawyers are, are challenged for their work in cases, new, tr new evidence is presented in cases at basically the same rate, uh, regardless of what the changes that have been made. And there are fairly a small number of cases in the first place. So a change in the time that you could, um, it will affect some cases uh, because there will be the opportunity to bring forward new evidence. Uh, the, case, the, the time bar would be, have been removed. Um, but I'm not anticipating a significant number of cases, but people can file anything at any time for any reason. And I think that the additional piece of information here that was important to the amendment, I think helps that, which is the judge is gonna have a little review process before, like, okay, you say you have new evidence, well, well what actually is it? Um, and I think that'll be helpful in the process and weeding out um, uh, the Hail Marys, if you will, or to continue the analogy, uh, tackling the quarterback before they get to throw the long pass. That's what I wanted to clarify with you is that this wouldn't open up the floodgates as it were, and and open up a significant number of cases that found something to go back on any more than there currently is. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kime. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I feel like we're getting conflicting information about, web, about who can um, who can apply for these? So I, I wonder if you could help me understand that a little bit better, Attorney McKee. I, I think, um, you know, the Mr. Maycumbers in, in the attendee list and um, added to the chat, which I know we're not supposed to do that, but um, yeah, saying that, you know, if someone pleads to murder that they can, you know, go go after this to try to prove innocence, which, I mean, we don't want guilty people in jail. We, and none of us do. Um, but there are going to be those people that have very thin or, you know, evidence that's, that they're suggesting. And for them to tie up resources, because that's a reality of life, resources are always limited. We need to make sure they're being applied appropriately. And, um, but what, but I'm confused. So I'm confused about who can apply for this. It's, you know, according to Representative Evangelos, it seems like a very narrow, um, this applies to a very narrow amount of people. And then I'm hearing other people say, no, it's fairly broad. So can you help me understand? Uh, I am worried yeah. about floodgates. No, I think you're, I think you're right. Whenever you have a change like that, you're concerned people, you know, there are people, the bad apples that will do that and, and unfortunately ruin it for the others who have legitimate claims. But I think the language of the change really focuses in on that because as it talks about, you have to have newly discovered evidence. Um, and that's what you really have to have something, something new. Um, and so, uh, I suppose anybody can create something that they call new out of whole cloth. But I think the idea here is that if new evidence comes to light, um, it's going to affect the case. Those are the kind of cases that you would want to have come forward. So I don't see the floodgates opening anymore by changing the, first of all, the floodgates as they are now, I mean, you, somebody could file one for, you know, allegedly newly discovered evidence as it stands now based on the old standard, uh, where it could have been discovered uh, through the exercise of due diligence. So you, you already had that in the first place. I think removing the time bar allows, allows that opportunity and uh, allows that actual piece of newly discovered evidence to come to bear. So I don't know. Um, I, I think it's anyone's guess, but I just don't see this, uh, the statute as it's written now, opening up those floodgates that, that folks are worried about. Um, I, I can't tell you much more than that. 
And I think the language of the statute or the, the, the excuse me, the bill uh, helps in that regard. And, and so just to clarify, you're saying that the amendment, the most recent amendment that I proposed, you would agree with? Is that the one that talks about the requirement that the petitioner provide additional information about the nature? Um, let me read it to you. I... Sure. Not quite. Does someone have it right in front of them? I want to read. I, 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 I want to make sure I'm reading it specifically. And I don't, I've got too many I papers do, in front I of me. I can do that. I can do Thank that. You. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, the, the new language reads, uh, following the sentence that you just started to read, the court may summarily dismiss the petition if it determines that the petitioner has not made a prima facie showing that the new evidence was material and would have affected the jury's verdict. Well, um, I need to think about that. That's a that's a pretty major impediment in and of itself. Um, I think the court is going to to do that as part of its analysis. I'm just wondering whether that should be part of uh, basically a complete yes or no at the very start without the opportunity for a full hearing. So you present the evidence saying, you know, I have this um, uh, new eyewitness and this person's going to say X, Y, and Z. I'm concerned about whether a judge should, based on just that initial showing, um, say, well, that's not enough and it wouldn't have changed. I think it's important to have a broader hearing, especially when it comes to newly discovered evidence. So I hadn't heard the amendment before. Thank you for letting me know. Um, but I think it may be more restrictive um, and ultimately unnecessary, given the number of claims that are involved here. But I appreciate knowing about it. Um, at this point, committee members, I, I feel like we are, um, we're working really hard to try to address this. I would like to do um, one thing, which is to ask um, Mr. Maycomber to, to weigh in on, uh, actually, yes, because Senator Keim did ask him a question and in um, I would like for him to answer the question so that all members of the committee can hear the answer to the question. And then I do think we should move on to a vote. Um, Mr. Maycomber, can you activate your audio and video? Madam Chair, I have a point of order. I mean, he's a prosecutor for the Attorney General's office and he's been functioning, uh, trying to influence on us over the chat function. It's totally inappropriate, and especially somebody uh, of his profession and his position. That is just totally inappropriate. And, we've, and we brought Stephanie Anderson, another prosecutor in, former prosecutor, um, this isn't a public hearing. Yeah, we also heard from um, Attorney McKee, and so I'm just... Um, right. Attorney McKee uh, testified on the bill and was the expert witness for the bill, um, but I'm just... Uh, go ahead, it's fine. The, the narrow question, Mr. Maycomber, is... Um, well... Actually, could you please respond to the question that um, Senator Kime asked you through the chat? Let's she just. He's going to have to refresh my recollection. And if I violated some protocol by putting in the chat, I wasn't aware that there was a protocol because there was a chat. So I just assumed that it was okay to chat. Yeah, we we can't disable the chat, but it's not part of the official legislative record. So let's just quickly wrap this up and then decide where we're going on the bill. So Go ahead, what, Senator Kime. Senator Kime, can you repeat your question, please? Clarify, I didn't ask a question in the chat. I simply read your chat. And yes, there is no way for people attending to know, uh, to know that the chat is only to be used um, for technical issues. So no worries there. Um, I, but I, but you, since you're here, I would just ask you what we were trying, what has confused me is uh, Representative Evangelos stated that only people who claimed innocence would be able to use this process. And then uh, Attorney McKee said, "Well, it's more than that, um, but it's but it's rare." So I have difficulty reconciling those uh, two things with what you know um, other people are telling me that it's actually maybe more likely to open floodgates. So could you just offer me your perspective on that? Um, well, just in regard to the simple question about. Can people that plead guilty utilize the post-conviction review process? The answer to that is definitively yes. And I've had dozens of cases in where they've done that. Uh, and 
in fact, in, in almost half or more of our murder cases, within a year of them pleading guilty, they file a post-conviction. Once they get to prison, they realize that they don't like it. Uh, but uh, in terms of the uh, what you just asked, um, I think you've actually answered the question that yes, people who who plead guilty can file the post conviction review. Okay, that's not Does the question I thought it, she just asked. But. Does that answer your question, Senator Kime? Yeah, I, I think it does. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, what I'm going to do is um, recognize um, my co-chair who had his hand raised, and then and I'm going to excuse everybody who is not a member of the committee from the panel so that we can make our committee decision. Go ahead, Tom. Um, thank you, Senator Carney, and. I don't want to pr prolong this. This is the language, and I know that what we did in the 129th does not dictate what we do today. Um, the, the sentence, the court may require the petitioner to provide additional information about the nature of the newly discovered evidence. And I guess the question we have to answer for ourselves is, does that allow the court does that provide enough guidance for the court to say, no, there is not newly discovered evidence and end the process? Um, I came to the conclusion two years ago that it did. Um, there's a clearly disagreement on the committee about that. Um, I do think the addition of the language that Senator Kime has uh, proposed does make this a, a different statute. Um, I too would like to get to yes and would love a stronger report coming out of this committee. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that's going to happen today. I mean, the, the, there, there is a motion on the table um, with a second and, you know, it's a risk that the sponsor takes by, you know, take, forcing the vote today if, if he chooses to do so. Uh, and well, what I think I would do is really has no bearing on on this and i may disagree but that's that's not my call that's his call um i'm not yeah. thank you representative Barnett. um i see um three hands up representative evangelos is your hand up from before or do you have something um new to add I just wanted to clarify for Senator Kime, <clears throat> and I stand corrected on a small point that my recollection from the <clears throat> testimonies I've heard in the past, both last session and this session, that it would be uh, extremely rare and um, um, because a person had pled innocent and you have to have newly uh, you know, discoverable evidence to move forward. But obviously I, I stand corrected on, on a few of those cases. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, but I don't think it's something we need to get hung up on. Um, it's not going to be a lot of the cases and the bill's language gives the judges the full discretion. Um, so uh, I just wanted to get that on the record. Um, the judge has the discretion. We wrote it into the bill and uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to weaken uh, the bill any further. I started out with a five page bill from the Innocence Project and I'm down to one paragraph. So, um, and I've waited two years because of guarantees that were made to this committee that weren't honored. So yes, I, I want to pursue, but that's what I have to say. Thank you so much. And Senator Kime and then Representative Babbage and then we'll, we'll vote. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if we're going to vote on this, uh, we, will require, we will need a corner caucus. And mm -hmm. um, I just want to assure Representative Evangelos that um, I think the committee all agrees this is important and that we need to move forward and there are new members and they are being brought up to speed and there are questions obviously um, that have changed our discussion as we move along and so I think patience with committee members is really beneficial when um, I think we're all pulling in the same direction and the difference of someone having to have maintained their innocence the whole time versus having claimed uh 
uh, you know, pled guilty, that's probably a significant change in population, like a percentage. So it, it doesn't change my opinion that we need to move forward with this, but it, it is a significant change in the population of people that we're discussing. So I, I think it was significant information to uncover at this later date. So thank you. And yes, I request a corner caucus before we vote. Thank you. Madam thank Chair. you very much, Senator Kime. I'm, I'm uh, just a, I just a moment. Representative Babbage, you were next. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, you know, regarding the pleading guilty, I, 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 I don't know, but I can imagine an attorney coming to me and saying, listen, the evidence is really against you and this does not look good. You're gonna spend time in jail. You're gonna spend less time in jail if you plead guilty. Um, I, I don't know how many people would take that and, and, um, and, and therefore, have a, a plea on their record, um, but that would be a consideration. Um, I, I wanted to ask if, if Senator Kimes' amendment, what struck me about it and would have affected the jury's verdict requires um, a higher degree of determination to me that is too much for a preliminary decision um uh and 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 however um I, I just wanted to ask is there any uh comfort uh that would help to bring more people onto a majority report or a unanimous report if we included the sentence without the that final phrase the court may summarily dismiss the petition if it determines that the petitioner has not made a prima facie showing that the new evidence was material. Is, is that helpful or is that meaningless or how, how do you feel about that? Uh, anyway, I'm just looking for a way to, us yeah. to feel good about this. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Babbage. I think at this point it'll be, let's do a corner caucus um, and a Senator, and we can discuss that in our respective corner caucuses. Senator Keim, how much time would you like for the corner caucus? Uh, just five minutes. Okay, so we'll come back at uh, 3.56. Madam Chair. Thank you, everyone. Madam Chair, I have a commitment at four o'clock. It's ironclad, and that was made clear to the chairs several hours ago. So I don't want to be in the position of not being able to vote on my own bill. We absolutely, and we are rushing to meet that deadline and um, we will be back at 3.56 and we will vote when we return. Okay. Thank you.
All right, it looks like we are um, returning from our corner caucuses, if that is the plural of caucus. I don't know, I never took Latin. Um, committee members, are we ready for the vote? Yes. Oop, hang on a second. I think I think Senator Babbage is I mean Representative Babbage is lost in cyberspace, but I think that he'll be with us momentarily. Um, committee members, are we ready for the vote? And this is did somebody say something? I just said I am. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the ought to pass yeah. made by Representative Evangelos and seconded. Um, by, I believe, Representative Babbage. My notes aren't that great. Who seconded um, Representative Evangelos? It was Babbage. Okay, great. All right. Um, Ms. Panette, we are ready when you are. Madam Chair, I need to send a link to um, our, your co-chair. So I can't, I can't call the roll and send a link. Oh, can I, I, I can do that. Can I have one minute? Yeah, no, you can have a, you can absolutely, Soupy, go ahead. Sorry, thank you. No, that's fine. It's not like we're going anywhere. <laughs> well, Jeff is, that's the problem. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to wait till he joins or call him, get him in the absentee? Let's get him in the absentees. I think I found oh, here he is. All right, let's go. Oh, my apologies. I was talking to Mr. Chair. Uh, it's my is. fault. It's my fault. That's all Ready? right. Call the roll. Okay. Go, go for it. Thank you very much. Senator Carney. Mm -hmm. Yes. Senator Carney votes yes. Senator Sanborn. Yes. Senator Sanborn votes yes. Senator Kime? No. Senator Kime votes no. Representative Harnett? Yes. Representative Harnett votes yes. Representative Babbage? Yes. Representative Babbage votes yes. Representative Galgay Reckett? Yes. Representative Galgay Reckett votes yes. Representative Moriarty? Yes. Representative Moriarty votes yes. Representative Sheehan? Yes. Representative Sheehan votes yes. Representative Hagan? No. Representative Hagan votes no. Representative Libby? No. Representative Libby votes no. Representative Poirier? No. Representative Poirier votes no. Representative Thorne? Nay. Representative Thorne votes no. Representative Evangelos? Yes. Representative Evangelos votes yes. Representative Newell? I'll call the absentees. Representative Newell. Representative Newell is absent. Madam Chair, I have eight members voting in the affirmative, five members voting in the negative, and one member is absent. Thank you very much, Ms. Panette. So the, um, what is the, the, re the report of those voting no on the motion? Mine is ought to pass as amended. And uh, I would ask that if there are other members who are joining that, that they speak up and say so. I am also as amended. I am as well. As amended. Thank you very much. 
I think that cap that's everybody. No, Rep uh, Representative no. Hagan. Representative Hagan. I said no. Um, no. So you're just ought not to pass. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So I have four that are ought to pass as amended. Does that sound right? Okay, thank you very much. All right, and so the motion ought to pass carries eight um, with four ought to pass as amended, one ought not to pass and one absent. And with that, we'll close the um, work session on LD 54. And um, Representative Evangelos, we know that you need to leave. And so um, we will, uh, is there a motion to table LD 1273? So moved. So I'll move. Um, moved, by okay. moved by Representative Moriarty, seconded by Representative Harnett. So uh, 1273 is tabled. And uh, Representative Evangelos, thank you very much for all of your hard work on LD54. Thank you. Sorry, I have to run, <clears throat> but um, Lisa yes. and I are on a panel and I'm still in Augusta, so I got to get home and get ready for it. Thank you. Thank you. So, see you tomorrow morning at nine, right? All right. Yep. Bye bye, everybody. Good night, Jeff. Good night, Representative Evangelos. Jeff's fine. <laughs> okay, so we have a, a motion to table um, 1273, and we have not taken a vote on that yet. Could you just raise your electronic hands if you're in favor of the tabling motion, everyone? And it looks like everyone like that is unanimous. Thank you very much, committee members. And uh, we will see you tomorrow, Representative Evangelos. Thank you. And um, lower our hands. And so that closes the uh, work session on 1273. And we'll open our work session on LD 957, an act to reform alternative sentencing programs. And um, let's see, Peggy, would you like to give us the bill analysis on um, LD957? Sure. So the, the purpose of the bill is to amend the um, deferred disposition process and allow um, a requirement that the person complete an alternative sentencing program. The idea is that you can use... A, um, a, a deferred disposition means that the, um, the person actually pleads guilty, um, but the disposition is stopped. The district attorney says, we're just going to kind of hold this in abeyance. And um, sometimes there are, are conditions, things that the um, defendant would have to complete or um, show that they they learned their lesson and it's usually a period of time it's usually a year and if the defendant has um complied with those requirements um i mean it, it's an agreement and if the defendant com, uh, uh, agrees to uh, complies with the agreement at the end of that term usually a year um the charges can be dropped um and so what the purpose of this is is to make use of that time while the, the disposition is deferred and um, um, allow the defendant to be involved in community service projects, um, education projects, and, um, and they think that would be a, a great use of that time. Um, I, I think the concern that was raised by CLAC is that this is implying um, an alternative sentencing, sentencing program um, to take effect before the person has actually has a conviction and has been sentenced. So um, the idea is great, but maybe this is not the way to do it because you're actually asking somebody to participate in an alternative sentencing program when they don't have a conviction. And in fact, they might not end up with a conviction. Um, so 
I mean, the idea is to get them involved in programs and, and do beneficial things. There is a fee to this program as identified by um, folks who want to run these programs, um, but I'm not sure it can actually happen the way it's drafted. Thank you. Um, committee members, are there questions for Peggy? Go ahead, Representative Reckett. Well, it's not a question, so, but I would like to speak. Go ahead. I just think this bill has too many problems um, that we have not solved and no one has solved. And so I think it would be premature to do such a thing. And so I would like to move ought not to pass. There is an ought not to pass motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Senator Kime. And um, thank you for the motion and the second. The bill sponsor is here. And um, as a courtesy, I am going to bring her on to the panel. Um, Welcome, Senator Maxman. Um, we I, did. Did you hear our concerns? The concerns of the analyst and the committee members regarding the bill. I just heard um, the end of it, but I, I was, um, I was going to mention that the folks that I've been working with at the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office have talked with CLAC, and I believe they came up with amendment language. And I'm wondering if, before you vote on the motion, uh, uh, Deputy Maker could come in and talk to you a little bit about that conversation. Um, District Attorney Natasha Irving is also in the waiting room, who's also been involved with those conversations. Do you do you know if there they have specific um, a written? amendment that they can share with us today? I, um, I believe that Deputy Maker does. He talked with CLAC this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, one other question, Senator Maxman, has, has the amendment been shared um, with anybody on the committee at this point? It took us a while to get in touch with CLAC, um, and so the conversation happened recently, and I've been in meetings all day, so it's been, uh, I haven't been able to connect with it, but I, I trust him, and um, I respect the committee's wishes, but would just want to give him space to talk about it, if that's okay. okay thank you. Thank um, you. And so at this point, and you suggested that it was uh, Chief Deputy Maker who has the, uh, the amendment? Yes, he, he spoke with Clack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chief Deputy Maker. We understand that you've been working on an amendment to um, LD 957. Yes, um, myself and uh, DA Irving have been talking with CLAC uh, and I'm just trying to uh, find the language here. I, I mean, I can email this language that uh, actually was sent to me by from CLAC and we made one uh, suggestion and he agreed to it. Um, but the CLAC's, CLAC's uh, really hang up was the fact that we were calling it alternate sentencing program and uh, where in their thoughts they weren't sentenced. So he came up with some language that uh, really describes the program and gives the, um, the, the uh, um, judge some uh, leeway to place them in, in this program. So I don't know how you want to, to, to handle that. Let's see, Peggy, is it okay if he emails the amendment language to you? Okay. So can, can you have um, him email the amendment? So this is uh, John Pelletier, is that who you said who has the amendment language? Yes, yes Mr. Pelletier. Um, had the language and I'm or, or do you see, see if yeah. 
made any uh, amendments to it. Um, I think yeah. it, whoever can most efficiently get it to Peggy, and then she can screen share it so that committee members can consider it. That would be really helpful. Thank you. I have it Elsa right here. Sent it to me. I have it. Um, I have it, and I can screen share this. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, John. Okay, let's make this a little bit bigger. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, this looks like the change in the language is the new language that was being added. Oops. Um, so the underlying language. Um, did you want to speak to this, Chief Deputy Maker? Only that, that as far as I'm concerned, it, it'll allow us to accept um, the, these deferred dispositions within our program and uh, Mr. Pelletier seems comfortable um, that the language doesn't infer that they are sentenced at that time. So it, it'll work for us if it'll work for CLAC. So can I just ask a question? Does the court actually impose the deferment requirements or is that something that's imposed by the, the um, prosecutor? Well, it's, it's usually a, a deferred disposition is usually an agreed upon um, requirement between the prosecutor, the defense and the, the judge, but the judge is the one who actually has to set the um, conditions. Okay. In the statute, he, he or she is, is the person who has to set those requirements. Okay, thank you. I do see, I do see one thing in the version that, that we're looking at here that I had talked with Mr. Pelletier and he he agreed it would it had some benefits. Um, in the version you're looking at here, um, myself and DA Irving had spoke about um, where it says that the days in a program run by a county sheriff that in, that that and we wanted to add may involve overnight housing, just the word may, um, because it allows that language will allow a lot more flexibility. Um, to maybe even the potential for uh, locally here, we've talked about a deferred disposition. We may be able to run um, a even a day uh, reporting event for some of these programs instead of ha requiring uh, the uh, those on, on the program to attend the whole weekend. It really may be up to them. Thank you very much, Chief Deputy Maker um, and Peggy. Um, Thank you for, for the questions that you've been asking. I think they've helped us um, understand the amendment a little bit more. Let's end the screen sharing just so that um, we can, the committee can see each other. And I'm just gonna, um, Mr. Pelletier has his hand raised and we're gonna bring him in and ask him. I sense that he wants to share something additional with us about the amendment. Mr. Pelletier, can you activate your audio and video when you're able to? Yes, Welcome. thank you, Chair Carney, thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, 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 answer Peggy's question. The, the statute does talk in terms of the court imposing requirements. It says the court may order sentencing deferred to a date certain and impose requirements. So what the amendment does is the new language that was, it would replace the bill and the new language that was in the bill is no longer there. And what's underlined is the suggested new language. And it, it, it removes the reference to sentence or sentencing program uh, and, and is appropriate language for deferred disposition. And I do wanna point out that 
this is, I was consulted, I am not CLAC. Uh, when I talk on behalf of CLAC, I'm talking on behalf of a group of folks, uh, but this was a suggestion that I was asked for and that I came up with. And then in the second paragraph, um, uh, it, the, uh, the statute allows the jail to operate programs where inmates participate in public works. And it sort of adds that in addition to an inmate, it makes clear that the people on deferred dispositions are not inmates. In addition to inmates, it says uh, certain inmates of that jail, as well as other people required to do so pursuant to the deferred disposition statute. So I, that this language appears to address the concerns that the members of the group had, in my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Pelletier. Um, committee members, I see a number of hands up. Um, Representative Babbage, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't have that amendment in front of me again, but I just wanted to, my concerns with the original bill uh, was that a guilty plea was required and that the fee issue kind of discriminated against those without funds. Uh, are either one of those addressed by this, Mr. Pelletier? Uh, no, deferred disposition requires a plea up front, although in many cases the plea is withdrawn at the end and the matter is dismissed. Uh, and the matter of a fee is not addressed in the statute in, in, in the proposal in, in any way. So that's, that's, that would be a, a, an issue for the entity running the program. So the amendment doesn't address that. Thank, thank you for the question and thank you for the answer. Representative Reckett. Oh, uh, Representative Reckett, we're not able to hear you. I'm willing to withdraw my ought not to pass motion, but, uh, but I'm still not in favor of this. Um, uh, it just feels like a, a chain gang for which you have to pay. It just really just doesn't feel right to me. I, I don't I don't know what I'm saying exactly because I'm so blessed tired. But the reality is, uh, it just there's something. I don't know. There's something just doesn't fit for me. So, but I'd be happy to withdraw my ought not to pass motion so that you can proceed in a whatever the logical fashion you think is. Thank you, Representative Reckett. So we'll we'll um, take a step back. The the ought not to pass is withdrawn, and we are continuing um, questions related to the sponsor's proposed amendment. Senator Kime, go ahead. I believe I seconded Representative Reckett's motion, so I will also withdraw that. Thank you. Um, and my my question for the chief deputy is. Would this apply to people who have not been sentenced and who, who are in pretrial detention? No, no. It, it it's really uh, what we're what we're what we're designing this is is for those who are in deferred dispositions who have this requirement to to, uh, to complete the community service and possibly get some education as well. I can speak more to the funding part if you want, because we, we have discussed that issue here locally. Right, that was gonna be my my follow-up actually, is if, I mean, I I actually have no issue with, with a fee as long as there's a way that it would be waived, but of course the, the program is gonna be expensive and I'm a firm believer in having skin in the game for people. So I just, I was hoping you would talk about if you, if the law, if this amendment doesn't prescribe um, a fee, but then you have the ability to work a system in however you see fit in your agency, but then would that, would each agency, uh, would each department be allowed to choose their own pathway sort of with that? So if you could answer that, that would be helpful. I don't, I don't believe with any clear, clear legislative guidance, I think each program would have to run by its by whatever standards it wants to run. But I can tell you locally here, first of all, P 
people who are on deferred dis dispositions uh, generally are paying a fee every month anyway. Um, and that's anywhere commonly $25, but I think the statute actually authorizes up to $50 a month. I can tell you locally here, um, we've had these discussions with DA um, Irving um, about um, diverting those funds that are going normally to her office and possibly even using um, those funds um, for anybody that is determined to be indigent. We, we, for, I can guarantee you this, the, the, the program doesn't make money now. Uh, um, and if my county commissioners heard that, they probably wouldn't like that, but it, it doesn't make money now. Um, um, but, uh, and this isn't about making money. Um, and if, if somebody um, can't afford the program, um, again, DA Irving has funds to pay for the, those, those uh, indigent people. So the, the money issue, we again, locally, we, we've worked that out here. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Deputy Maker, I just wanna ask you a clarifying question. So, so the people we're talking about are people who have entered a guilty plea and then they're going to serve this deferred disposition with the hope that at the end of the time frame that their guilty plea would then go away. Is that right? Well, it, each, each deferred disposition is handled differently. In some cases, that's exactly what happens. At the end of the, end of the one year period, it goes away. Most commonly, usually it, it may be the difference between jail time and a fine. It may be the difference between a felony conviction versus a misdemeanor conviction. Um, you know, so, so there usually is a change at the end of the year for a positive, you know, as we call a positive outcome. So um, it, it often doesn't go away, but it usually is either results in a fine or somebody who's been charged with a more serious crime ends up with a misdemeanor conviction. And do you feel that the newly proposed language will facilitate more positive outcomes through the deferred disposition program? I'm thinking that those people that are in those deferred programs are may, may be struggling to, commute, to commit some of the community service that they may be required to do. And the DA's office may be struggling to, to use that as in a sentencing option because it, it's hard to find places for them to do it on their own. But it also puts them into the programming portion of it, uh, where again, substance use disorder, decision-making skills, restorative justice is all part of the um, you know, training. I wish I, we're, we're doing a program literally this week. I should have invited every one of you up there to visit, so. Thank you for, for that information. Representative Hagan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, could you explain what you, what, how, uh, you meant by uh, like a more serious crime uh, down to a misdemeanor? Would that be what kind of, I'm assuming felony, and what kind of felonies would be reduced to a misdemeanor upon this kind of community service? And what kind of community service would take a felony down to a misdemeanor? That's generally not my business. That's handled within the DA's office. So, um, but I mean, it, it might be a felony assault to a misdemeanor assault. Could be a felony drug charge to a misdemeanor drug charge, that kind of stuff. Um, and I think it, the, the, this sentence is more than just about the community service. I think it's an opportunity for that individual to prove to the court and, and the district attorney's office that whatever happened was a real... Um, not an everyday event and that they can prove for a year period they can be a good citizen um, and thus not end up with a, you know, a felony conviction or even have to do jail time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Committee members, are there additional um, questions for the bill sponsor related to the proposed amendment? I'm not seeing any. Are there any additional questions for Mr. Pelletier or Chief Deputy Maker? Okay, I am, I'll go ahead, Senator Kime.
All right. Actually, a question for Mr. Pelletier. I wonder, Mr. Pelletier, if you're familiar with the deferred dispositions that happen in Cumberland County and how this system here or how this program would compare to that, if you know. Uh, no, I don't. I'm not familiar with a particular deferred disposition program in Cumberland County. Thank you. Uh, Representative Babbage? Uh, you know, pardon my ignorance, and I am a little fuzzy this afternoon, I think, anyway. But um, I, I, if uh, Deputy Maker could help me with um, understanding uh, uh, how, how, how long might a person be in, in county jail in a, in a pretrial um, status. And, um, and with this uh, program in some way influence whether or not they would plead guilty. I don't don't know if I can answer that question, sir. I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, I I think what we clarified, Chris, uh, Representative Babbage, is that this is not the pretrial detainee situation that I think we originally maybe thought it was. That it's really about um, the deferred disposition group of people. Is that right, Senator Maxman? Yes, I believe so. Um, yeah. Yeah, so people who might enter a plea and then have um, a period of community service and I think some of the other services that Chief Deputy Maker referred to as like um, counseling and substance use uh, disorder treatment and that sort of thing with the, the hope that uh, their sentence might be uh, reduced at the end of the one year period. So it's not the pretrial situation. Well, you understand my question was that given the opportunity here, might a, and, and I guess it can't be answered, m might a plea be entered that would not otherwise be, be entered? That's. Uh, John, Mr. Pelletier, go ahead. Uh, it, it, I could take a stab at that. I think, I think that the people who are charged with very serious crimes and are long-term pretrial detainees are unlikely to uh, are unlikely to enter a guilt uh, to be uh, accorded a deferred disposition. So that group is probably unlikely to be affected by this. There are some people who have relatively minor things and uh, spend a few days in jail before they go to court and an early agreement is reached to put them on a deferred disposition. But the, the incentive to plead guilty, it, to the extent that's a problem for someone who is, finds themselves in jail, is no more or no less with this proposed sentencing alternative than any other plea bargain sweetener that the prosecutor might off, offer. You know, it's just, it's just part, part of the negotiation. And to the extent that a, 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 a favorable plea offer uh, encourages people detained to, to plead guilty, this is this this is, is is neither here nor there on that point. It's just it's just that's just the practical reality. But my main point is that the the long term people who find themselves in jail and can't get out are not the group of people who are getting deferred dispositions. So can I ask, may I follow up, Madam Chair? I just want to ask, so Mr. Pelletier, given this new amendment, you're withdrawing your testimony in opposition? Well, I, I, again, I can't speak for the group. What I'm saying is the, 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 what, what our group objected to was the implication that people were sentenced or participating in a sentence sentence program because on deferred disposition you're not sentenced and you're yet to be sentenced but my personal view is that the opportunity to participate in a program like this uh, might well be a welcome thing for uh 
people because during the year of the deferred disposition, they're not in jail. And if they're incentivized to behave well, then that, that, that you know, that's a good thing. That's why the legislature created deferred dispositions and uh, the more options, the better. That's my personal view. The group's objection was that it suggested that you were uh, conflating a deferred disposition with a sentence and that the new language, the proposed language solves that discrete problem. Thank you, Mr. Pelletier. Um, committee members, let's, let's ask our final questions and then I'm gonna excuse the panelists so that we as a committee can move forward with this bill. Um, I see Re uh, Representative Moriarty has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to confirm with the sponsor, Senator Maxman, that she is on board with the new language and which uh, Peggy shared with us. I am, I am on board with the new language. And um, if I may, Madam Chair, I think Natasha Irving, the DA would be really helpful to clarify some of the concerns and questions if it's okay to bring her in quickly. Yeah, I will bring her in. Um, uh, Representative Hagen, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Real quick one uh, from Mr. Pelletier. So you had mentioned that uh, maybe a more serious felony more than likely would not receive a deferred di disposition. So uh, more serious felony, uh, felon, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Uh, felony um, could get that. Is that what you're saying under this bill? Uh, no. Nope. Uh, felt, uh, deferred dispositions are not available for class A or class B crimes. And uh, class C crimes are often, for example, a third offense assault is a class C if you have two prior convictions, even if other, the conduct would be misdemeanor conduct. So that's the kind of case where you would get a felony drop down to a misdemeanor uh, based on good behavior, based on doing a year deferred disposition where you show no further untoward conduct. Um, you know, and so it's only available for class C, which is the lowest level of felony. And of course the DAs are part of this agreement. So to some extent they regulate it to ensure that it applies to appropriate cases and not cases that are more serious than should be treated in this fashion. I appreciate that. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Senator Kaim, I know you have your hand up. We were just joined by Ms. Irving and I would really like um, her to provide the comments that the bill sponsor suggested and then I'll call on you. Is that okay with you? Yes, but my question was for Mr. Pelletier. Okay, I will not dismiss him yet. Um, uh, Ms. Irving, go ahead. Thank you um, and uh, just the uh, I have a six-year-old in the other room that hopefully will not uh, be making an appearance uh, while we're here. So I wanted to just um, answer a few of the questions that came up that I think would be helpful. Um, but first I'll just give a really quick overview of why from my perspective and my staff's perspective, this is an important bill. Um, so right now we have the opportunity to, to offer deferred dispositions on anything up to a class C um, felony. And, and we do enter into a lot of these. Now, some folks, um, a good outcome may result in a jail sentence. Um, it may result in a in a long, you know, a, a less lengthy sentence than it would have resulted in. Um, it could result in a you know, really in a, anything from a jail sentence to probation to um, fines to a dismissal. Um, the reason this seems really important to us is that we have a lot of folks who would really benefit from this programming. Um, that are not going to benefit from going to jail. So right now, um, you know, we don't want to have the good outcome be seven days in jail. Um, uh, we want it. We want these folks to be able to go take care of this, uh, to engage in this uh, programming that really helps them stop the criminal behavior. Um, now, some folks, uh, and this is where this the crux of this is we want this to end in a complete dismissal, right? It could be a first time theft um, charge. It could be um, a first time drug possession charge. And we have somebody that's maybe a young person, um, just somebody that really doesn't need to have a criminal record, 
But if we don't get a conviction, we can't get a sentence. And if we can't get a sentence, we can't send them to alternative sentencing program where they can take advantage of uh, substance use disorder treatment. They can do community service work, making you, giving you more connections with the community. So this would make it so we can send folks to go do that community service to get that really, uh, that programming that's gonna help get them out of the criminal world and be part of a community um, without creating a criminal record. Now for everything else, if they're gonna be sentenced at the end, right? If it's gonna be the, you know, a good outcome is gonna result in a, um, in a um, conviction, then, we, then this isn't a problem. So these are usually to, to kind of answer um, Representative Hagan's questions. These are gonna be really your lowest level um, where we really just wanna avoid a conviction at the end because of all the collateral consequences I'm sure you've heard about in a lot of the bills that have come forward. As far as the funding goes, we do have a funding source. We charge um, folks that can afford it a fee. Those are folks that are not considered to be indigent we can we we do anything from ten dollars a month to fifty dollars a month based on uh, some criteria that we have, and that has padded up an amount of money that we can use to offset the cost of alternative sentencing for folks who are indigent and can't pay for it. But as Senator Kime said, sometimes having some skin in the game is really important. So we use the court's um, uh, analysis of whether someone's indigent. And, and without that analysis um, of uh, screening of whether someone's indigent, then it wouldn't even be a considered a jail case, um, a potential jail case, right? So if it's not even considered a potential jail case, then they wouldn't be looking at an alternative sentencing program um, issue. So I hope that um, that, that uh, answers a lot of those questions. And the last question, I think that, uh, is it Representative or Senator Babbage? I'm sorry. Um, uh, Representative uh, Babbage, but just you can just go ahead with the answer. Yeah, and that was um, whether this might, you know, uh, kind of, I don't know if it was whether there's a concern that this would have people change a plea. I mean, I, I think to tell you the truth in this situation, um, really we're looking at folks that are going to, in a good outcome, uh, not have a criminal conviction at the end. That's the point of amending um, this statute in this way. Thank you, that was super helpful. Uh, Senator Prime, go ahead. Thank you, and uh, thank you for being here, DA Irving. So, so do you already run a deferred disposition program out of the DA's office? Yeah, so deferred dispositions are in statute and we routinely offer these to get folks um, into treatment. I mean, I would say that's a bit, to get folks into treatment, to uh, de defer folks into restorative justice programming um, that's been really helpful to get um, restitution paid. Um, it's a real victim-centered process. So we we use it routinely. We use it quite a bit. Um, yeah, every day. So, okay. So then, and those people are being supervised, right, to make sure that they're in compliance with whatever conditions there are? Sort of. Um, I would say that's... Uh, that's uh, probably a strong way to put that. Um, they have bail conditions, um, typically, throughout the deferment, and they could have a, depending on what the bail conditions were, they might not be able to be in possession of alcohol or drugs, not have contact with somebody or be at some certain place. Um, so there's those things. There's also the requirements, the affirmative requirements, right? Like treatment, could be mental health treatment, med compliance. We don't, we don't, um, check up on folks during the deferment because we actually can't, well, we, can, we, can't, can, we can't talk to anyone that's represented by an attorney. We do check in with attorneys to see if folks are in compliance, um, uh, but at the end of the deferment, people come back to us and um, they uh, are able to either show that they, that they completed treatment or they did X, Y, or Z. And um, we're, if somebody is picked up on a bail violation or picked up on a criminal, uh, a new criminal charge that shows up in our system and we may terminate the deferred disposition um, or revoke bail or let them keep working on it or that kind of thing. We don't have a lot of really hands-on, eyes-on supervision typically, um, but a lot of the folks that are on the deferreds wouldn't be on for anything, typically anything violent. Um, occasionally, or, you know, deferred dispositions are often used in, in um, or sometimes used in domestic violence cases, but that's usually has more to do with the fact that we have, we can have proof issues with cases because victims often are 
are either reluctant to testify, they've recanted, or um, don't want cases prosecuted. But other than that, we typically do not use deferred dispositions for violent crimes. So can you can you just help me understand? So if if the DA, if you are currently doing the deferred dispositions, so then this is an expansion to allow the sheriffs to do them, which they currently can't, according to statute. Is that right? No, what this does, I'm sorry, this what this does is it makes it so uh, somebody could could go into could go and do the alternative sentencing program without a conviction, I guess is the way I, I would put it most succinctly. Um, so right now, somebody as a good outcome of a deferred disposition could be sentenced to um, second offender alternative sentencing program, which is seven days. Um, and so, but that would require, right, that that's, and that it's a, that's a, sorry, that, that's the term we use. And we use the first offender, second offender. These are kind of antiquated now. So you could do two days up to seven days. And that requires a sentence, right? That requires sentencing, that requires a conviction. So this would just change it. So while they're on that period of deferred disposition, that they could engage in the programming and then have a good outcome at the end that would include it, that would include a dismissal um, when a pro, right these would only be offered in a I, you know in my opinion what are appropriate cases often shopliftings mental health and, and substance use disorder type uh, crimes usually so that's really the difference um, is that um, it gets folks into that able to take advantage of that really good programming in community service work um, I, you know I'll just add that. We extend these offers to folks, some folks who have criminal records, right? They might have a possession charge. They might have a history of mental illness uh, and homelessness that's created a, you know, a record that's nonviolent, but that's certainly a criminal record. And um, that uh, that wasn't always the case, um, that somebody that had anything on their criminal record might not be offered this um, previously, right? So we've, ex we've expanded who is uh, eligible to get this. Um, uh, alternative sentencing program and who, or sorry, uh, who's eligible to do a deferred. Sometimes when you have folks that have a criminal record, it's really hard for uh, nonprofits to uh, have them come in and do uh, community service because of their insurance um, providers, right? It, it, it could, it, you might not be able, if you have a criminal history of shoplifting, you might not be able to do um, community service with some organizations, but the sheriff's department does some, that's what alternative sentencing, a big portion of it is a lot of community service. So people can get their community service hours done in a two day period um, that some folks are having a hard time getting done in a year. And I have people that have come to me that have, um, or and to my staff that have looked into doing community service with, you know, a dozen organizations and they were turned down because um, they, you know, the organization couldn't, um, it, for insurance purposes, couldn't let them do it. So that's the other aspect of this is that it would get folks who, again, we want uh, not to be going back to jail or going to jail because it contributes to criminal behavior, especially for low level offenses. Um, we want them to be able to do this really good programming, including community service, which has really been proven effective at getting folks um, become part of the community instead of become a problem in the community. And we can't do it unless they're sentenced. So it's, it's just helpful um, you know, to avoid those convictions when somebody can really earn it and also to get them into community service that's supervised by the sheriff. And they do it in a really, um, I think Rand Maker could probably speak better to this, but they do it in a way that really brings people into the fold, whereas sometimes throwing somebody in a jail cell just shows them more that they're not part of the community and they're never going to be a part of the community, so... So you're saying that this program is is after they've been sentenced? No, no, no. This so deferred dispositions are entered into. Um, they right, but, but I guess you're saying center. alternative sentencing programs and deferred disposition, and it seems like you're using them interchangeably, but maybe you're not. Yeah, um, can, so I, can I just interject something as well? Because I think we've we've had a very um, full day. And I think that you're um, giving us a lot of information really quickly that we can't maybe like, I'm, I'm completely lost. <laughs> and I'm, I'm so sorry <laughs> about that. I have a tendency to, uh, you know, probably go too deep into detail. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and we as a committee also, I think need a break, but could you tell us in one or two sentences why 
this amendment that has been presented this afternoon is important. All right, Please. I feel like this is the SATs, but yes. Um, I mean, not the SATs, is my college exam, but um, this amendment makes it so somebody can truly earn the good income, a uh, good outcome of a dismissal at the end of a deferred disposition um, while taking part in really good programming that's been designed to keep people from committing crimes in the future and uh, building up our communities with community service. And my opinion, there is a large swath of folks whose good outcomes should be dismissals and they will not be afforded this programming. Um, and right now they're not afforded this programming because um, they won't be convicted at the end because we will not convict someone that truly earns a good outcome. So that okay, is so why- I'm gonna just I'm interrupt sorry. you. So, so the ability to participate in the programming is currently tied to a conviction at the end and these people will not be convicted because they will have done the alternative sentencing and avoided the conviction at the end. That's exactly what this carve out is for, that group of people okay. that, that we really wanna take part in that programming that would really benefit from it. But we also, we're, we are of the belief that it, if they can get themselves out from under the, a conviction, that's also extremely important to their futures of staying out of the criminal life. Thank you. Com Senator Keim, do you have additional questions? I don't know if I, I was hoping to help clarify. I hope that did clarify for some committee members. Did you wanna ask any more questions, Senator Keim? I have another comment, but I can wait until after Representative Babich. Okay, go ahead, Representative Babich. Thank you, Madam Chair, I'll lower it right now. Um, I, uh, uh, Actually, my question is from Ms. Irving, uh, DA Irving. Um, uh, one, one of the uh, uh, people that uh, expressed concern about the financial end of it said that they would, um, they were concerned about the indigent and they would uh, probably, that would probably be alleviated if there were a sliding scale. You described a sliding scale. Is that just for your jurisdiction or or, you know, you said 10 to $50. I, I'm, I was just wondering if that's standard or regional. Um, okay, so the 10 to $50 is a supervision fee that we levy on folks. Um, and, and that's folks that can afford 10 or more dollars. Some people have a completely waived fee for the deferred disposition. So that's how we kind of build up our coffers to be able to pay for programming, including- that's a local decision? That is a that is absolutely a decision that I made coming in. I, I changed what we did in the di in the district when I came in. I so that is up to each district to do that. Okay, that's yeah. what I want. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes, all right. Yep. Okay, and then uh, so, uh, Representative uh, Libby, and then Representative Moriarty, and then Senator Kime. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that I, I think I have a complete understanding of the bill and the amendment, and I just want to make sure that I do before we would vote on this. Um, so with the amendment, the bill will make it so that the folks who are in a deferred um, deferment could both take advantage of the alternative sentencing program, but also end up without a conviction. Is that correct? You get the prize for actually summing it up in one sentence. Yes, okay, that's exactly exactly <laughs> it. Nail on the okay. head. Okay, thank you. Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think the primary stakeholders have worked this out well between themselves uh, uh, to include the bill sponsor uh, also, and I would move ought to pass as amended. There is a motion. Is there a second on that motion? Seconded by Representative Sheehan. Okay. Um, Senator Keim, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the intent of this bill uh, very much, but I this is a lot of conversation that we're trying to hurry 
um, because we have so many bills in front of us. So I'm quite uncomfortable voting on this bill right now. I mean, I, I guess I can just vote no, but I think it probably has value. Um, I, I think we should either be carrying over this bill. We definitely need more uh, conversation from other people around this process than, you know, now that we have something sort of different set up in front of us. So um, I, for one, do not feel comfortable voting on this bill. I'd be happy to table. Um, I would be happy to, um, you know, w work it, at, you know, kind of on the sidelines, I guess, or carry it over or something. But I think this is a lot uh, in the moment. Um, all right, I, I will just comment that we're really limited in the number of bills we can carry over. And then we're tending to carry over those that we can consolidate like four or five bills into the bill that we carry over. So that I appreciate your suggestion. I'm not sure that that's a feasible option for this bill. Um, let's see. Um, Representative Babbage, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just, when we were talking about actual alternate sentencing programs, we were talking about $300 and $500 fees. Um, my, my only, I, I appreciate the sponsors, uh, you know, getting this amendment done. I know it's 11th hour, but um, I totally done a turnaround on whether to go forward on this bill or not. The only thing I have that's left is consideration of the indigent. And I, I don't know what a maximum financial uh, burden might be in, in other counties other than DA Irving's. Uh, that, that's the only question I'm, I'm wondering, or if, or if we wanted to somehow specify that in the amendment. But. Yeah, I think that we don't, we don't, we only have information from Lincoln County for sure. Um, and we have, okay. So we need to decide how to proceed. Um, Senator Keim, if we tabled this bill and revisited it, um, and, and we'll have to fit it into the, I think we have work sessions on about 80 or 100 more bills to do before um, mid-May. Um, do you foresee yourself being able to support the bill after looking into it more? Or I'm just trying to get a sense of um, whether, whether we're going to end up in the same place a couple weeks from now as we are um, right now. I, all I can say is it sounds very good and something that I would like to support, but I don't like voting when I feel like I've had so much information thrown at me and I haven't had time to sift through it. I appreciate that. Um, this was very dense and not, 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 um, yeah, it took us a while to, to really sink our teeth into it. Uh, Representative Hagan. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I also, uh, find myself really liking this, but I feel like it's a tremendous amount of information that I'd like to have a little more time for to, uh, and I have to go back to the caucus and, and the community and make sure that all of my ducks are in a row so that I can uh, clearly, uh, you know, as a pseudo expert, be able to say, this is why I voted for this. And so a little extra time would be helpful for me also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator, uh, Representative Hagan. Senator Maxman, um, it looks like there's interest in tabling this. Um, if we tabled it, do you think that you could bring us some, some information about what's happening in counties other than Lincoln County um, as well? Absolutely, I'd be happy to work on that for the committee. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Committee members, is there uh, a motion to table? Senator Kime? Yes, yes Madam Chair, I move to table. Uh, Senator Kime has moved to table. Is there a second? Seconded by uh, Representative Hagan. And um, let's just use our electronic hand feature to vote on this. Anybody who's in favor of the tabling motion, 
use your electronic hand and we'll just leave them up um, until Supi's been able to record the vote. Fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so um, the motion to table has carried uh, 10 to nothing with four absences. And with that, we'll, I want to thank everybody, the bill sponsor, and all of those who have been working so hard on this important bill um, for all the information you provided today. And we hope to take it up uh, shortly. And with that, we'll close the um, hearing on, um, excuse me, the work session on LD 957. And um, I would like to, we have um, three more bills. The next two are Representative Warren, and I know she is here and um, has been waiting to present on these bills. Can we take a 10 minute or a five minute break and then return and um, and continue our work sessions. Is that acceptable to committee members? Yes. Yes, and and just Madam Chair, so the committee knows, I have to sign off at five thirty tonight. Thank you. Okay. And and um, thank you, Senator Kyman. We do have the option to um, vote for forty eight hours after the work session, and so those who have to excuse themselves, we'll still be able to weigh in, of course, on the bills. So, all right. And Peggy and Soupy, is a is a 10 minute break good with you or five minute? What do you, okay, let's I, say I'm 10, gonna... pardon me? Whatever, whatever you wanna do. Okay, let's, let's split, let's, let's come back at 510. Thank you, everyone.
Hello, everyone. Hey. <sighs> Long day. Yes. Indeed. Um, let's, uh, <laughs> Not as long as today. Yeah. So thanks everybody for um, hanging in there and returning to do to try to um, complete work sessions on two more bills. Um, we've all been working really hard today and I just wanna express appreciation for everybody um, for sticking in there with us and especially you, Peggy and Supi. Um, Peggy, I think we're ready for the bill analysis when you are. Are we on 1303? Yes, yeah, actually let me formally say, welcome back from our break, everybody. We're going to resume the Judiciary Committee meeting and open the work session on LD 1303, which is an act to ensure judicial discretion in sentencing sponsored by Representative Charlotte Warren. And first we'll hear, um, we'll hear from our analyst, Peggy, and I'll bring the sponsor over to the panel as well. Thanks um, very much, Peggy. Great, thank you. So um, the purpose of this bill is really to identify um, mandatory minimum sentences or mandatory sentences and not have those apply. And the way the bill is drafted, um, it it's trying to uh, reimpose judicial discretion in any crime that has um, a mandatory minimum um, sentence involved. And um, the first subsection applies to crimes in the criminal code. And um, th the bill wasn't really drafted exactly as the sponsor wanted it. It was turning every mandatory minimum into a maximum. Um, which is not what she had intended. And so uh, Representative Warren had presented a, um, an amendment at the public hearing. To, but the purpose of it was to, subsection one says the judge has discretion, though those mandatory minimums don't apply. Um, and in subsection two, mandatory minimums don't apply to crimes outside the criminal code. So like there are quite a few hunting and fishing regulations that have some um, two-day um, mandatory minimum jail sentences. Um, and then the last piece, section two, was directing the reviser of statutes to go through the statutes, identify all those crimes that have a mandatory minimum or um, a sentence that can't be suspended and um, list all those. The bill directs the reviser's office to prepare a, a, a language that would eliminate all those mandatory minimum. And then the um, criminal justice committee would be able to report out a bill next year. Um, so the sponsor had provided the, the bill, uh, an amendment that says, okay, we're not turning these into maximum sentences. We're just eliminating them and, and giving the judges complete discretion. Um, Clack was very concerned that it, you could be looking at a statute and it looks like there's a penalty there when this one section over here is saying, no, that penalty doesn't apply. Um, and so I actually worked with Representative Warren and um, John Pelletier um, late yesterday evening to focus down just to the crimes that are in Title 17A that, um, Actually, maybe I shouldn't even be saying this um, for Representative Warren, but um, she was trying to narrow it down because she understood about um, it being important that when you read a statute, you know what the penalty is. And then still the language about the reviser's office going forward with identifying all those um, statutes. Um, in working with the reviser's office, they're really kind of uncomfortable putting together legislation that they haven't actually, you know, legislation that would repeal those sections, but they would be happy to pull that together. And then the criminal justice committee could figure out how they wanna deal with each one of those statutes. So um, I thought I sent the amendment to Representative Warren and John Pelletier last night for them to review this morning. They let me know a little bit after eight that they couldn't read it. And I just now found that email. So I apologize profusely 
to Representative Warren and to Mr. Pelletier and to the Judiciary Committee for slowing things down today. I, I apologize. But I, I can, if Representative Warren wants you to look at this amendment, I'm happy to share it. Uh, Representative Warren, would you like um, Peggy to share the amendment with us and give us a, a little bit of analysis on it? That would be great. And, and, it, and then if I could add a, just a quick sentence, I'll be super quick. Do you want to give us that sentence now or after the um, screen share? Um, I'm happy to do that now. First of all, Peggy, thank you so much for helping. Um, so as Peggy said, we worked with Mr. Pelletier. This drastically makes the bill smaller, just focused on the criminal code. And then the second step of the reviser looking at all those mandatory minimums. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. That's very succinct, which is probably good this it. time of day, given all, all we've been uh, working with. Um, Representative Reckett, your hand is up. Did you have a question or is that from... Um, okay, Peggy, you can go ahead. We would appreciate the, um, the screen share. And also, Peggy, thank you for working uh, last night to, to get this ready for our work session this morning. Well, you're welcome, but you were working too. That, that was my um, deal with Representative Warren. I was gonna try to get it done by the time you adjourned. So uh, we were very close. Um, so we um, actually, John Pelletier was very good at identifying the statutes that have um, mandatory minimum. The first one he identified is stalking and um, and it's a class C crime, sorry. So the actor violates paragraph A and has one or more prior convictions. So already has been convicted of stalking, commits stalking again. Um, it's a class C crime, it raises a crime because of the prior conviction. The current law says there is, um, uh, it includes a term of imprisonment. Um, so it has to, it has to include um, a select a term of at least one year. So th that's actually in the sentencing process. And I think this is what um, Mr. Pelletier identified as having to be uh, with uh, struck out. So I'm just gonna keep going. Um, it's all, is this, are we, we're in the same section. This is, um, it, it's, it's again enhanced by a prior conviction. And again, it, it's a discussion of how the judges get to a final sentence and they have to start with at least two years of a sentence. Okay, I think I'm gonna speed through. So here's our, um, so the next one is special sentencing, sentencing provisions for gross sexual assault. And um, so right now there is, um, a, again, the court has to look at that first step and impose um, um, a, a sentence if gross sexual assault is committed when the, in the, the person who it's committed against has not yet attained 12 years of age. Um, so that's involved in the sentencing process, de determining what the sentence is. And um, the court may not suspend that portion of the maximum term of imprisonment based on a prior conviction. Um, th those are kind of hard to understand because they're written in the context of how a judge um, reaches the appropriate sentence. And, and that was originally uh, created in case law and then the legislature um, uh, enacted it into statute. So it was very clear it's a three-step process that the court has to go through. Um, this is a little bit more clear. This is um, in chapter 45, which are all the drug offenses. There is a special section, 1125, that has a mandatory minimum um, sentence for certain drug offenses. And this is really easy because it just strikes it all out. So that's where the mandatory minimum sentences are for the drug violations. It's chapter 45. Um, of the criminal code. And then this is in the um, kind of like in the sentencing section. This is where the different crime, the different um, maximum 
terms for crimes are, and there is a subsection, subsection three is mandatory minimum term of imprisonment for crime with use of a firearm against an individual. These are mandatory minimum. Um, and then they can, the sentence could be greater than that. But if a firearm is used in any of these crimes, then this has to be the mandatory minimum. This is the minimum sentence. And then subsection four is um, an additional uh, mandatory minimum term of imprisonment. And I think that might be it. I had the whole section and I wasn't sure about that language. Um, I think John has told me that we don't need to do that. And then the last piece is the revisor report and legislation. And um, in, in talking with the revisor's office, they said it would be really helpful if you could explain to us what a mandatory minimum is. And so um, we thought this language might work for the purposes of this section, the term mandatory term of imprisonment includes a required minimum term of imprisonment as well as a term in which some or all of the term of imprisonment may not be suspended. So the revisor's office would bring this list to the criminal justice committee and Representative Warren and the criminal justice committee, once they get it in January, would have time to report out legislation um, addressing all those. I, I understand there are some federal programs where money is dependent on there being a minimum sentence for certain crimes. And this would give the criminal justice committee the opportunity to look at that and weigh the benefits and decide whether or not to make those changes. So, I'll set, uh, that's the amendment. Thanks, Peggy. That's, um, <clears throat> okay. Yeah, thank you. Whoop. I, 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 you calling on me? I don't know what I'm doing because okay. the, um, I, <laughs> lost my screen i i think i'm gonna have to log out and log back on everyone i'll be right back with you i hope sharing a screen didn't do that i i don't know what happened because i can hear you i just can't find oh there you are oh good Whew. um all right, so that is a lot of information to digest. I see three hands raised. I'm gonna start um, with you, Representative Babbage, and then Representative Hagan, and then Representative Reckett. That's actually the exact opposite uh, order of how we raised our hands, but I'm, I'll be glad to take Just the go lead. go for it. We don't, <laughs> the more efficient we are at this point, the better. Right, thanks. Uh, I, I have a very elementary question. Is, is it possible to get a six or nine month sentence for a class C crime? I, I was under the impression that uh, more than a year was a, was a felony, but that's not a minimum. In other words, it's, uh, if it, to, be, to be sentenced to more than a year, it would have to be a felony or class C crime. But is there a minimum uh, currently? Okay, thank you very much. That that helps me. I did not. I thought oh, you did. I didn't even have my microphone on. No, right. <laughs> no, but but in other words, I, I thought I th I thought that all Class C crimes had a minimum of one year, but but that's not the case. Thank you. No minimum. Representative Hagen. Thank you very much. I came in just a little bit late uh, in our ten minute time span. Off, I plucked a chicken, so I was a little bit late. <clears throat> Um, is this an amendment? Did I did I hear it right, or did I not even hear it? That this amendment, we don't have it. it and it's brand new. We just minutes ago got it. And yeah, it, I don't. I don't think you've even gotten it. I think I just showed it to you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Representative Hagen. Representative Record. Well, the first thing that came to my mind is, uh, have you, has someone, um, Charlotte or otherwise, talked with the sexual assault people and the DV people? Because there's a lot of minimums in those jurisdictions. And um, <clears throat> I think some of them, they may not be willing to go quietly into the night. So um, I think that's an important conversation that has to have before. I don't have any problem with the revisor 
you know, pulling it all out and telling us where it is. But I think that uh, the, the earlier that conversation begins, I think the better road we'll have next year if we're trying to decide whether or not to put anything in there. So that's commentary more than question. Sorry about that. Do you want yeah, me to that answer? Does... Okay. Oh, go ahead, Charlotte. Did you want me to answer the question? Yes, go okay. ahead. I am in actual constant conversation with Elizabeth Ward Saxel and Francine Stark about all of the bills that we're working on. So yes, um, I, I know those are very important statutes and they will absolutely be part of that conversation and are already and are very aware of this bill. Um, the second amendment that you received was actually written by Andrea Mancuso from the Coalition to End Domestic Violence. Well, could you just clarify what the second amendment is, Representative Warren? It was what I presented to you at the public hearing last week. Okay, thank you. So just to give you, just to simplify it for the gentleman who just plucked a chicken, which might be the first time I've ever heard that, um, during a during a work session, but I love it. Um, basically, what I did, Representative Hagen, was I presented you with a bill that was about this big, and what I brought to you today does exactly the same thing, but in this much of the statute. So the process remains exactly the same, but knowing that we as a state need to adhere to certain fe federal regulations in traffic statutes, et cetera, I said, let's just take that right out and not deal with that confusion right now. So we just went to one title, if you will, um, you know, the criminal code. So I hope that's helpful. All the rest remains the same. Thank you, Representative Warren. Uh, Representative Reckitt, did you have a follow-up? No, I just have a lazy hand. I'm well, sorry. Okay. Um, Thank you. And Representative Moriarty? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think a lot of good work has been done here, but frankly, we are in the same position which we found ourselves at the end of the last uh, work session. Uh, we haven't received this, we haven't digested it, and I, I think inevitably this has to be tabled. I won't make the motion because there may be more comments or debate. Committee members, are there additional questions for either Peggy or the bill sponsor? Let's do questions first and then we'll do more comments. Not seeing any questions. Committee members, are there comments regarding um, the amendment we've been presented with today? <clears throat> well, Am I the only one with my hand up? Yes, go ahead. The, um, the comment I have is I don't see this like the last bill because I think what we're looking at is, is a simple process in a way. We're asking if we can take the criminal code, hand it to the revisor, say, find the minimums, the things with minimum sentences and bring that to the criminal justice committee by January so that they can look and see whether or not each thing should have or shouldn't have those minimums. But I think that <clears throat> there isn't, we're not having a discussion about what should have minimums and what shouldn't. We're only saying we want the survey of what, what is uh, eligible in our head uh, because it has currently a minimum sentence and turn that over to the criminal justice committee to make a decision next year. So it's sort of a sophisticated table in a way <laughs> because we don't have to table the bill to do that, but we can set the process in motion. So um, I, I don't see why we couldn't figure out how to vote this today, unless you, there's some other wrinkle that I'm just not getting. Um, so then I guess I have a, a point of clarification or a question to raise probably either to you, Representative Reckitt, or to the bill sponsor, because I thought that we were actually changing the law in a couple of areas, the stalking law, the gross sexual assault, the drug offenses in chapter 45, and minimums. I mean, I think we the, the amendment does propose changing specific statutes, right? Is that right, um, Representative Warren? 
you're taking out the mandatory minimum. The judge may decide, I mean, you know, really it's gonna take a while for all of this to get printed and get to the judiciary, but the judge may decide to stick with that same sentence, but the bill proposes to eliminate those mandatory minimums. And I will remind you that CLAC is unanimous in their support for getting rid of mandatory minimums as John shared with you at the public hearing. Uh, Representative Libby. I just wanted to put forward that I will need time um, to digest the amendment once it is in hand. I, I regrettably would have to be a no automatically today if we were to vote, um, not because it's not a worthy bill, but because I, I can't possibly vote on something that I haven't read myself thoroughly. No, no disrespect to you, Representative. Not at all, I understand, thank you. Representative Reckitt? I think my question is, <clears throat> so we're, so we don't really have to do anything about the criminal justice, or about referring to criminal justice, that's just gonna happen. If this, if, let's, say we, let's say we saw this, we agreed, we passed this, um, then the mandatory minimums would be gone and then the Criminal Justice Committee could decide next year to look at the whole package and make some individualized decisions. Is that accurate, Charlotte? I mean, Representative Warren? Okay. Do we have some assurance that they would let that bill in to have that happen, whoever the they is? If you, as far as I understand, when we've done this with other bills, once you pass the bill, you have authorized a bill in the second session. Okay. Similar process we did with the county jail bill last year. So okay. you've sort of authorized it. If I'm wrong about that, Peggy will correct me, but that's my understanding. Okay. Okay, thank you. Representative Hagan. Thank you very much. I'm I'm not loving it, so I'll probably be a no. I, I can't. I I have to see everything. I have to sit for whatever time it takes, and uh, so I'm uncomfortable with it. So I'm just going to vote no on it. <clears throat> um, committee members, I I will say that I um, would not be able to vote today because I I really do. Um, need to consider the bill, um, the version that the sponsor has brought to us today. And so um, we can have a little bit more discussion. If there's any more discussion, otherwise I'll entertain a motion to table. Nope. Representative Moriarty? No, I see Chris raised his hand. So he wants okay. to Representative I don't want to make the motion. Move the table, Madam Chair. Oh. All right. Is there a second? <laughs> Is there a second? A seconded by Representative Moriarty. Um, all right. And let's do the um, electronic hand voting system. I want, I want my name in the history books, Steve. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go too fast. Can you slow down? Representative Hagen, are you voting? So you have eight in favor. I have eight in favor of tabling. And I think Representative Hagen is voting no to tabling. Yeah, I just, uh, as written, I can't support the bill right now. So do I go <clears throat> to the table or do I? Uh, I don't well, really it, if it. you want, I mean, I think there are plenty of people on the committee who want some more time and we will bring this up in our yeah. next, probably the next work session. I'll be a team player. I'll okay. Soupy's happy she doesn't have to do a roll call. <laughs> All right. Um, Soupy, let me know when you're all set. Oh, I'm all set. I'm sorry. I thought it was announced. I thought you announced. 
Uh, nine so, members of the board. So the motion to table carries nine uh, to nothing with five absences. So we'll close the work session on LD 1303. And then we'll take up our last bill that we're gonna take up today, um, which is LD 841. Also um, sponsored by Representative Warren. And um, so this opens the work session on LD 841. And uh, let's start, Peggy, with your analysis, and sure. then we'll um, ask the bill sponsor to uh, provide us with her um, provide us with a statement about the bill. Right. <laughs> I'm getting so, a little tired as well. <laughs> so the, um, the the purpose of the bill is to provide provide a presumption of probation for sentences uh, for the sentence for certain Class E crimes, and those are listed here. Um, it also makes deferred disposition available for a person who pleads guilty to unlawful possession of a scheduled drug um, under Section 1107A in the Criminal Code. So most of this is about um, making there be a presumption of um, probation rather than any term of imprisonment for Class C crimes. Um, and, and that's what... Um, it, Section one cross-references the change in um, section two, which says, um, he here's the presumption that we're gonna have a presumption of probation for all for the class C crimes listed in section 1605, which is section three. And you will see that um, uh, probation is presumed um, to be the appropriate sentence for a class C crime listed in subsection three unless the punishment has been enhanced to a class C because a person has one or more prior convictions, the crime was committed with the use of a dangerous weapon or the person waives the presumption of probation. And then you get to subsection three, which is the whole list of um, crimes that are class C crimes. Some of these statutes have more than one crime listed in, in that cited in, um, section. But all of these class C crimes, there would be a presumption of probation rather than a term of imprisonment in all of these cases. So um, if you have the bill analysis, I went through and, and listed them all. Um, and I can talk to you about them if you'd like. I will point out that paragraph F includes chapter 45 of 17A, which includes the drug crimes. Um, and also, um, the Title 32 provisions are the, the main Uniform Securities Act and the main Commodity Code. And you had um, information from Judith Shaw, who's the Securities Administrator. I included that. I just pasted it right into the um, uh, bill analysis. And also I see Leanne Robin from the Attorney General's offices here for this bill. If you have questions about um, a, a particularly white collar crime. She's one of the prosecutors that deals with these. And Attorney General Fry had made, said she would be available for this work session. I think that's all I need to say. Great, thank you so much, Peggy. And um, Representative Warren, did you have an amendment on this bill as well? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and I, I just wanna suggest that you all are probably going to want to table this bill as well. And I support that and I understand that. Um, I did work with uh, Ms. Shaw from the Securities Administration. She was very helpful and shared her concerns um, at the public hearing and also with me. I also um, reached out to Mr. Pelletier about this bill. And as I've spoken with other folks about this bill, including a bunch of the people that were on the commission last year where these recommendations came from. So remember that this was a, a, a working product that came out of the Council of State Governments, um, you know, working for over a year looking at data from our uh, criminal legal system here in Maine. But it seems that folks aren't ready for that sort of level of change. Um, so what I'd like to do is pare the bill down to 
just be focused on one very specific thing. And it's a very specific thing that you all talked a lot about today, which is deferred disposition. Currently in Maine, you cannot receive a deferred disposition for all of the class B drug crimes that we are, are seeing in Maine. And that's what puts people into the deep end of the system. So I would like this bill to be amended to just allow for, if the prosecutor and the judge agree, right? To just allow for a deferred disposition for class B drug crimes. That would be the entire amendment. Again, this comes from you know, what I hear from law enforcement constantly, which is you want us to not just incarcerate people that are struggling with substance use, well then change the laws about it because our job is to enforce the laws. So I'll stop, that is, that is where I'd like to see this bill go, but I hear you that you'd like to see that in writing with yesterday's craziness and, and today having all these conversations, frankly, I have not been able to put it together for you. So, but I'm happy to get it to you. Uh, go ahead, Representative Libby. Thank you for your succinct explanation of that amendment, Representative Warren. Um, can I just ask Peggy, um, I, unlike those of you who've been on judiciary for longer than a few months, um, do not have at the tip of my brain what would be classified as a class B drug crime. So I don't need that right this second, um, unless we're going to vote today, in which case I would. Um, I just would like to, to know where to look to find that categorization. Um, so I, I think each um, section of uh, chapter 45 in the criminal code has the class of crime in it. Okay. Um, and I, I could certainly, I can pull out if you're just looking for class B yep. drug offenses, which is what Representative Warren is, is, I can put a list of those together for you. That would be great. Yeah, just exactly what's covered by this amendment. Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks, Representative Warren. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I give a quick just description if it's very quick? Yes, please do. Yeah, we actually, I, I would just say that um, we're gonna have limited time to do another work session on this. So anything you wanna share with us, I think it would be great if you could share it with us today. Thank you very much. And I failed to do that and I meant to. So I, I thank you for the opportunity. Representative Libby, an example of a class B um, drug crime might be the second time somebody gets caught for possession. So, uh, when you are caught with a, even just a, a usable amount of a substance, if it is your second offense, as we know often, well, let me not editorialize, it could be your second offense, that can be bumped up to a class B. Additionally, our sentencing structures allow for possession based on weight to be bumped up to a class B. So although um, class B can also, can also be uh, a trafficking crime, this is, it also contains both possession when it's a second offense or possession of just an amount that's still a usable amount um, and it can be bumped up to that uh, class B. This does not in any way mean that, um, that people aren't gonna still be able to be sentenced to the deep end of the system, Wyndham and Warren, if they are possessing the amount and they're you know, sort of pinched for trafficking and furnishing at all. This is literally for the cases where you know, the judge and the prosecutor realize this person really messed up they're struggling with substance use disorder and they're getting their life back on track. And if we can give them a deferred disposition, they may be able to get out of this cycle. 
right? They're, they're back at their job, they're home with their kids. And, and if we can give them the opportunity for this deferred disposition, does not mean they have to, but right now judges do not have that discretion at all. So that's the goal of the proposal. Any other questions, Representative Libby? Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to follow up. So, um, Representative Warren, um, second half up for possession, yes. Then, um, so possession by weight. So that could potentially be trafficking if a judge was um, inclined to do deferred disposition in anything that might be trafficking related. They would have to have prosecutor cooperation and agreement, is that correct? Thank you, Representative. That's exactly true. And I can guarantee you that no judge is gonna give a deferred disposition on a trafficking charge. It's just not gonna happen. And I don't think that we believe that it should happen, right? This is not an off ramp for folks who are profiting off folks who are ill. This is literally an off ramp for Mainers who are suffering. And yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the, for the clarification. Uh, thank you both. And uh, Representative Moriarty, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, of course, the real distinction between the five classes of crimes is the maximum length of imprisonment. And I, if, unless I misunderstood her, I thought Representative Libby was basically asking how do we distinguish A through uh, A through E? To just recite the maximum periods of imprisonment, I think that, that tells you what you, I think that would, would answer the question. I, uh, Representative Moore, how do you think if I might answer? I'm sorry, we didn't hear you, Representative Libby. Sorry, I have the wrong earbud in. Uh, if I might answer Representative Moriarty. My question is just was initially, initially very specifically what would be classed as a class B crime, not necessarily the um, minimum of sentencing for it, but what the actual crime might be. And so I think Peggy is gonna be providing that so I can have that in hard copy and, um, and then the explanation around what might be in that category from uh, Representative Warren is helpful as well. Thank you. Uh, Representative Thorne. Thank you, Madam Chair. If appropriate, I would make a motion to table. There's a motion to table. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative uh, Hagen. And um, Let's see, so let me just make a record of that. And um, let's um, vote on the tabling motion with our usual raise hand function and just leave your hands up until we're all, um, we've all, uh, we've counted all the votes. All set. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Panette. And so the tabling motion carries nine to zero. And um, Representative Warren, if you could get us your written amendment, um, you know, as soon as you're able to, we'd appreciate that. And we will schedule this for a work session that'll probably focus kind of more directly and exclusively on voting since we've had a discussion of the bill today. I will do Thank that. Thank you all very much and, and good night. Thank you. And that closes the work session on LD 841 and wraps up our work for today. Um, Peggy and Supi, thank you so much for all uh, you've done to help us get through a huge volume of work today and committee members, thank you for all of your hard work. Um, pay, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, Do we Supi. need to table 844? Um, no, we're not going to table it. We just haven't gotten to it. So we'll reschedule it. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think is that Peggy, is that appropriate? However you want to do it is fine. If you had planned to skip it, that's fine. But um, 
I, I would like to touch base with you, um, Senator Carney, just about what we're moving to next week's work session. Um, that would be really helpful. Let's let's do a, a phone call so that we're, okay. our necks get a little break from looking yeah. at the screen. <laughs> okay. Let's speak, speak right after this. Anything else, committee members? Motion if we have a motion to adjourn, I, I may move to table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Representative Babbage, are you making a motion to adjourn? I am, Madam Chair. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so Bye. much for all your work today. Bye. Okay, folks. Bye. Good night. They just, yeah. she may be talking to somebody off screen. Exactly, exactly. I was talking to that last week. Oh, shoot, I missed them. I didn't, it was Representative Thorne. I just saw the T H H O R N. I know, I, at first I only saw the James and I said, I don't know any James. I think I do. Okay, Annie. I need